Chapter One of Tales of Lonely Trails. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by David Wales. Tales of Lonely Trails by Zane Grey. Chapter One Nonazoshe. John Wetherill, one of the famous Wetherill brothers and trader at Cayenta, Arizona, is the man who discovered Nanazoshe, which is probably the most beautiful and wonderful natural phenomenon in the world. Wetherill owes the credit to his wife, who, through her influence with the Indians, finally, after years, succeeded in getting the secret of the great bridge after three trips to marsh pass and cayenta with my old guide al doyle of flagstaff i finally succeeded in getting wetherill to take me on to nonazoshe this was in the spring of nineteen thirteen and my party was the second one not scientific to make the trip later this same year wetherill took in the roosevelt party and after that the kolb brothers it is a safe thing to say that this trip is one of the most beautiful in the west it is a hard one and not for everybody there is no guide except wetherill who knows how to get there and after doyle and i came out we admitted that we would not care to try to return over our back trail we doubted if we could find the way this is the only place i have ever visited which i am not sure i could find again alone my trip to nanazoshe gave me the opportunity to see also monument valley and the mysterious and labyrinthine canyon sege with its great prehistoric cliff dwellings the desert beyond Cayenta spread out impressively bare red flats and plains of sage leading to the rugged vividly colored and wind-sculptured sandstone heights typical of the painted desert of arizona laguna creek at that season became flooded after every thunderstorm and it was a treacherous red-mired quicksand where i convinced myself we would have stuck forever had it not been for wetherill's navajos we rode all day for the most part closed in by ridges and bluffs so that no extended view was possible it was hot too and the sand blew and the dust rose travel in northern arizona is never easy and this grew harder and steeper there was one long slope of heavy sand that i made sure would prove too much for wetherill's pack mules but they surmounted it apparently less breathless than i was toward sunset a storm gathered ahead of us to the north with a promise of cooling and sultry air at length we turned into a long canyon with straight rugged red walls and a sandy floor with quite a perceptible ascent it appeared endless far ahead i could see the black storm clouds and by and by began to hear the rumble of thunder darkness had overtaken us by the time we had reached the head of this canyon and my first sight of monument valley came with a dazzling flash of lightning it revealed a vast valley a strange world of colossal shafts and buttes of rock magnificently sculptured standing isolated and aloof dark weird lonely when the sheet lightning flared across the sky showing the monuments silhouetted black against that strange horizon the effect was marvelously beautiful i watched until the storm died away dawn with the desert sunrise changed monument valley bereft it of its night gloom and weird shadow and showed it in another aspect of beauty it was hard for me to realize that those monuments were not the works of man the great valley must once have been a plateau of red rock from which the softer strata had eroded leaving the gentle league-long slopes marked here and there by upstanding pillars and columns of singular shape and beauty i rode down the sweet-scented sage slopes under the shadow of the lofty mittens and around and across the valley and back again to the height of land and when i had completed the ride a story had woven itself into my mind and the spot where i stood was to be the place where lynn sloan taught lucy bostel to ride the great stallion wildfire two days ride took us across country to the segi 
with this wonderful canyon i was familiar that is as familiar as several visits could make a man with such a bewildering place in fact i had named it deception pass the segi had innumerable branches all more or less the same size and sometimes it was difficult to tell the main canyon from one of its tributaries the walls were rugged and crumbling of a red or yellow hue upward of a thousand feet in height and indented by spruce sided notches there were a number of ruined cliff dwellings the most accessible of which was keat seal i could imagine no more picturesque spot a huge wind-worn cavern with a vast slanted stained wall held upon a projecting ledge or shelf the long line of cliff dwellings these silent little stone houses with their vacant black eye-like windows had strange power to make me ponder and then dream next day upon resuming our journey it pleased me to try to find the trail to betatakan the most noted and surely the most wonderful and beautiful ruin in all the west in many places there was no trail at all and i encountered difficulties but in the end without much loss of time i entered the narrow rugged entrance of the canyon i had named surprise valley sight of the great dark cave thrilled me as i thought it might have thrilled bess and venters who had lived for me their imagined lives of loneliness here in this wild spot with the sight of those lofty walls and the scent of the dry sweet sage there rushed over me a strange feeling that writers of the purple sage was true my dream people of romance had really lived there once upon a time I climbed high upon the huge stones and along the smooth red walls where Pei Larkin once had glided with swift, sure steps, and I entered the musty cliff dwellings and called out to hear the weird and sonorous echoes, and I wandered through the thickets and upon the grassy spruce-shaded benches, never for a moment free of the story I had conceived there something of awe and sadness abided with me i could not enter into the merry pranks and investigations of my party surprise valley seemed a part of my past my dreams my very self i left it haunted by its loneliness and silence and beauty by the story it had given me that night we camped at bubbling spring which once had been a geyser of considerable power wetherill told a story of an old navajo who had lived there for a long time according to the indian tale the old chief resided there without complaining of this geyser that was wont to inundate his fields but one season the unreliable water spout made great and persistent endeavor to drown him and his people and horses whereupon the old navajo took his gun and shot repeatedly at the geyser and thundered aloud his anger to the great spirit the geyser ebbed away and from that day never burst forth again somewhere under the great bulge of navajo mountain i calculated that we were coming to the edge of the plateau the white bobbing pack-horses disappeared and then our extra mustangs it is no unusual thing for a man to use three mounts on this trip then two of our indians disappeared but wetherill waited for us and so did nastabega the paiute who first took wetherill down into nonazoshe boko as i came up i thought we had indeed reached the end of the world it's down in there said wetherill with a laugh Nas Tebega made a slow, sweeping gesture. There is always something so significant and impressive about an Indian when he points anywhere. It is as if he says, There, way beyond, over the ranges, is a place I know, and it is far. The fact was that I looked at the Paiute's dark, inscrutable face before I looked out into the void my gaze then seemed impelled and held by things afar a vast yellow and purple corrugated world of distance apparently now on level with my eyes i was drawn by the beauty and grandeur of that scene and then i was transfixed 
almost by fear, by the realization that I dared to venture down into this wild and upflung fastness. I kept looking afar, sweeping the three-quarter circle of horizon, till my judgment of distance was confounded, and my sense of proportion dwarfed one moment and magnified the next. Wetherill was pointing and explaining, but I had not grasped all he said. "'You can see two hundred miles into Utah,' he went on. "'That bright, rough surface, like a washboard, is wind-worn rock. Those little lines of cleavage are canyons. There are a thousand canyons down there, and only a few have we been in. That long, purple, ragged line is the Grand Canyon of the Colorado, and there, that blue fork in the red, that's where the San Juan comes in, and there's Escalante Canyon.' I had to adopt the Indian's method of studying unlimited spaces in the desert, to look with slow, contracted eyes from near to far. The pack train and the drivers had begun to zigzag down a long slope, bare of rock, with scant strips of green, and here and there a cedar. Half a mile down, the slope merged in what seemed a green level, but I knew it was not level. This level was a rolling plain growing darker green, with lines of ravines and thin, undefined spaces that might be mirage. Miles and miles it swept and rolled and heaved, to lose its waves in apparent darker level. Round red rocks stood isolated. They resembled huge grazing cattle. But as I gazed, these rocks were strangely magnified. They grew and grew into mounds, castles, domes, crags, great red wind carved buttes one by one they drew my gaze to the wall of upflung rock i seemed to see a thousand domes of a thousand shapes and colors and among them a thousand blue clefts each of which was a canyon beyond this wide area of curved lines rose another wall dwarfing the lower dark red horizon long magnificent in frowning boldness and because of its limitless deceiving surfaces incomprehensible to the gaze of man away to the eastward began a winding ragged blue line looping back upon itself and then winding away again growing wider and bluer this line was san juan canyon i followed that blue line all its length a hundred miles down toward the west where it joined a dark purple shadowy cleft, and this was the Grand Canyon of the Colorado. My eye swept along with that winding mark, farther and farther to the west, until the cleft, growing larger and closer, revealed itself as a wild and winding canyon. Still farther westward it split a vast plateau of red peaks and yellow mesas. Here the canyon was full of purple smoke. It turned, it closed, it gaped, it lost itself, and showed again in that chaos of a million cliffs, and then it faded, a mere purple line, into deceiving distance. I imagined there was no scene in all the world to equal this. The tranquillity of lesser spaces was here not manifest. This happened to be a place where so much of the desert could be seen, and the effect was stupendous. Sound, movement, life, seemed to have no fitness here. Ruin was there, and desolation, and decay. The meaning of the ages was flung at me. A man became nothing. But when I gazed across that sublime and majestic wilderness, in which the Grand Canyon was only a dim line, I strangely lost my terror, and something came to me across the shining spaces. Then Nastabega and Weatherall began the descent of the slope, and the rest of us followed. No sign of a trail showed where the base of the slope rolled out to meet the green plain. There was a level bench a mile wide, then a ravine, and then an ascent, and after that, rounded ridge and ravine, one after the other, like huge swells of a monstrous sea. Indian paintbrush vied in its scarlet hue with the deep magenta of cactus. There was no sage soapweed and meagre grass and a bunch of cactus here and there lent the green to that barren and it was green only at a distance nastabega kept on at a steady gait 
The sun climbed, the wind rose and whipped dust from under the mustangs. There is seldom much talk on a ride of this nature. It is hard work, and everybody for himself. Besides, it is enough just to see. And that country is conducive to silence. I looked back often, and the farther out on the plain we rode, the higher loomed the plateau we had descended, and as I faced ahead again, the lower sank the red-domed and castled horizon to the fore. It was a wild place we were approaching. I saw pinion patches under the circled walls. I ceased to feel the dry wind in my face. We were already in the lee of a wall. I saw the rock squirrels scampering to their holes. Then the Indians disappeared between two rounded corners of a cliff. I rode round the corner into a widening space thick with cedars. It ended in a bare slope of smooth rock. Here we dismounted to begin the ascent. It was smooth and hard, though not slippery. There was not a crack. I did not see a broken piece of stone. Nastabega and Weatherall climbed straight up for a while and then wound round a swell to turn this way and that always going up. I began to see similar mounds of rock all around me, of every shape that could be called a curve. There were yellow domes far above, and small red domes far below. Ridges ran from one hill of rock to another. There were no abrupt breaks, but holes and pits and caves were everywhere, and occasionally, deep down, an amphitheater green with cedar and pinion. We found no vestige of trail on those bare slopes. Our guys led to the top of the wall, only to disclose to us another wall beyond, with a ridged, bare, and scalloped depression between. Here footing began to be precarious for both man and beast. Our mustangs were not shod, and it was wonderful to see their slow, short, careful steps. They knew a great deal better than we what the danger was. It has been such experiences as this that have made me see in horses something besides beasts of burden. In the ascent of the second slope it was necessary to zigzag up slowly and carefully, taking advantage of every bulge and depression. Then before us twisted and dropped and curved the most dangerous slopes I had ever seen. We had reached the height of the divide, and many of the drops on this side were perpendicular and too steep for us to see the bottom. At one bad place, Weatherall and Nastabega, with Joe Lee, a Mormon cowboy with us, were helping one of the pack horses named Chubb. On the steepest part of this slope, Chubb fell and began to slide. His momentum jerked the rope from the hands of Wetherill and the Indian. But Joe Lee held on. Joe was a giant, and being a Mormon he could not let go of anything he had. He began to slide with the horse, holding back with all his might. It seemed that both man and beast must slide down to where the slope ended in a yawning precipice. Chubb was snorting, or screaming, in terror. Our mustangs were frightened and rearing. It was not a place to have trouble with horses. I had a moment of horrified fascination in which Chubb turned clear over. Then he slid into a little depression that, with Joe's hold on the lasso, momentarily checked his descent. Quick as thought, Joe ran sidewise and down to the bulge of rock and yelled for help. I got to him a little ahead of Wetherill and Nastabega, and together we pulled Chubb up out of danger. At first we thought he had been choked to death, but he came to and got up a bloody skinned horse, but alive and safe. I have never seen a more magnificent effort than Joe Lee's. Those fellows are built that way. Weatherall has lost horses on those treacherous slopes, and that risk is the only thing about the trip which is not splendid. We got over that bad place without further incident, and presently came to a long swell of naked stone that led down to a narrow green split. This one had straight walls and wound away out of sight. It was the head of a canyon. Nonazosha Boko, said the Indian. This, then, was the canyon of the Rainbow Bridge. When we got down into it, we were a happy crowd. The mode of travel here was a selection of the best levels, the best places to cross the brook, 
the best places to climb and it was a process of continual repetition there was no trail ahead of us but we certainly left one behind and as weatherall picked out the course and the mustangs followed him i had all freedom to see and feel the beauty color wildness and changing character of nonazoshe boko my experiences in the desert did not count much in the trip down this strange beautiful lost canyon all canyons are not alike this one did not widen though the walls grew higher they began to lean and bulge and the narrow strip of sky above resembled a flowing blue river huge caverns had been hollowed out by water or wind and when the brook ran close under one of these overhanging places the running water made a singular indescribable sound a crack from a hoof on a stone rang like a hollow bell and echoed from wall to wall and the croak of a frog the only living creature i noted in the canyon was a weird and melancholy thing we're sure getting deep down said joe lee how do you know i asked here are the pink and yellow seagull lilies only the white ones are found above i dismounted to gather some of these lilies they were larger than the white ones of higher altitudes of a most exquisite beauty and fragility and of such rare pink and yellow hues as i had never seen they bloom only where it's always summer replied joe that expressed their nature they were the orchids of the summer canyons they stood up everywhere star-like out of the green it was impossible to prevent the mustangs treading them underfoot and as the canyon deepened and many little springs added their tiny volume to the brook every grassy bench was dotted with lilies like a green sky star-spangled and this increasing luxuriance manifested itself in the banks of purple moss and clumps of lavender daisies and great mounds of yellow violets the brook was lined by blossoming buckbrush the rocky corners showed the crimson and magenta of cactus and there were ledges of green with shining moss that sparkled with little white flowers the hum of bees filled the fragrant dreamy air but by and by this green and colorful and verdant beauty the almost level floor of the canyon the banks of soft earth the thickets and clumps of cottonwood the shelving caverns and bulging walls these features were gradually lost and nonazoshe began to deepen in bare red and white stone steps the walls sheared away from one another breaking into sections and ledges and rising higher and higher and there began to be manifested a dark and solemn concordance with the nature that had created this old rent in the earth there was a stretch of miles where steep steps in hard red rock alternated with long levels of round boulders here one by one the mustangs went lame and we had to walk and we slipped and stumbled along over these loose treacherous stones the hours passed the toil increased the progress diminished one of the mustangs failed and was left and all the while the dimensions of nonazoshe boko magnified and its character changed it became a thousand foot walled canyon leaning broken threatening with great yellow slides blocking passage with huge sections split off from the main wall with immense dark and gloomy caverns strangely it had no intersecting canyons it jealously guarded its secret its unusual formation of cavern and pillar and half arch led me to expect any monstrous stone shape left by avalanche or cataclysm down and down we toiled and now the stream bed was bare of boulders and the banks of earth the floods that had rolled down that canyon had here borne away every loose thing all the floor in places was bare red and white stone polished glistening slippery affording treacherous foothold and the time came when wetherall abandoned the stream bed to take to the rock strewn and cactus covered ledges above the canyon widened ahead into a great ragged iron-lined amphitheater and then apparently turned abruptly at right angles sunset rimmed the walls i had been tired for a long time and now i began to limp and lag 
I wondered what on earth would make Wetherall and the Indians tired. It was with great pleasure that I observed the giant Joe Lee plodding slowly along, and when I glanced behind at my straggling party it was with both admiration for their gameness and glee for their disheveled and weary appearance. Finally I got so that all I could do was to drag myself onward with eyes down on the rough ground. In this way I kept on until I heard Wetherill call me. He had stopped, was waiting for me. The dark and silent Indian stood beside him, looking down the canyon. I saw past the vast jutting wall that had obstructed my view. A mile beyond, all was bright with the colors of sunset, and spanning the canyon in the graceful shape and beautiful hues of the rainbow was a magnificent natural bridge. Nona Zoshe, said Witherall, simply. The Rainbow Bridge was the one great natural phenomenon, the one great spectacle which I had ever seen that did not at first give vague disappointment, a confounding of reality, a disenchantment of contrast with what the mind had conceived. But this thing was glorious. It absolutely silenced me my body and brain weary and dull from the toil of travel received a singular and revivifying freshness i had a strange mystic perception that this rosy-hued tremendous arch of stone was a goal i had failed to reach in some former life but had now found here was a rainbow magnified even beyond dreams, a thing not transparent and ethereal, but solidified, a work of ages, sweeping up majestically from the red walls, its iris-hued arch against the blue sky. Then we plodded on again, Wetherill worked around to circle the huge amphitheater. The way was a steep slant, rough and loose and dragging. The rocks were as hard and jagged as lava, and cactus hindered progress. Soon the rosy and golden lights had faded. All the walls turned pale and steely, and the bridge loomed dark. We were to camp all night under the bridge. Just before we reached it, Nastabega halted with one of his singular motions. He was saying his prayer to this great stone god. Then he began to climb straight up the steep slope. Wetherill told me the Indian would not pass under the arch. When we got to the bridge and unsaddled and unpacked the lame mustangs, twilight had fallen. The horses were turned loose to fare for what scant grass grew on bench and slope. Firewood was even harder to find than grass. When our simple meal had been eaten, there was gloom gathering in the canyon, and stars had begun to blink in the pale strip of blue above the lofty walls. The place was oppressive, and we were mostly silent. Presently I moved away into the strange dark shadow cast by the bridge. It was a weird black belt where I imagined I was invisible, but out of which I could see. There was a slab of rock upon which I composed myself to watch, to feel. A stiffening of my neck made me aware that I had been continually looking up at the looming arch. I found that it never seemed the same any two moments. Near at hand it was too vast a thing for immediate comprehension. I wanted to ponder on what had formed it to reflect upon its meaning as to age and force of nature, yet it seemed that all I could do was to see. White stars hung along the dark curved line, the rim of the arch appeared to shine, the moon was up there somewhere, the far side of the canyon was now a blank black wall, over its towering rim showed a pale glow, it brightened, the shades in the canyon lightened, then a white disk of moon peeped over the dark line. The bridge turned to silver. It was then that I became aware of the presence of Nastabega. Dark, silent, statuesque, with inscrutable face uplifted, with all that was spiritual of the Indian, suggested by a somber and tranquil knowledge of his place there, he represented to me that which a solitary figure of human life represents in a great painting. Nanazoshe needed life, wild life, life of its millions of years, and here stood the dark and silent Indian." Long afterward I walked there alone, to and fro, under the bridge. 
the moon had long since crossed the streak of star-fired blue above and the canyon was black in shadow at times a current of wind with all the strangeness of that strange country in its moan rushed through the great stone arch at other times there was silence such as i imagined might have dwelt deep in the centre of the earth and again an owl hooted and the sound was nameless it had a mocking echo an echo of night silence gloom melancholy death age eternity the indian lay asleep with his dark face upturned and the other sleepers lay calm and white in the starlight i seemed to see in them the meaning of life and the past the illimitable train of faces that had shone under the stars there was something nameless in that canyon and whether or not it was what the indian embodied in the great nonazoshe or the life of the present or the death of the ages or the nature so magnificently manifested in those silent dreaming waiting walls the truth was that there was a spirit I did sleep a few hours under Nonazoshe, and when I awoke the tip of the arch was losing its cold darkness and beginning to shine. The sun had just risen high enough over some low break in the wall to reach the bridge. I watched. Slowly, in wondrous transformation, the gold and blue and rose and pink and purple blended their hues, softly, mistily, cloudily, until once more the arch was a rainbow. I realized that long before life had evolved upon the earth, this bridge had spread its grand arch from wall to wall, black and mystic at night, transparent and rosy in the sunrise, at sunset a flaming curve limbed against the heavens. When the race of man had passed, it would perhaps stand there still. It was not for many eyes to see. The tourist, the leisurely traveler, the comfort-loving motorist would never behold it. Only by toil, sweat, endurance, and pain could any man ever look at Nonazoshe. It seemed well to realize that the great things of life had to be earned. Nonazoshe would always be alone, grand, silent, beautiful, unintelligible. And as such, I bade it a mute and reverent farewell. End of chapter 1 Chapter Two of Tales of Lonely Trails by Zane Grey. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Two Colorado Trails, Part One. Riding and tramping trails would lose half their charm if the motive were only to hunt and to fish. It seems fair to warn the reader who longs to embark upon a bloody game hunt or a chronicle of fishing records that this is not that kind of story, but it will be one for those who love horses and dogs, the long winding dim trails, the wild flowers and the dark still woods, the fragrance of spruce and the smell of campfire smoke and as well for those who love to angle in brown lakes or rushing brooks or chase after the baying hounds or stalk the stag on his lonely heights we left denver on august twenty second over the moffat road and had a long wonderful ride through the mountains the rockies have a sweep a limitless sweep majestic and grand for many miles we crossed no streams and climbed and wound up barren slopes once across the divide however we descended into a country of black forests and green valleys yampa a little hamlet with a past prosperity lay in the wide valley of the bear river it was picturesque but idle and a better name for it would have been sleepy hollow the main and only street was very wide and dusty bordered by old boardwalks and vacant stores it seemed a deserted street of a deserted village teague the guide lived there he assured me it was not quite as lively a place as in the early days when it was a stage centre for an old and rich mining section we stayed there at the one hotel for a whole day most of which i spent sitting on the boardwalk whenever i chanced to look down the wide street 
it seemed always the same deserted but yampa had the charm of being old and forgotten and for that reason i would like to live there a while on august twenty third we started in two buckboards for the foothills some fifteen miles westward where teague's men were to meet us with saddle and pack horses the ride was not interesting until the flat top mountains began to loom and we saw the dark green slopes of spruce rising to bare gray cliffs and domes spotted with white banks of snow i felt the first cool breath of mountain air exhilarating and sweet from that moment i began to live we had left at six thirty teague my guide had been so rushed with his manifold tasks that i had scarcely seen him let alone gotten acquainted with him and on this ride he was far behind with our load of baggage we arrived at the edge of the foothills about noon it appeared to be the gateway of a valley with aspen groves and ragged jack pines on the slopes and a stream running down our driver called it the still water that struck me as strange for the stream was in a great hurry r c spied trout in it and schools of darkish mullet-like fish which we were informed were grayling we wished for our tackle then and for time to fish teague's man a young fellow called virgil met us here he did not resemble the ancient virgil in the least but he did look as if he had walked right out of one of my romances of wild riders so i took a liking to him at once but the bunch of horses he had corralled there did not excite any delight in me horses of course were the most important part of our outfit and that moment of first seeing the horses that were to carry us on such long rides was an anxious and thrilling one i have felt it many times and it never grows any weaker from experience many a scrubby lot of horses had turned out well upon acquaintance and some i had found hard to part with at the end of trips up to that time however i had not seen a bear hunter's horses and i was much concerned by the fact that these were a sorry-looking outfit dusty ragged maneless cut and bruised and crippled still i reflected they were bunched up so closely that i could not tell much about them and i decided to wait for teague before i chose a horse for any one in an hour teague trotted up to our resting place beside his own mount he had two white saddle horses and nine pack animals heavily laden teague was a sturdy rugged man with bronze face and keen gray-blue eyes very genial and humorous straightway i got the impression that he liked work let's organize he said briskly have you picked the horses you're going to ride teague led from the midst of that dusty kicking bunch a rangy powerful horse with four white feet a white face and a noble head he had escaped my eye i felt thrillingly that here at least was one horse the rest of the horses were permanently crippled or temporarily lame and i had no choice except to take the one it would be kindest to ride ain't much like your silver mane or black star said teague laughing what do you know about them i asked very much pleased at this from him well i know all about them he replied i'll have you the best horse in this country in a few days fact is i've bought him and he'll come with my cowboy vern now we're organized let's move we rode through a meadow along a spruce slope above which towered the great mountain it was a zigzag trail rough boggy and steep in places the still water meandered there and little breaks on the water gave evidence of feeding trout we had several miles of meadow and then sheered off to the left up into the timber it was a spruce for us very still and fragrant we climbed out up on a bench and across a flat up another bench and out of the timber into the patches of snow here snow could be felt in the air water was everywhere i saw a fox a badger and another furry creature too elusive to name one more climb brought us to the top of the flat top pass about eleven thousand feet the view in the direction from which we had come was splendid and led the eye to the distant sweeping ranges dark and dim along the horizon the flat tops were flat enough but not very wide at this pass and we were soon going down again into a green gulf of spruce with ragged peaks lifting beyond here again i got the suggestion of limitless space 
it took us an hour to ride down to little trapper's lake a small clear green sheet of water the larger lake was farther down it was big irregular and bordered by spruce forests and shadowed by the lofty gray peaks the camp was on the far side the air appeared rather warm and mosquitoes bothered us however they did not stay long it was after sunset and i was too tired to have many impressions our cook appeared to be a melancholy man he had a deep quavering voice a long drooping moustache and sad eyes he was silent most of the time the men called him bill and yelled when they spoke for he was somewhat deaf it did not take me long to discover that he was a good cook our tent was pitched down the slope from the cook tent we were too tired to sit round a campfire and talk the stars were white and splendid and they hung over the flat ridges like great beacon lights the lake appeared to be enclosed on three sides by amphitheatric mountains black with spruce up to the gray walls of rock the night grew cold and very still the bells on the horses tinkled distantly there was a soft murmur of falling water a lonesome coyote barked and that thrilled me teague's dogs answered this prowler and some of them had voices to make a hunter thrill one the bloodhound cane had a roar like a lion's i had not gotten acquainted with the hounds and i was thinking about them when i fell asleep next morning i was up at five thirty the air was cold and nipping and frost shone on grass and sage a red glow of sunrise gleamed on the tip of the mountain and slowly grew downward the cool handle of an axe felt good i soon found however that i could not wield it long for lack of breath the elevation was close to ten thousand feet and the air at that height was thin and rare after each series of lusty strokes i had to rest r c who could handle an axe as he used to swing a baseball bat made fun of my efforts whereupon i relinquished the tool to him and chuckled at his discomfiture after breakfast r c and i got out our tackles and rigged up fly rods and sallied forth to the lake with the same eagerness we had felt when we were boys going after chubs and sunfish the lake glistened green in the sunlight and it lay like a gem at the foot of the magnificent black slopes the water was full of little floating particles that teague called wild rice i thought the lake had begun to work like eastern lakes during dog days it did not look propitious for fishing but teague reassured us the outlet of this lake was the head of white river we tried the outlet first but trout were not rising there then we began wading and casting along a shallow bar of the lake teague had instructed us to cast then drag the flies slowly across the surface of the water in imitation of a swimming fly or bug i tried this and several times when the leader was close to me and my rod far back i had strikes with my rod in that position i could not hook the trout then i cast my own way letting the flies sink a little to my surprise and dismay i had only a few strikes and could not hook the fish r c however had better luck and that too in wading right over the ground i had covered to beat me at anything always gave him the most unaccountable fiendish pleasure these are educated trout he said it takes a skilful fisherman to make them rise now anybody can catch the big game of the sea which is your foot but here you are in g watch me cast i watched him make a most atrocious cast but the water boiled and he hooked two good-sized trout at once quite speechless with envy and admiration i watched him play them and eventually beach them they were cutthroat trout silvery sided and marked with the red slash along their gills that gave them their name i did not catch any while waiting but from the bank i spied one and dropping a fly in front of his nose i got him r c caught four more all about a pound in weight and then he had a strike that broke his leader he did not have another leader so we walked back to camp wild flowers colored the open slopes leading down out of the forest 
goldenrod golden daisies and bluebells were plentiful and very pretty here i found my first columbine the beautiful flower that is the emblem of colorado in vivid contrast to its blue indian paintbrush thinly dotted the slopes and varied in color from red to pink and from white to yellow my favorite of all wild flowers the purple asters were there too on tall nodding stems with pale faces held up to the light the reflection of mountain and forest in trapper's lake was clear and beautiful the hounds bade our approach to camp we both made a great show about beginning our little camp tasks but we did not last very long the sun felt so good and it was so pleasant to lounge under a pine one of the blessings of outdoor life was that a man could be like an indian and do nothing so from rest i passed to dreams and from dreams to sleep in the afternoon r c and i went out again to try for trout the lake appeared to be getting thicker with that floating muck and we could not raise a fish then we tried the outlet again here the current was swift i found a place between two willow banks where trout were breaking on the surface it took a long cast for me but about every tenth attempt i would get a fly over the right place and raise a fish they were small but that did not detract from my gratification the light on the water was just right for me to see the trout rise and that was a beautiful sight as well as a distinct advantage i had caught four when a shout from r c called me quickly downstream i found him standing in the middle of a swift shoot with his rod bent double and a long line out got a whale he yelled see him down there in that white water see him flash red go down there and land him for me hurry he's got all the line i ran down to an open place in the willows here the stream was shallow and very swift in the white water i caught a flashing gleam of red then i saw the shine of the leader but i could not reach it without wading in when i did this the trout lunged out he looked crimson and silver i could have put my fist in his mouth grab the leader yank him out yelled r c in desperation there he's got all the line but it'd be better to wade down i yelled back he shouted that the water was too deep and for me to save his fish this was an awful predicament for me i knew the instant i grasped the leader that the big trout would break it or pull free the same situation with different kinds of fish had presented itself many times in my numberless fishing jaunts with r c and they all crowded to my mind nevertheless i had no choice plunging into my knees i frantically reached for the leader the red trout made a surge i missed him r c yelled that something would break that was no news to me another plunge brought me in touch with the leader then i essayed to lead the huge cutthroat ashore he was heavy but he was tired and that gave birth to hopes near the shore as i was about to lift him he woke up swam round me twice then ran between my legs when a little later r c came panting downstream i was sitting on the bank all wet with one knee skinned and i was holding his broken leader in my hands strange to say he went into a rage blamed me for the loss of that big trout under such circumstances it was always best to maintain silence and i did so as long as i could after his paroxysm had spent itself and he had become somewhat near a rational being once more he asked me was he big oh a whale of a trout i replied huh well how big thereupon i enlarged upon the exceeding size and beauty of that trout i made him out very much bigger than he actually looked to me and i minutely described his beauty and wonderful gaping mouth r c groaned and that was my revenge we returned to camp early and i took occasion to scrape acquaintance with the dogs it was a strangely assorted pack four airedales one bloodhound and seven other hounds of mixed breeds there were also three pup hounds white and yellow very pretty dogs and like all pups noisy and mischievous they made friends easily this applied also to one of the airedales a dog recently presented to teague by some estimable old lady who had called him kaiser and made a pet of him 
as might have been expected of a dog even an airedale with that name he was no good but he was very affectionate and exceedingly funny when he was approached he had a trick of standing up holding up his forepaws in an appealing sort of way with his head twisted in the most absurd manner this was when he was chained otherwise he would have been climbing up on any one who gave him the chance he was the most jealous dog i ever saw he could not be kept chained very long because he always freed himself at meal time he would slip noiselessly behind some one and steal the first morsel he could snatch bill was always wrapping kaiser with pans or billets of firewood next morning was clear and cold we had breakfast and then saddled up to ride to big fish lake for an hour we rode up and down ridges of heavy spruce along a trail we saw elk and deer sign elk tracks appeared almost as large as cow tracks when we left the trail to climb into heavy timber we began to look for game the forest was dark green and brown silent as a grave no squirrels or birds or sign of life we had a hard ride up and down steep slopes a feature was the open swaths made by avalanches the ice and snow had cut a path through the timber and the young shoots of spruce were springing up i imagined the roar made by that tremendous slide we found elk tracks everywhere and some fresh sign where the grass had been turned recently and also much old and fresh sign where the elk had skinned the saplings by rubbing their antlers to get rid of the velvet some of these rubs looked like blazes made by an axe the airedale fox a wonderful dog routed out a she coyote that evidently had a den somewhere for she barked angrily at the dog and at us fox could not catch her she led him round in a circle and we could not see her in the thick brush it was fine to hear the wild staccato note again we crossed many little parks bright and green blooming with wild asters and indian paintbrush and golden daisies the patches of red and purple were exceedingly beautiful everywhere we rode we were knee-deep in flowers at length we came out of the heavy timbers down upon F big fish lake the lake was about a half a mile across deep blue-green in color with rocky shores upon the opposite side were beaver mounds we could see big trout swimming round but they would not rise to a fly r c went out in an old boat and paddled to the head of the lake and fished at the inlet here he caught a fine trout i went around and up the little river that fed the lake it curved swiftly through a meadow and had deep dark eddies under mossy flowering banks at other places the stream ran swiftly over clean gravel beds it was musical and clear as crystal and to the touch of hand as cold as ice water i waded in and began to cast i saw several big trout and at last coaxed one to take my fly but i missed him then in a swift current a flash of red caught my eye and i saw a big trout lazily rise to my fly saw him take it and i hooked him he was not active but heavy and plunging and he bored in and out and made short runs i had not seen such beautiful red colors in any fish he made a fine fight but at last i landed him on the grass a cutthroat of about one and three-quarter pounds deep red and silver and green and spotted all over that was the extent of my luck we went back to the point and thought we would wait a little while to see if the trout would begin to rise but they did not a storm began to mutter and boom along the battlements great gray clouds obscured the peaks and at length the rain came it was cold and cutting we sought the shelter of spruces for a while and waited after an hour it cleared somewhat and r c caught a fine one-pound cutthroat all green and silver with only two slashes of red along under the gills then another storm threatened before we got ready to leave for camp the rain began again to fall and we looked for a wedding 
It was raining hard when we rode into the woods, and very cold. The spruces were dripping, but we soon got warm from hard riding up steep slopes. After an hour the rain ceased, the sun came out, and from the open places high up we could see a great green void of spruce, and beyond boundless black ranges running off to dim horizon. We flushed a big blue grouse with a brood of little ones, and at length another big one in one of the open parks the airedale fox showed signs of scenting game there was a patch of ground where the grass was pressed down teague whispered and pointed i saw the gray rump of an elk protruding from behind some spruces i beckoned for r c and we both dismounted just then the elk rose and stalked out it was a magnificent bull with crowning lofty antlers the shoulders and neck appeared black he raised his head and turning trotted away with ease and grace for such a huge beast that was a wild and beautiful sight i had not seen before we were entranced and when he disappeared we burst out with exclamations we rode on toward camp and out upon a bench that bordered the lofty red wall of rock from there we went down into heavy forest again dim and gray with its dank penetrating odor and oppressive stillness the forest primeval when we rode out of that into open slopes the afternoon was far advanced and long shadows lay across the distant ranges when we reached camp supper and a fire to warm cold wet feet were exceedingly welcome i was tired later r c and i rode up a mile or so above camp and hitched our horses near teague's old corral our intention was to hunt up along the side of the slope teague came along presently we waited hoping the big black clouds would break but they did not they rolled down with gray swirling edges like smoke and a storm enveloped us we sought shelter in a thick spruce it rained and hailed by and by the air grew bitterly cold and teague suggested we give up and ride back and so we did the mountains were dim and obscure through the gray gloom and the black spear-tipped spruces looked ghostly against the background the lightning was vivid and the thunder rolled and crashed in magnificent bombardment across the heavens next morning at six thirty the sun was shining clear and only a few clouds sailed in the blue wind was in the west and the weather promised fair but clouds began to creep up behind the mountains first hazy then white then dark nevertheless we decided to ride out and cross the flat top rim and go around what they called the chinese wall it rained as we climbed through the spruces above little trapper's lake and as we got near the top it began to hail again the air grew cold once out on top I found a wide expanse, green and white, level in places, but with huge upheavals of ridge. There were flowers here at 11,000 feet. The view to the rear was impressive, a wide up-and-down plain studded with outcroppings of rocks and patches of snow. We were then on top of the Chinese wall, and the view to the west was grand. At the moment hail was falling thick and white and to stand above the streaked curtain as it fell into the abyss was a strange new experience below two thousand feet lay the spruce forest and it sloped and dropped into the white river valley which in turn rose a long jagged dark green slope up to a bare jagged peak beyond this stretched range on range dark under the lowering pall of clouds on top we found fresh rocky mountain sheep tracks a little later going into a draw we crossed a snow bank solid as ice we worked down into this draw into the timber it hailed and rained some more then cleared the warm sun felt good once down in the parks we began to ride through a flower garden every slope was beautiful in gold and red and blue and white these parks were luxuriant with grass and everywhere we found elk beds where the great stags had been lying to flee at our approach but we did not see one the bigness of this slope impressed me we rode miles and miles and every park was surrounded by heavy timber 
at length we got into a burned district where the tall dead spruces stood sear and ghastly and the ground was so thickly strewn with fallen trees that we had difficulty in threading a way through them patches of aspen grew on the hillside still fresh and green despite this frosty morning here we found a sago lily one of the most beautiful of flowers here also i saw pink indian paintbrush at the foot of this long burned slope we came to the white river trail and followed it up and around to camp late in the evening about sunset i took my rifle and slipped off into the woods back of camp i walked a short distance then paused to listen to the silence of the forest there was not a sound it was a place of peace by and by i heard snapping of twigs and presently heard r c and teague approaching me we penetrated half a mile into the spruce pausing now and then to listen at length r c heard something we stopped after a little i heard the ring of a horn on wood it was thrilling then came the crack of a hoof on stone then the clatter of loosened rock we crept on but the elk or deer evaded us we hunted around till dark without further sign of any game r c and teague and i rode out at seven thirty and went down white river for three miles in one patch of bare ground we saw tracks of five deer where they had come in for salt then we climbed high up a burned ridge winding through patches of aspen we climbed ridge after ridge and at last got out of the burned district into reaches of heavy spruce coming to a park full of deer and elk tracks we dismounted and left our horses i went to the left and into some beautiful woods where i saw beds of deer or elk and many tracks returning to the horses i led them into a larger park and climbed high into the open and watched there i saw some little squirrels about three inches long and some gray birds very tame i waited a long time before there was any sign of r c or teague and then it was the dog i saw first i whistled and they climbed up to me we mounted and rode on for an hour then climbed through a magnificent forest of huge trees windfalls and a ferny mossy soft ground at length we came out at the head of a steep bare slope running down to a verdant park crossed by stretches of timber on the way back to camp we ran across many elk beds and deer trails and for a while a small band of elk evidently trotted ahead of us but out of sight next day we started for a few days trip to big fish lake r c and i went along up around the mountain i found our old trail and was at a loss only a few times we saw fresh elk sign but no live game at all in the afternoon we fished i went up the river half a mile while r c fished the lake neither of us had any luck later we caught four trout one of which was fair-sized toward sunset the trout began to rise all over the lake but we could not get them to take a fly the following day we went up to twin lakes and found them to be beautiful little green gems surrounded by spruce i saw some big trout in the large lake but they were wary we tried every way to get a strike no use in the little lake matters were worse it was full of trout up to two pounds they would run at the fly only to refuse it exasperating work we gave up and returned to big fish after supper we went out to try again the lake was smooth and quiet all at once as if by concert the trout began to rise everywhere in a little bay we began to get strikes i could see the fish rise to the fly the small ones were too swift and the large ones too slow it seemed we caught one and then had bad luck we snarled our lines drifted wrong broke leaders snapped off flies hooked too quick and too slow and did everything that was clumsy i lost two big fish because they followed the fly as i drew it toward me across the water to imitate a swimming fly of course this made a large slack line which i could not get up finally i caught one big fish and altogether we got seven all in that little bay where the water was shallow 
In other places we could not catch a fish. I had one vicious strike. The fish appeared to be feeding on a tiny black gnat, which we could not imitate. This was the most trying experience of all. We ought to have caught a basketful. The next day, September 1st, we rode down along the outlet of Big Fish to White River, and down that for miles to fish for grayling. The stream was large and swift and cold. It appeared full of ice water and rocks, but no fish. We met fishermen, an automobile, and a camp outfit. That was enough for me. Where an automobile can run, I do not belong. The fishing was poor, but the beautiful open valley, flowered in gold and purple, was recompense for a good deal of bad luck. A grayling, or what they called a grayling, was not as beautiful a fish as my fancy had pictured. He resembled a sucker or mullet, had a small mouth, dark color, and was rather a sluggish-looking fish. We rode back through a thunderstorm, and our yellow slickers afforded much comfort. Next morning was bright, clear, cold. I saw the moon go down over a mountain rim, rose-flushed with the sunrise. R.C. and I, with Teague, started for the top of the big mountain on the west. I had a new horse, a roan, and he looked a thoroughbred. He appeared tired, but I thought he would be great. We took a trail through the woods, dark green-gray, cool and verdant, odorous and still. We began to climb. Occasionally we crossed parks and little streams. Up near the long bare slope the spruce trees grew large and far apart. They were beautiful, gray as if bearded with moss. Beyond this we got into the rocks and climbing became arduous. Long zigzags up the slope brought us to the top of a notch, where at the right lay a patch of snow. The top of the mountain was comparatively flat, but it had timbered ridges and bare plains and little lakes with dark domes rising beyond. We rode around to the right, climbing out of the timber to where the dwarf spruces and brush had a hard struggle for life. The great gulf below us was immense dark and wild, studded with lakes and parks, and shadowed by moving clouds. Sheep tracks, old and fresh, afforded us thrills. Away on the western rim, where we could look down upon a long, rugged, iron-gray ridge of mountain, our guide, using the glass, found two big stags. We all had our fill of looking. I could see them plainly with naked eyes. We decided to go back to where we could climb down on that side, alter the horses, leave all extra accoutrements, and stalk those stags, and take a picture of them. I led the way and descended under the rim. It was up and down, over rough shale, and up steps of broken rocks, and down little cliffs. We crossed the ridge twice, many times having to lend a hand to each other. At length I reached a point where I could see the stags lying down. The place was an open spot on a rocky promontory with a fringe of low spruces. The stags were magnificent in size, with antlers in the velvet. One had twelve points. They were lying in the sun to harden their horns, according to our guide. I slipped back to the others, and we all decided to have a look. So we climbed up. All of us saw the stags, twitching ears and tails. Then we crept back, and once more I took the lead to crawl round under the ledge so we could come up about even with them. Here I found the hardest going yet. I came to a wind-torn crack in the thin ledge, and from this I could just see the tips of the antlers. I beckoned the others. Laboriously they climbed. Our sea went through first. I went over next, and then came Teague. R.C. and I started to crawl down to a big rock that was our objective point. We went cautiously, with bated breath and pounding hearts. When we got there, I peeped over to see the stags still lying down, but they had heads intent and wary. Still, I did not think they had scented us. R.C. took a peep, and turning excitedly, he whispered, "'See only one, and he's standing.' And I answered, Let's get down around to the left where we can get a better chance. It was only a few feet down, and we got there. 
when he peeped over at this point he exclaimed they're gone it was a keen disappointment they winded us i decided we looked and looked but we could not see to our left because of the bulge of rock we climbed back and then i saw one of the stags loping leisurely off to the left teague was calling he said they had walked off the promontory looking up and stopping occasionally then we realized we must climb back along that broken ridge and then up to the summit of the mountain so we started that climb back was proof of the effect of excitement on judgment we had not calculated at all on the distance or ruggedness and we had a job before us we got along well under the western wall and fairly well straight across through the long slope of timber where we saw sheep tracks and expected any moment to sight an old ram but we did not find one and when we got out of the timber upon the bare sliding slope we had to halt a hundred times we could zigzag only a few steps the altitude was twelve thousand feet and oxygen seemed scarce i nearly dropped all the climbing appeared to come hardest on the middle of my right foot and it could scarcely have burned hotter if it had been in fire despite the strenuous toil there were not many moments that i was not aware of the vastness of the gulf below or the peaceful lakes brown as amber or the golden parks and nearer at hand i found magenta-colored indian paintbrush very exquisite and rare coming out on a ledge i spied a little dark animal with a long tail he was running along the opposite promontory about three hundred yards distant when he stopped i took a shot at him and missed by apparently a scant half foot after catching our breath we climbed more and more and still more at last to drop on the rim hot wet and utterly spent the air was keen cold and invigorating we were soon rested and finding our horses we proceeded along the rim westward upon rounding an outcropping of rock we flushed a flock of ptarmigan soft gray rock-colored birds about the size of pheasants and when they flew they showed beautiful white bands on their wings these are the rare birds that have feathered feet and turn white in winter they did not fly far and several were so tame they did not fly at all we got our little twenty two revolvers and began to shoot at the nearest bird he was some thirty feet distant but we could not hit him and at last fox getting disgusted tried to catch the bird and made him fly i felt relieved for as we were getting closer and closer with every shot it seemed possible that if the ptarmigan sat there long enough we might eventually have hit him the mystery was why we shot so poorly but this was explained by r c who discovered we had been shooting the wrong shells it was a long hard ride down the rough winding trail but riding down was a vastly different thing from going up end of chapter two part one chapter two of tales of lonely trails by zane gray this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter two colorado trails part two on september third we were up at five thirty it was clear and cold and the red of sunrise tinged the peaks the snow banks looked pink all the early morning scene was green fresh cool with that mountain rareness of atmosphere we packed to break camp and after breakfast it took hours to get our outfit in shape to start a long string resembling a caravan i knew that events would occur that day first we lost one of the dogs Vern went back after him the dogs were mostly chained in pairs to prevent their running off samson the giant hound was chained to a little dog and the others were paired not according to size by any means the poor dogs were disgusted with the arrangement it developed presently that cain the bloodhound a strange and wild hound much like dawn of my old lion hunting days slipped us and was not missed for hours teague decided to send back for him later 
Next, in order of events, as we rode up the winding trail through the spruce forest, we met Teague's cow and calf, which he had kept all summer in camp. For some reason, neither could be left. Teague told us to ride on, and an hour later, when we halted to rest on the flat top mountain, he came along with the rest of the train, and in the fore was the cow alone. It was evident that she was distressed and angry, for it took two men to keep her on the trail. And another thing plain to me was the fact that she was going to demoralize the pack horses. We were not across the wide range of this flat mountain when one of the pack animals, a lean and lanky sorrel, appeared suddenly to go mad and began to buck off a pack. He succeeded. Thus inspired, a black horse, very appropriately named Nigger, to try his luck, and he shifted his pack in short order. It took patience, time, and effort to repack. The cow was a disorganizer. She took up as wide a trail as a road, and the pack animals, some with dignity and others with disgust, tried to avoid her vicinity. Going down the steep forest trail on the other side, the real trouble began. The pack train split, ran and bolted, crashing through the trees, plunging down steep places, and jumping logs. It was a wild sort of chase, but luckily the packs remained intact until we were once more on open flat ground. All went well for a while, except for an accident for which I was to blame. I spurred my horse, and he plunged suddenly past R.C.'s mount, colliding with him, tearing off my stirrup, and spraining R.C.'s ankle. This was almost a serious accident, as R.C. has an old baseball ankle that required favoring. Next in order was the sorrel. As I saw it, he needlessly went too near the cow, which we now called Bossy, and she acted somewhat like a Spanish bull, to the effect that the sorrel was scared and angered at once. He began to run and plunge and buck right into the other pack animals, dropping articles from his pack as he dashed along. He stampeded the train and gave the saddle horses a scare. When order was restored and the whole outfit gathered together again, a full hour had been lost. By this time all the horses were tired, and that facilitated progress because there were no more serious breaks. Down in the valley it was hot, and the ride grew long and wearisome. Nevertheless, the scenery was beautiful. The valley was green and level, and a meandering stream formed many little lakes. On one side was a steep hill of sage and aspens, and on the other a black spear-pointed spruce forest, rising sheer to a bold, blunt peak, patched with snow banks, and bronze and gray in the clear light. Huge white clouds sailed aloft, making dark moving shadows along the great slopes. We reached our turning-off place about five o'clock, and again entered the fragrant, quiet forest, a welcome change. We climbed and climbed, at length coming into an open park of slopes and green borders of forest, with a lake in the center. We pitched camp on the skirt of the western slope under the spruces, and worked hard to get the tents up and boughs cut for beds. Darkness caught us with our hands still full, and we ate supper in the light of a campfire, with the black, deep forest behind and the pale afterglow across the lake. I had a bad night, being too tired to sleep well. Many times I saw the moon shadows of spruce branches trembling on the tent walls and the flickering shadows of the dying campfire. I heard the melodious tinkle of the bells on the hobbled horses. Bossy bawled often, a discordant break in the serenity of the night. Occasionally the hounds bayed her. Toward morning I slept some, and awakened with what seemed a broken back. All except our sea were slow in crawling out. The sun rose hot. This lower altitude was appreciated by all. After breakfast we set to work to put the camp in order. That afternoon we rode off to look over the ground. We crossed the park and worked up a timbered ridge remarkable for mossy bare ground, and higher up for its almost total absence of grass or flowers. On the other side of this we had a fine view of Mount Dome, a high peak across a valley. 
then we worked down into the valley which was full of parks and ponds and running streams we found some fresh sign of deer and a good deal of old elk and deer sign but we saw no game of any kind it was a tedious ride back through thick forest where i observed many trees that had been barked by porcupines some patches were four feet from the ground indicating that the porcupine had sat on the snow when he gnawed those particular places after sunset r c and i went off down a trail into the woods and sitting down under a huge spruce we listened the forest was solemn and still far down somewhere roared a stream and that was all the sound we heard the gray shadows darkened and gloom penetrated the aisles of the forest until all the sheltered places were black as pitch the spruces looked spectral and speaking the silence of the woods was deep profound and primeval it all worked on my imagination until i began to hear faint sounds and finally grand orchestral crashings of melody on our return the strange creeping chill that must be a descendant of the old elemental fear caught me at all obscure curves in the trail next day we started off early and climbed through the woods and into the parks under the dome we scared a deer that had evidently been drinking his fresh tracks led before us but we could not catch a glimpse of him we climbed out of the parks up on to the rocky ridges where the spruce grew scarce and then farther to the jumble of stones that had weathered from the great peaks above and beyond that up the slope where all the vegetation was dwarfed deformed and weird strange manifestation of its struggle for life here the air grew keener and cooler and the light seemed to expand we rode on to the steep slope that led up to the gap we were to cross between the dome and its companion i saw a red fox running up the slope and dismounting i took a quick shot at three hundred yards and scored a hit it turned out to be a cross fox and had very pretty fur when we reached the level of the deep gap the wind struck us hard and cold on that side opened an abyss gray and shelving as it led down to green timber and then on to the yellow parks and black ridges that gleamed under the opposite range we had to work round a wide amphitheater and up a steep corner to the top this turned out to be level and smooth for a long way with a short velvety yellow grass like moss spotted with flowers here at thirteen thousand feet the wind hit us with exceeding force and soon had us with freezing hands and faces all about us were bold black and gray peaks with patches of snow and above them clouds of white and drab showing blue sky between it developed that this grassy summit ascended in a long gradual sweep from the apex of which stretched a grand expanse like a plain of gold down and down endlessly almost and then up and up to end under a gray butte highest of the points around the ride across here seemed to have no limit but it was beautiful though severe on endurance i saw another fox and dismounting fired five shots as he ran dusting him with three bullets we rode out to the edge of the mountain and looked off it was fearful yet sublime the world lay beneath us in many places we rode along the rim and at last circled the great butte and worked up behind it on a swell of slope here the range ran west and the drop was not sheer but gradual with fine benches for sheep we found many tracks and fresh sign but did not see one sheep meanwhile the hard wind had ceased and the sun had come out making the ride comfortable as far as weather was concerned we had gotten a long way from camp and finding no trail to descend in that direction we turned to retrace our steps that was about one o'clock and we rode and rode and rode until i was so tired that i could not appreciate the scenes as i had on the way up it took six hours to get back to camp next morning we took the hounds and rode off for bear 
eight of the hounds were chained in braces one big and one little dog together and they certainly had a hard time of it samson the giant gray and brown hound and jim the old black leader were free to run to and fro across the way we rode down a few miles and into the forest there were two long black ridges and here we were to hunt for bear it was the hardest kind of work turning and twisting between the trees dodging snags and brushing aside branches and guiding a horse among fallen logs the forest was thick and the ground was a rich brown and black muck soft to the horse's feet many times the hounds got caught on snags and had to be released once samson picked up a scent of some kind and went off baying old jim ran across that trail and returned thus making it clear that there was no bear trail we penetrated deep between the two ridges and came to a little lake about thirty feet wide surrounded by rushes and grass here we rested the horses and incidentally ourselves fox chased a duck and it flew into the woods and hid under a log fox trailed it and teague shot it just as he might have a rabbit we got two more ducks fine big mallards the same way it was amazing to me and r c remarked that never had he seen such strange and foolish ducks this forest had hundreds of trees barked by porcupines and some clear to the top but we met only one of the animals and he left several quills in the nose of one of the pups i was of the opinion that these porcupines destroyed many fine trees as i saw a number barked all around we did not see any bear sign on the way back to camp we rode out of the forest and down a wide valley the opposite side of which was open slope with patches of alder even at a distance i could discern the color of these open glades and grassy benches they had a tinge of purple like purple sage when i got to them i found a profusion of asters of the most exquisite shades of lavender pink and purple that slope was long and all the way up we rode through these beautiful wild flowers i shall never forget that sight nor the many asters that shone like stars out of the green the pink ones were new to me and actually did not seem real i noticed my horse occasionally nipped a bunch and ate them which seemed to me almost as heartless as to tread them under foot when we got up the slope and into the woods again we met a storm and travelled for an hour in the rain and under the dripping spruces feeling the cold wet sting of swaying branches as we rode by then the sun came out bright and the forest glittered all gold and green the smell of the woods after a rain is indescribable it combines a rare tang of pine spruce earth and air all refreshed the day after we left at eight o'clock and rode down to the main trail and up that for five miles where we cut off to the left and climbed into the timber the woods were fresh and dewy dark and cool and for a long time we climbed bench after bench where the grass and ferns and moss made a thick deep cover farther up we got into fallen timber and made slow progress at timberline we tied the horses and climbed up to the pass between two great mountain ramparts sheep tracks were in evidence but not very fresh teague and i climbed on top and r c with verne went below just along the timber line the climb on foot took all my strength and many times i had to halt for breath the air was cold we stole along the rim and peered over r c and verne looked like very little men far below and the dogs resembled mice teague climbed higher and left me on a promontory watching all around the cloud pageant was magnificent with huge billowy white masses across the valley and to the west great black thunderheads rolling up the wind began to blow hard carrying drops of rain that stung and the air was nipping cold i felt aloof from all the crowded world alone on the windy heights with clouds and storm all around me when the storm threatened i went back to the horses it broke but was not severe after all 
at length r c and the men returned and we mounted to ride back to camp the storm blew away leaving the sky clear and blue and the sun shone warm we had an hour of winding in and out among the windfalls of timber and jumping logs and breaking through brush then the way sloped down to a beautiful forest shady and green full of mossy dells almost overgrown with ferns and low spreading ground pine or spruce the aisles of the forest were long and shaded by the stately spruces water ran through every ravine sometimes a brawling brook sometimes a rivulet hidden under overhanging mossy banks we scared up two lonely grouse at long intervals at length we got into fallen timber and from that worked into a jumble of rocks where the going was rough and dangerous the afternoon waned as we rode on and on up and down in and out around and at times the horses stood almost on their heads sliding down steep places where the earth was soft and black and gave forth a dank odor we passed ponds and swamps and little lakes we saw where beavers had gnawed down aspens and we just escaped miring our horses in marshes where the grass grew rich and golden hiding the treacherous mire the sun set and still we did not seem to get anywhere i was afraid darkness might overtake us and we would get lost in the woods presently we struck an old elk trail and following that for a while came to a point where r c and i recognized a tree and a glade where we had been before and not far from camp a welcome discovery next day we broke camp and started across country for new territory near whitley's peak we rode east up the mountain after several miles along an old logging road we reached the timber and eventually the top of the ridge we went down crossing parks and swales there were cattle pastures and eaten over and trodden so much they had no beauty left teague wanted to camp at a salt lick but i did not care for the place we went on the dogs crossed a bear trail and burst out in a clamor we had a hard time holding them the guide and i had a hot argument i did not want to stay there and chase a bear in a cow pasture so we went on down into ranch country and this disgusted me further we crossed a ranch and rode several miles on a highway then turned abruptly and climbed a rough rocky ridge covered with brush and aspen we crossed it and went down for several miles and had to camp in an aspen grove on the slope of a ravine it was an uninviting place to stay but as there was no other we had to make the best of it the afternoon had waned i took a gun and went off down the ravine until i came to a deep gorge here i heard the sound of a brawling brook i sat down for an hour but saw no game that night i had a wretched bed one that i could scarcely stay in and i passed miserable hours i got up sore cramped sleepy and irritable we had to wait three hours for the horses to be caught and packed i had predicted straying horses at last we were off and rode along the steep slope of a canyon for several miles and then struck a stream of amber-colored water as we climbed along this we came into a deep spruce forest where it was a pleasure to ride i saw many dells and nooks cool and shady full of mossy rocks and great trees but flowers were scarce we were sorry to pass the head springs of that stream and to go on over the divide and down into the wooded but dry and stony country we rode until late and came at last to a park where sheep had been run i refused to camp here and teague in high dudgeon rode on as it turned out i was both wise and lucky for we rode into a park with many branches where there was good water and fair grass and a pretty grove of white pines in which to pitch our tents i enjoyed this camp and had a fine rest at night the morning broke dark and lowering we hustled to get started before a storm broke it began to rain as we mounted our horses and soon we were in the midst of a cold rain it blew hard we put on our slickers after a short ride down through the forest we entered buffalo park 
This was a large park, and we lost time trying to find a forester's trail leading out of it. At last we found one, but it soon petered out, and we were lost in thick timber, in a driving rain, with the cold wind increasing. But we kept on. This forest was deep and dark, with tremendous windfalls, and great canyons around which we had to travel. It took us hours to ride out of it. When we began to descend once more, we struck an old lumber road. More luck, the storm ceased, and presently we were out on an aspen slope with a great valley beneath and high black peaks beyond. Below the aspen were long swelling slopes of sage and grass, gray and golden and green. A ranch lay in the valley, and we crossed it to climb up a winding ravine, once more to the aspens where we camped in the rancher's pasture. It was a cold, wet camp, but we managed to be fairly comfortable. The sunset was gorgeous. The mass of clouds broke and rolled. There was exquisite golden light on the peaks, and many rose and violet-hued banks of cloud. Morning found us shrouded in fog. We were late starting. About nine the curtain of gray began to lift and break. We climbed pastures and aspen thickets, high up to the spruce, where the grass grew luxuriant and the red wall of rock overhung the long slopes. The view west was magnificent, a long, bulging range of mountains, vast stretches of green aspen slopes, winding parks of all shapes, gray and gold and green, and jutting peaks, and here and there patches of autumn blaze in grass and thicket. We spent the afternoon pitching camp on an aspen knoll, with water, grass, and wood near at hand, and the splendid view of mountains and valleys below. We spent many full days under the shadow of Whitley's Peak. After the middle of September, the aspens colored and blazed to the touch of frost, and the mountain slopes were exceedingly beautiful. Against a background of gray sage, the gold and red and purple aspen groves showed too much like exquisite paintings to seem real. In the mornings the frost glistened thick and white on the grass, and after the gorgeous sunsets of gold over the violet-hazed ranges, the air grew stingingly cold. Bear chasing with a pack of hounds has been severely criticized by many writers, and I was among them. I believed it a cowardly business, and that was why, if I chased bears with dogs, I wanted to chase the kind that could not be treed but like many another i did not know what i was writing about i did not shoot a bear out of a tree and i would not do so except in a case of hunger all the same leaving the tree out of consideration bear chasing with hounds is a tremendously exciting and hazardous game but my ideas about sport are changing hunting in the sportsman's sense is a cruel and degenerate business the more I hunt, the more I become convinced of something wrong about the game. I am a different man when I get a gun in my hands. All is exciting, hot-pressed, red. Hunting is magnificent up to the moment the shot is fired. After that, it is another matter. It is useless for sportsmen to tell me that they, in particular, hunt right, conserve the game, do not go beyond the limit, and all that sort of thing. I do not believe them, and I never met the guide who did. A rifle is made for killing. When a man goes out with one, he means to kill. He may keep within the law, but that is not the question. It is a question of spirit, and men who love to hunt are yielding to and always developing the old primitive instinct to kill. The meaning of the spirit of life is not clear to them. An argument may be advanced that according to the laws of self-preservation and the survival of the fittest, if a man stops all strife, all fight, then he will retrograde. And that is to say, if a man does not go to the wilds now and then, and work hard and live some semblance of the life of his progenitors, he will weaken. It seems that he will, but I am not prepared now to say whether or not that would be well. The Germans believe they are the race fittest to survive over all others, and that has made me a little sick of this Darwin business. 
to return however to the fact that to ride after hounds on a wild chase is a dangerous and wonderfully exhilarating experience i will relate a couple of instances and i will leave it to my readers to judge whether or not it is a cowardly sport one afternoon a rancher visited our camp and informed us that he had surprised a big black bear eating the carcass of a dead cow good we'll have a bear tomorrow night declared teague in delight we'll get him even if the trail is a day old but he'll come back tonight early next morning the young rancher and three other boys rode into camp saying they would like to go with us to see the fun we were glad to have them and we rode off through the frosted sage that crackled like brittle glass under the hoofs of the horses our guide led toward a branch of a park and when we got within perhaps a quarter of a mile teague suggested that r c and i go ahead on the chance of surprising the bear it was owing to this suggestion that my brother and i were well ahead of the others but we did not see any bear near the carcass of the cow old jim and samson were close behind us and when jim came within forty yards of that carcass he put his nose up with a deep and ringing bay and he shot by us like a streak he never went near the dead cow samson bayed like thunder and raced after him they're off i yelled to r c it's a hot scent come on we spurred our horses and they broke across the open park to the edge of the woods jim and samson were running straight with noses high i heard a string of yelps and bellows from our rear look back shouted r c teague and the cowboys were unleashing the rest of the pack it surely was great to see them stretch out yelping wildly like the wind they passed us jim and samson headed into the woods with deep bays i was riding teague's best horse for this sort of work and he understood the game and plainly enjoyed it r c s horse ran as fast in the woods as he did in the open this frightened me and i yelled to r c to be careful i yelled to deaf ears that is the first great risk a rider is not going to be careful we were right on top of jim and samson with the pack clamoring mad music just behind the forest rang both horses hurdled logs sometimes two at once my old lion chases with buffalo jones had made me skillful in dodging branches and snags and sliding knees back to avoid knocking them against trees for a mile the forest was comparatively open and here we had a grand and ringing run i received two hard knocks was unseated once but held on and i got a stinging crack in the face from a branch r c added several more black and blue spots to his already spotted anatomy and he missed just by an inch a solid snag that would have broken him in two the pack stretched out in wild staccato chorus the little airedales literally screeching jim got out of our sight and then samson still it was ever more thrilling to follow by sound rather than sight they led up a thick steep slope here we got into trouble in the windfalls of timber and the pack drew away from us up over the mountain we were halfway up when we heard them jump the bear the forest seemed full of strife and bays and yelps we heard the dogs go down again to our right and as we turned we saw teague and the others strung out along the edge of the park they got far ahead of us when we reached the bottom of the slope they were out of sight but we could hear them yell the hounds were working around on another slope from which craggy rocks loomed above the timber r c s horse lunged across the park and appeared to be running off from mine i was a little to the right and when my horse got under way full speed we had the bad luck to plunge suddenly into soft ground he went to his knees and i sailed out of the saddle fully twenty feet to alight all spread out and to slide like a plow i did not seem to be hurt when i got up my horse was coming and he appeared to be patient with me but he was in a hurry before we got across the wet place r c was out of sight i decided that instead of worrying about him i had better think about myself 
once on hard ground my horse fairly charged into the woods and we broke brush and branches as if they had been punk it was again open forest then a rocky slope and then a flat ridge with aisles between the trees here i heard the melodious notes of teague's hunting horn and following that the full chorus of the hounds they had treed the bear coming into still more open forest with rocks here and there i caught sight of r c far ahead and soon i had glimpses of the other horses and lastly while riding full tilt i spied a big black glistening bear high up in a pine a hundred yards or more distant slowing down i rode up to the circle of frenzied dogs and excited men the boys were all jabbering at once teague was beaming r c sat his horse and it struck me that he looked sorry for the bear fifteen minutes ejaculated teague with a proud glance at old jim standing with forepaws up on the pine indeed it had been a short and ringing chase all the time while i fooled around trying to photograph the treed bear r c sat there on his horse looking upward well gentlemen better kill him said teague cheerfully if he gets rested he'll come down it was then i suggested to r c that he do the shooting not much he exclaimed the bear looked really pretty perched up there he was as round as a barrel and black as jet and his fur shone in the gleams of sunlight his tongue hung out and his plump sides heaved showing what a quick hard run he had made before being driven to the tree what struck me most forcibly about him was the expression in his eyes as he looked down at those devils of hounds he was scared he realized his peril it was utterly impossible for me to see teague's point of view go ahead and plug him i replied to my brother get it over you do it he said no i won't why not i'd like to know maybe we won't have so good a chance again and i want you to get your bear i replied why it's like murder he protested oh not so bad as that i returned weakly we need the meat we've not had any game meat you know except ducks and grouse you won't do it he added grimly no i refuse meanwhile the young ranchers gazed at us with wide eyes and the expression on teague's honest ruddy face would have been funny under other circumstances that bear will come down and maybe kill one of my dogs he protested well he can come for all i care i repeated positively and i turned away i heard r c curse low under his breath then followed the spang of his thirty-five remington i wheeled in time to see the bear straining upward in terrible convulsions his head pointed high with blood spurting from his nose slowly he swayed and fell with a heavy crash the next bear chase we had was entirely different medicine off in the basin under the white slides back of our camp the hounds struck a fresh track and in an instant were out of sight with the cowboy Vern setting the pace we plunged after them it was rough country bogs brooks swales rocky little parks stretches of timber full of windfalls groves of aspens so thick we could scarcely squeeze through all these obstacles soon allowed the hounds to get far away we came out into a large park right under the mountain slope and here we sat our horses listening to the chase that trail led around the basin and back near to us up the thick green slope where high up near a ledge we heard the pack jump this bear it sounded to us as if he had been roused out of a sleep i'll bet it's one of the big grizzlies we've heard about said teague that was something to my taste i have seen a few grizzlies riding to higher ground i kept close watch on the few open patches up on the slope the chase led toward us for a while suddenly i saw a big bear with a frosted coat go lumbering across one of those openings silvertip silvertip i yelled at the top of my lungs i saw him my call thrilled everybody Vern spurred his horse and took to the right teague advised that we climb the slope so we made for the timber once there we had to get off and climb on foot it was steep 
rough, very hard work. I had on chaps and spurs. Soon I was hot, laboring, and my heart began to hurt. We all had to rest. The baying of the hounds inspirited us now and then, but presently we lost it. Teague said that they had gone over the ridge, and as soon as we got up to the top we would hear them again. We struck an elk trail with fresh elk tracks in it. Teague said they were just ahead of us. I never climbed so hard and fast in my life. We were all tuckered out when we reached the top of the ridge. Then, to our great disappointment, we did not hear the hounds. Mounting, we rode along the crest of this wooded ridge toward the western end, which was considerably higher. Once, on a bare patch of ground, we saw where the grizzly had passed. The big round tracks, towing in a little, made a chill go over me, no doubt of its being a silver tip. We climbed and rode to the high point, and coming out upon the summit of the mountain, we all heard the deep hoarse baying of the pack. They were in the canyon down a bare grassy slope and over a wooded bench at our feet. Teague yelled as he spurred down. R.C. rode hard in his tracks. But my horse was new to this bear chasing. He was meddlesome, and he did not want to do what I wanted. When I jabbed the spurs into his flanks, he nearly bucked me off. I was looking for a soft place to light when he quit. Long before I got down that open slope, Teague and R.C. had disappeared. I had to follow their tracks. This I did at a gallop, but now and then lost the tracks and had to haul in to find them. If I could have heard the hounds from there, I would have gone on anyway. But once down in the jack pines, I could hear neither yell or bay. The pines were small, close together, and tough. I hurt my hands, scratched my face, barked my knees. The horse had a habit of suddenly deciding to go the way he liked instead of the way I guided him, and when he plunged between saplings too close together to permit us both to go through, it was exceedingly hard on me. I was worked into a frenzy. Suppose R.C. should come face to face with that old grizzly and fail to kill him. That was the reason for my desperate hurry. I got a crack on the head that nearly blinded me. My horse grew hot and began to run in every little open space. He could scarcely be held in, and I, with the blood hot in me, too, did not hold him hard enough. It seemed miles across that wooded bench, but at last I reached another slope. Coming out upon a canyon rim, I heard R.C. and Teague yelling, and I heard the hounds fighting the grizzly. He was growling and threshing about far below. I had missed the tracks made by Teague and my brother, and it was necessary to find them. That slope looked impassable. I rode back along the rim, then forward. Finally I found where the ground was plowed deep, and here I headed my horse. He had been used to smooth roads, and he could not take these jumps. I went forward on his neck, but I hung on and spurred him hard. The mad spirit of that chase had gotten into him, too. All the time I could hear the fierce baying and yelping of the hounds, and occasionally I heard a savage bawl from the bear. I literally plunged, slid, broke away down that mountain slope, riding all the time, before I discovered the footprints of Teague and R.C. They had walked, leading their horses. By this time I was so mad I could not get off. I rode all the way down that steep slope of dense saplings, loose rock slides, and earth, and jumble of splintered cliff. That he did not break my neck and his own spoke the truth about that roan horse. Despite his inexperience, he was great. We fell over one bank, but a thicket of aspen saved us from rolling. The avalanche slid from under us until I imagined that the grizzly would be scared. Once, as I stopped to listen, I heard bear and pack farther down the canyon, heard them above the roar of a rushing stream. They went on, and I lost the sound of fight. But R.C.'s clear, thrilling call floated up to me. Probably he was worried about me. Then, before I realized it, I was at the foot of the slope, in a narrow canyon bed full of rocks and trees, with the din of roaring water in my ears. I could hear nothing else. 
tracks were everywhere and when i came to the first open place i was thrilled the grizzly had plunged off a sandy bar into the water and there he had fought the hounds signs of that battle were easy to read i saw where his huge tracks still wet led up the opposite sandy bank then downstream i did my most reckless riding on level ground the horse was splendid once he leaped clear across the brook every plunge every turn i expected to bring me upon my brother and teague and that fighting pack more than once i thought i heard the spang of the thirty-five and this made me urge the roan faster and faster the canyon narrowed the stream bed deepened i had to slow down to get through the trees and rocks and suddenly i was overjoyed to ride pell-mell upon r c and teague with half the panting hounds the canyon had grown too rough for the horses to go farther and it would have been useless for us to try on foot as i dismounted so sore and bruised i could hardly stand old jim came limping in to fall into the brook where he lapped and lapped thirstily teague threw up his hands old jim's return meant an ended chase the grizzly had eluded the hounds in that jumble of rocks below say did you meet the bear queried teague eyeing me in astonishment and mirth bloody dirty ragged and wringing wet with sweat i must have been a sight r c however did not look so very immaculate and when i saw he also was lame and scratched and black i felt better end of chapter two part two chapter three of tales of lonely trails by zane gray this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter three roping lions in the grand canyon part one the grand canyon of arizona is over two hundred miles long thirteen wide and a mile and a half deep a titanic gorge in which mountains tablelands chasms and cliffs lie half veiled in purple haze it is wild and sublime a thing of wonder of mystery beyond all else a place to grip the heart of a man to unleash his daring spirit on april twentieth nineteen o eight after days on the hot desert my weary party and pack train reached the summit of powell's plateau the most isolated inaccessible and remarkable mesa of any size in all the canyon country cut off from the mainland it appeared insurmountable standing aloof from the towers and escarpments rugged and bold in outline its forest covering like a strip of black velvet its giant granite walls gold in the sun it seemed apart from the world haunting with its beauty isolation and wild promise the members of my party harmoniously fitted the scene buffalo jones burly-shouldered bronze-faced and grim proved in his appearance what a lifetime on the plains could make of a man emmett was a mormon a massively built gray-bearded son of the desert he had lived his life on it he had conquered it and in his falcon eyes shone all its fire and freedom ranger jim owens had the wiry supple body and careless tidy garb of the cowboy and the watchful gaze quiet face and locked lips of the frontiersman the fourth member was a navajo indian a copper-skinned raven-haired beady-eyed desert savage i had told emmett to hire someone who could put the horses on grass in the evening and then find them the next morning in northern arizona this required more than genius emmett secured the best trailer of the desert navajos jones hated an indian and jim who carried an ounce of lead somewhere in his person associated this painful addition to his weight with an unfriendly apache and swore all indians should be dead so between the two emmett and i had trouble in keeping our navajo from illustrating the plainsman idea of a really good indian a dead one 
while we were pitching camp among magnificent pine trees and above a hollow where a heavy bank of snow still lay a sodden pounding in the turf attracted our attention hold the horses yelled emmett as we all made a dive among our snorting and plunging horses the sound seemed to be coming right into camp in a moment i saw a string of wild horses thundering by a noble black stallion led them and as he ran with beautiful stride he curved his fine head backward to look at us and whistled his wild challenge later a herd of large white-tailed deer trooped up the hollow the navajo grew much excited and wanted me to shoot and when emmett told him we did not come out to kill he looked dumbfounded even the indian felt it a strange departure from the usual mode of hunting to travel and climb hundreds of miles over hot desert and rock-ribbed canyons to camp at last in a spot so wild that deer were tame as cattle and then not kill nothing could have pleased me better incident to the settling into permanent camp the wild horses and tame deer added the all-satisfying touch to the background of forest flowers and mighty pines and sunlit patches of grass the white tents and red blankets the sleeping hounds and blazing fire logs all making a picture like that of a hunter's dream come saddle up called the never restful jones leave the indian in camp with the hounds and we'll get the lay of the land all afternoon we spent riding the plateau what a wonderful place we were completely bewildered with its physical properties and surprised at the abundance of wild horses and mustangs deer coyotes foxes grouse and other birds and overjoyed to find innumerable lion trails when we returned to camp i drew a rough map which jones laid flat on the ground as he called us around him now boys let's get our heads together in shape the plateau resembled the ace of clubs the center and side wings were high and well wooded with heavy pines the middle wing was longest sloped west had no pine but a dense growth of cedar numerous ridges and canyons cut up this central wing middle canyon the longest and deepest bisected the plateau headed near camp and ran parallel with two smaller ones which we named right and left canyons these three were lion runways and hundreds of deer carcasses lined the thickets north hollow was the only depression as well as runway on the northwest rim west point formed the extreme western cape of the plateau to the left of west point was a deep cut-in of the rim wall called the bay the three important canyons opened into it from the bay the southern rim was regular and impassable all the way round to the narrow saddle which connected it to the mainland now then said jones when we assured him that we were pretty well informed as to the important features you can readily see our advantage the plateau is about nine or ten miles long and six wide at its widest we can't get lost at least for long we know where lions can go over the rim and we'll head them off make short-cut chases something new in lion hunting we are positive the lions cannot get over the second wall except where we came up at the saddle in regard to lion signs i'm doubtful of the evidence of my own eyes this is virgin ground no white man or indian has ever hunted lions here we have stumbled on a lion home the breeding place of hundreds of lions that infest the north rim of the canyon the old plainsman struck a big fist into the palm of his hand a rare action with him jim lifted his broad hat and ran his fingers through his white hair in emmett's clear desert eagle eyes shone a furtive anxious look which yet could not overshadow the smouldering fire if only we don't kill the horses he said more than anything else that remark from such a man thrilled me with its subtle suggestion he loved those beautiful horses what wild rides he saw in his mind's eye in cold calculation we perceived the wonderful possibilities never before experienced by hunters and as the wild spell clutched us my last bar of restraint let down 
During supper we talked incessantly, and afterward around the campfire. Twilight fell with the dark shadows sweeping under the silent pines. The night wind rose and began its moan. "'Sure, there's some scent in the wind,' said Jim, lighting his pipe with a red ember. "'See how uneasy dawn is?' The hound raised his fine, dark head and repeatedly sniffed the air, then walked to and fro as if on guard for his pack. Mose ground his teeth on a bone and growled at one of the pups. Sounder was sleepy, but he watched Don with suspicious eyes. The other hounds, mature and somber, lay stretched before the fire. "'Tie them up, Jim,' said Jones, "'and let's turn in.' End of chapter 3, part 1chapter three tales of lonely trails by zane gray this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter three roping lions in the grand canyon part two when i awakened next morning the sound of emmett's axe rang out sharply little streaks of light from the campfire played between the flaps of the tent i saw old mose get up and stretch himself a jangle of cowbells from the forest told me we would not have to wait for the horses that morning. The engine's all right, Jones remarked to Emmett. All rustle for breakfast, called Jim. We ate in the semi-darkness, with the gray shadow ever brightening. Dawn broke as we saddled our horses. The pups were limber and ran to and fro on their chains, scenting the air. The older hounds stood quietly, waiting. "'Come, Navvy, come chase Coogie,' said Emmett. "'Damn, no,' replied the Indian. "'Let him keep camp,' suggested Jim. "'All right, but he'll eat us out,' Emmett declared. "'Climb up, you fellows,' said Jones impatiently. "'Have I got everything? Rope, chains, collars, wire, nippers? "'Yes, all right. Hire you lazy dogs out of this.' We rode abreast down the ridge. The demeanor of the hounds contrasted sharply with what it had been at the start of the hunt the year before. Then they had been eager, uncertain, violent. They did not know what was in the air. Now they filed after dawn in an orderly trot. We struck out of the pines at half-past five. Floating mist hid the lower end of the plateau. The morning had a cool touch, but there was no frost. Crossing Middle Canyon about halfway down, we jogged on. Cedar trees began to show bright green against the soft gray sage. We were nearing the dark line of the cedar forest when Jim, who led, held up his hand in a warning check. We closed in around him. Watch Don, he said. The hound stood stiff, head well up, nose working, and the hair on his back bristling. All the other hounds whined and kept close to him. "'Don scents a lion,' whispered Jim. "'I've never known him to do that unless there was the scent of a lion on the wind.' "'Hunt him up, Don, old boy,' called Jones. The pack commenced to work back and forth along the ridge. We neared a hollow when Don barked eagerly. Sounder answered and likewise Jude. Moses' short, angry bow-wow showed the old gladiator to be in line." "'Ranger's gone,' cried Jim. "'He was farthest ahead. I'll bet he struck it. We'll know in a minute, for we're close.' The hounds were tearing through the sage, working harder and harder, calling and answering one another, all the time getting down into the hollow. Don suddenly let out a string of yelps. I saw him, running head up, pass into the cedars like a yellow dart." sounder howled his deep full bay and led the rest of the pack up the slope in angry clamor they're off yelled jim and so were we in less than a minute we had lost one another crashings among the dry cedars thud of hoofs and yells kept me going in one direction the fiery burst of the hounds had surprised me I remembered that Jim had said Emmett and his charger might keep the pack in sight, but that none of the rest of us could. It did not take me long to realize what my Mustang was made of. His name was Foxy, which suited him well. He carried me at a fast pace on the trail of someone, and he seemed to know that by keeping in this trail, part of the work of breaking through the brush was already done for him. 
nevertheless the sharp dead branches more numerous in a cedar forest than elsewhere struck and stung us as we passed we climbed a ridge and found the cedars thinning out into open patches then we faced a bare slope of sage and i saw emmett below on his big horse foxy bolted down this slope hurtling the bunches of sage and showing the speed of which emmett had boasted the open ground with its brush rock and gullies was easy going for the little mustang i heard nothing save the wind singing in my ears emmett's trail plain in the yellow ground showed me the way on entering the cedars again i pulled foxy in and stopped twice to yell wahoo i heard the baying of the hounds but no answer to my signal then i attended to the stern business of catching up for what seemed a long time i threaded the maze of cedar galloped the open sage flats always on emmett's track a signal cry sharp to the right turned me i answered and with the exchange of signal cries found my way into an open glade where jones and jim awaited me here's one said jim emmett must be with the hounds listen with the labored breathing of the horses filling our ears we could hear no other sound dismounting i went aside and turned my ear to the breeze i hear dawn i cried instantly which way both men asked west strange said jones the hound wouldn't split would he jim dawn leave that hot trail sure he wouldn't replied jim but his running do seem queer this morning the breeze is freshening i said there now listen dawn and sounder too the baying came closer and closer our horses threw up long ears it was hard to sit still and wait at a quick cry from jim we saw dawn cross the lower end of the flat no need to spur our mounts the lifting of bridles served and away we raced foxy passed the others in short order dawn had long disappeared but with blended bays jude mose and sounder broke out of the cedars hot on the trail they too were out of sight in a moment the crashing of breaking brush and thunder of hoofs from where the hounds had come out of the forest attracted and even frightened me i saw the green of a low cedar tree shake and split to let out a huge gaunt horse with a big man doubled over his saddle the onslaught of emmett and his desert charger stirred a fear in me that checked admiration hounds running wild he yelled and the dark shadows of the cedars claimed him again a hundred yards within the forest we came again upon emmett dismounted searching the ground mose and sounder were with him apparently at fault suddenly mose left the little glade and venting his sullen quick bark disappeared under the trees sounder sat on his haunches and yelped now what the hell is wrong growled jones tumbling off his saddle sure something is said jim also dismounting here's a lion track interposed emmett ah and here's another cried jones in great satisfaction that's the trail we were on and here's another crossing it at right angles both are fresh one isn't fifteen minutes old don and jude have split one way and mows another by george that's great of sounder to hang fire put him on the fresh trail said jim vaulting into his saddle jones complied with the result that we saw sounder start off on the trail mose had taken all of us got in some pretty hard riding and managed to stay within earshot of sounder we crossed a canyon and presently reached another which from its depth must have been middle canyon sounder did not climb the opposite slope so we followed the rim from a bare ridge we distinguished the line of pines above us and decided that our location was in about the center of the plateau very little time elapsed before we heard mose sounder had caught up with him we came to a halt where the canyon widened and was not so deep with cliffs and cedars opposite us and an easy slope leading down sounder bayed incessantly mose emitted harsh eager howls and both hounds in plain sight began working in circles the lion has gone up somewhere cried jim look sharp repeatedly mose worked to the edge of a low wall of stone and looked over then he barked and ran back to the slope only to return 
when i saw him slide down a steep place make for the bottom of the stone wall and jump into the low branches of a cedar i knew where to look then i descried the lion a round yellow ball cunningly curled up in a mass of dark branches he had leaped into the tree from the wall there he is treed treed i yell moses found him down boys down into the canyon shouted jones in sharp voice make a racket we don't want him to jump how he and jim and emmett rolled and cracked the stone for a moment i could not get off my horse i was chained to my saddle by a strange vacillation that could have been no other thing than fear are you afraid called jones from below yes but i am coming i replied and dismounted to plunge down the hill it may have been shame or anger that dominated me then whatever it was i made directly for the cedar and did not halt until i was under the snarling lion not too close warned jones he might jump it's a tom a two-year-old and full of fight it did not matter to me then whether he jumped or not i knew i had to be cured of my dread and the sooner it was done the better old mose had already climbed a third of the distance up to the lion pyre mose out of there you rascal coon chaser jones yelled as he threw stones and sticks at the hound mose however replied with his snarly bark and climbed on steadily i've got to pull him out watch close boys and tell me if the lion starts down when jones climbed the first few branches of the tree tom let out an ominous growl make ready to jump sure he's comin called jim the lion snarling viciously started to descend it was a ticklish moment for all of us particularly jones warily he backed down boys maybe he's bluffing said jones try him out grab sticks and run at the tree and yell as if you were going to kill him not improbably the demonstration we executed under the tree would have frightened even an african lion tom hesitated showed his white fangs returned to his first perch and from there climbed as far as he could the forked branch on which he stood swayed alarmingly here punch mose out said jim handing up a long pole the old hound hung like a leech to the tree making it difficult to dislodge him at length he fell heavily and venting his thick battle cry attempted to climb again jim seized him made him fast to the rope with which sounder had already been tied say emmett i've no chance here called jones you try to throw at him from the rock emmett ran up the rock coiled his lasso and cast the noose it sailed perfectly in between the branches and circled tom's head before it could be slipped tight he had thrown it off and then he hid behind the branches i'm going farther up said jones be quick yelled jim jones evidently had that in mind when he reached the middle fork of the cedar he stood erect and extended the noose of his lasso on the point of his pole tom with a hiss and snap struck at it savagely the second trial tempted the lion to saw the rope with his teeth in a flash jones withdrew the pole and lifted a loop of the slack rope over the lion's ears pull he yelled emmett at the other end of the lasso threw his great strength into action pulling the lion out with a crash and giving the cedar such a tremendous shaking that jones lost his footing and fell heavily thrilling as the moment was i had to laugh for jones came up out of a cloud of dust as angry as a wet hornet and made prodigious leaps to get out of the reach of the whirling lion look out he bawled tom certainly none the worse for his tumble made three leaps two at jones one at jim which was checked by the short length of the rope in emmett's hand then for a moment a thick cloud of dust enveloped the wrestling lion during which the quick-witted jones tied the free end of the lasso to a sapling dot gast the luck yelled jones reaching for another lasso i didn't mean for you to pull him out of the tree now he'll get loose or kill himself when the dust cleared away we discovered our prize stretched out at full length and frothing at the mouth as jones approached the lion began a series of evolutions so rapid as to be almost indiscernible to the eye i saw a wheel of dust and yellow fur then came a thud and the lion lay inert 
Jones pounced upon him and loosed the lasso round his neck. I think he's done for, but maybe not. He's breathing yet. Here, help me tie his paws together. Look out, he's coming too. The lion stirred and raised his head. Jones ran the loop of the second lasso round the two hind paws and stretched the lion out. While in this helpless position and with no strength and hardly any breath left in him, the lion was easy to handle. With Emmett's help, Jones quickly clipped the large claws, tied the four paws together, took off the neck lasso, and substituted a collar and chain. There, that's one. He'll come too, all right, said Jones, but we are lucky. Emmett never pull another lion clear out of a tree, pull him over a limb and hang him there while someone below ropes his hind paws. That's the only way, and if we don't stick to it, somebody is going to get done for. Come now, we'll leave this fellow here and hunt up Don and Jude. They've treat another lion by this time. Remarkable to me was to see how, as soon as the lion lay helpless, Sounder lost his interest. Mose growled, yet readily left the spot. Before we reached the level, both hounds had disappeared. Hear that? yelled Jones, digging spurs into his horse. Ay, 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 ay! From the cedars rang the thrilling, blending chorus of bays that told of a treed lion. The forest was almost impenetrable. We had to pick our way. Emmett forged ahead. We heard him smashing the dead wood, and soon a yell proclaimed the truth of Joan's assertion. First I saw the men looking upward, then Mose climbing the cedar, and the other hounds with noses skyward, and last in the dead top of the tree a dark blot against the blue, a big tawny lion. Whoop! The yell leaped past my lips. Quiet Jim was yelling, and Emmett, silent man of the desert, let from his wide cavernous chest a booming roar that drowned ours. Jones' next decisive action turned us from exultation to the grim business of the thing. He pulled Mose out of the cedar, and while he climbed up, Emmett ran his rope under the collars of all the hounds. Quick as the idea flashed over me, I leaped into the cedar adjoining the one Jones was in, and went up hand over hand. A few pulls brought me to the top, and then my blood ran hot and quick, for I was level with the lion, too close for comfort, but in excellent position for taking pictures. The lion, not heeding me, peered down at Jones between widespread paws. I could hear nothing except the hounds. Joan's gray hat came pushing up between the dead snags, then his burly shoulders. The quivering muscles of the lion gathered tense, and his lithe body crouched low on the branches. He was about to jump. His open, dripping jaws, his wild eyes, roving in terror for some means of escape, his tufted tail swinging against the twigs and breaking them, manifested his extremity. The eager hounds waited below howling, leaping. It bothered me considerably to keep my balance, regulate my camera, and watch the proceedings. Jones climbed on with his rope between his teeth and a long stick. The very next instant, it seemed to me, I heard the cracking of branches and saw the lion biting hard at the noose which circled his neck. Here I swung down, branch to branch, and dropped to the ground, for I wanted to see what went on below. Above the howls and yelps I distinguished Jones' yell. Emmett ran directly under the lion with a spread noose in his hands. Jones pulled and pulled, but the lion held on firmly. Throwing the end of the lasso down to Jim, Jones yelled again, and then they both pulled. The lion was too strong. Suddenly, however, the branch broke, letting the lion fall, kicking frantically with all four paws. Emma grasped one of the four whipping paws, and even as the powerful animal sent him staggering, he dexterously left the noose fast on the paw. Jim and Jones, in unison, let go of their lasso, which streaked up through the branches as the lion fell, and then it dropped to the ground, where Jim made a flying grab for it. Jones, plunging out of the tree, fell upon the rope at the same instant. 
if the action up to then had been fast it was slow to what followed it seemed impossible for two strong men with one lasso and a giant with another to straighten out that lion he was all over the little space under the trees at once the dust flew the stick snapped the gravel pattered like shot against the cedars jones ploughed the ground flat on his stomach holding on with one hand with the other trying to fasten the rope to something jim went to his knees and on the other side of the lion emmett's huge bulk tipped a sharp angle and then fell i shouted and ran forward having no idea what to do but emmett rolled backward and the same instant the other men got a strong haul on the lion short as that moment was in which the lasso slackened it sufficed for jones to make the rope fast to a tree whereupon with the three men pulling on the other side of the leaping lion somehow i had flashed into my mind the game that children play called skipping the rope for the lion and lasso shot up and down this lasted for only a few seconds they stretched the beast from tree to tree and jones running with the third lasso made fast the front paws it's a female said jones as the lion lay helpless her side swelling a good-sized female she's nearly eight feet from tip to tip but not very heavy hand me another rope when all four lassos had been stretched the lioness could not move jones strapped a collar round her neck and clipped the sharp yellow claws now to muzzle her he continued jones method of performing this most hazardous part of the work was characteristic of him he thrust a stick between her open jaws and when she crushed it to splinters he tried another and yet another until he found one that she could not break then while she bit on it he placed a wire loop over her nose slowly tightening it leaving the stick back of her big canines the hounds ceased their yelping and when untied sounder wagged his tail as if to say well done and then lay down don walked within three feet of the lion as if she were now beneath his dignity jude began to nurse and lick her sore paw only mose the incorrigible retained antipathy for the captive and he growled as always low and deep and on the moment ranger dusty and lame from travel trotted wearily into the glade and looking at the lioness gave one disgusted bark and flopped down end of chapter three part two chapter three tales of lonely trails by zane gray this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter three roping lions in the grand canyon part three transporting our captives to camp bade fair to make us work when jones who had gone after the pack horses hove in sight on the sage flat it was plain to us that we were in for trouble the bay stallion was on the rampage why didn't you fetch the indian growled emmett who lost his temper when matters concerning his horses went wrong spread out boys and head him off we contrived to surround the stallion and emmett succeeded in getting a halter on him i didn't want the bay explained jones but i couldn't drive the others without him when i told that redskin that we had two lions he ran off into the woods so i had to come alone i'm going to scalp the navajo said jim complacently these remarks were exchanged on the open ridge at the entrance to the thick cedar forest the two lions lay just within its shady precincts emmett and i using a long pole in lieu of a horse had carried tom up from the canyon to where we had captured the lioness jones had brought a pack saddle and two panniers when emmett essayed to lead the horse which carried these the animal stood straight up and began to show some of his primal desert instincts it certainly was good luck that we unbuckled the pack saddle straps before he left the vicinity in about three jumps he had separated himself from the panniers which were then placed upon the back of another horse this one a fine-looking beast and amiable under surroundings where his life and health were considered even a little immediately disclaimed any intention of entering the forest they sent the lions said jones 
I was afraid of it. Never had but one nag that could pack lions. Maybe we can't pack them at all, replied Emmett dubiously. It's certainly new to me. We've got to, Jones asserted. Try the sorrel. For the first time in a serviceable and honorable life, according to Emmett, the sorrel broke his halter and kicked like a plantation mule. It's a matter of fright. Try the stallion. He doesn't look afraid, said Jones, who never knew when he was beaten. Emmett gazed at Jones as if he had not heard right. Go ahead, try the stallion. I like the way he looks. No wonder the big stallion looked a king of horses, just what he would have been if Emmett had not taken him when a colt from his wild desert brothers. He scented the lions, and he held his proud head up, his ears erect, and his large dark eyes shone fiery and expressive. I'll try to lead him in and let him see the lions. We can't fool him, said Emmett. Mark showed no hesitation nor anything we expected. He stood stiff-legged and looked as if he wanted to fight. He's all right. He'll pack them, declared Jones. The pack saddle being strapped on and the panniers hooked to the horns, Jones and Jim lifted Tom and shoved him down into the left pannier while Emmett held the horse. A madder lion than Tom never lived. It was cruel enough to be lassoed and disgrace enough to be hogtied, as Jim called it, but to be thrust down into a bag and packed on a horse was adding insult to injury. Tom frothed at the mouth and seemed like a fizzing torpedo about to explode. The lioness, being considerably longer and larger, was with difficulty gotten into the other pannier, and her head and paws hung out. Both lions kept growling and snarling. "'I look to see Mark bolt over the rim,' said Emmett, resignedly, as Jones took up the end of the rope halter. "'No siree,' rang out that worthy. "'He's helping us out. He's proud to show up the other nags.' Jones was always asserting strange traits in animals and giving them intelligence and reason. As to that, many incidents coming under my observation while with him and seen with his eyes made me inclined to his claims, the fruit of a lifetime with animals. Mark packed the lions to camp in short order and quoting Jones without turning a hair. We saw the Navajo's head protruding from a tree. Emmett yelled for him, and Jones and Jim ha ha derisively, whereupon the black head vanished and did not reappear. Then they unhooked one of the panniers and dumped out the lioness. Jones fastened her chain to a small pine tree, and as she lay powerless, he pulled out the stick back of her canines. This allowed the wire muzzle to fall off. She signaled this freedom with a roar that showed her health to be still unimpaired. The last action in releasing her from her painful bonds, Jones performed with slate-of-hand dexterity. He slipped the loop, fastening one paw, which loosened the rope, and in a twinkling let her work all of her other paws free. Up she sprang, ears flat, eyes ablaze, mouth wide, once more capable of defense, true to her instinct and her name. Before the men lowered Tom from Mark's back, I stepped closer and put my face within six inches of the lion's. He promptly spat at me. I had to steal my nerve to keep so close, but I wanted to see a wild lion's eyes at close range. They were exquisitely beautiful, their physical properties as wonderful as their expression great half-globes of tawny amber streaked with delicate wavy lines of black surrounding pupils of intense purple fire pictures shone and faded in the amber light the shaggy tipped plateau the dark pines and smoky canyons the great dotted downward slopes the yellow cliffs and crags deep in those live pupils changing quickening with a thousand vibrations, quivered the soul of this savage beast, the wildest of all wild nature, unquenchable love of life and freedom, flame of defiance and hate. Jones disposed of Tom in the same manner as he had the lioness, chaining him to an adjoining small pine, where he leaped and wrestled. Presently I saw Emmett coming through the woods, leading and dragging the Indian. I felt sorry for the navvy, for I felt that his fear was not so much physical as spiritual. 
and it seemed no wonder to me that the navvy should hang back from this sacrilegious treatment of his god a natural wisdom which i had in common with all human beings who consider self-preservation the first law of life deterred me from acquainting my august companions with my belief at least i did not want to break up the camp in the remorseless grasp of emmett forced along the navajo dragged his feet and held his face sidewise though his dark eyes gleamed at the lions terror predominated among the expressions of his countenance emmett drew him within fifteen feet and held him there and with voice and gesticulating of his free hand tried to show the poor fellow that the lions would not hurt him navvy stared and muttered to himself here jim had some devilry in mind for he edged up closer but what it was never transpired for emmett suddenly pointed to the horses and said to the indian chiniago feed it appeared when navvy swung himself over mark's broad back that our great stallion had laid aside his transiently noble disposition and was himself again mark proceeded to show us how truly jim had spoken sure he ain't no use for the redskin before the indian had fairly gotten astride mark dropped his head humped his shoulders brought his feet together and began to buck now the navajo was a famous breaker of wild mustangs but mark was a tougher proposition than the wildest mustang that ever romped the desert not only was he unusually vigorous he was robust and heavy yet exceedingly active i had seen him roll over in the dust three times each way and do it easily a feat emmett declared he had never seen performed by another horse navvy began to bounce he showed his teeth and twisted his sinewy hands in the horse's mane. Mark began to act like a demon. He plowed the ground. Apparently he bucked five feet straight up. As the Indian had bounced, he now began to shoot into the air. He rose the last time with his heels over his head to the full extent of his arms, and on plunging down, his hold broke. He spun around the horse, then went hurtling to the ground some twenty feet away. He sat up, and seeing Emmett and Jones laughing, and Jim prostrated with joy, he showed his white teeth in a smile and said, No bueno damn. I think all of us respected Navvy for his good humor, and especially when he walked up to Mark and with no show of the mean Indian patted the glossy neck and then nimbly remounted mark not being so difficult to please as jim in the way of discomfiting the navajo appeared satisfied for the present and trotted off down the hollow with the string of horses ahead their bells jingling campfire tasks were a necessary wage in order to earn the full enjoyment and benefit of the hunting trip and looking for some task with which to turn my hand i helped jim feed the hounds to feed ordinary dogs is a matter of throwing them a bone however our dogs were not ordinary it took time to feed them and a prodigious amount of meat we had packed between three and four hundred pounds of wild horse meat which had been cut into small pieces and strung on the branches of a scrub oak near camp don as befitted a gentleman and the leader of the greatest pack in the west had to be fed by hand I believe he would rather had starved than have demeaned himself by fighting. Starved he certainly would have if Jim had thrown meat indiscriminately to the ground. Sounder asserted his rights and preferred large portions at a time. Jude begged with great solemn eyes, but was no slouch at eating for all her gentleness. Ranger, because of imperfectly developed teeth, rendering mastication difficult, had to have his share cut into very small pieces. As for Mose, well, great dogs have their faults as do great men. He never got enough meat. He would fight even poor crippled Jude and steal even from the pups. When he had gotten all Jim would give him and all he could snatch, he would growl away with bulging sides. How about feeding the lions? asked Emmett. They'll drink tonight, replied Jones, but won't eat for days. Then we'll tempt them with fresh rabbits. We made a hearty meal, succeeding which Jones and I walked through the woods toward the rim.
a yellow promontory huge and glistening invited us westward and after a detour of half a mile we reached it the points of the rim striking out into the immense void always drew me irresistibly we found the view from this rock one of startling splendor the corrugated rim wall of the middle wing extended to the west at this moment apparently running into the setting sun the gold glare touching up the millions of facets of chiseled stone created color and brilliance too glorious and intense for the gaze of men and looking downward was like looking into the placid blue bottomless depths of the pacific here help me push off this stone i said to jones we heaved a huge round stone and were encouraged to feel it move fortunately we had a little slope the boulder groaned rocked and began to slide just as it toppled over i glanced at the second hand of my watch then with eyes over the rim we waited the silence was the silence of the canyon dead and vast intensified by our breathless ear strain ten long palpitating seconds and no sound i gave up the distance was too great for sound to reach us fifteen seconds seventeen eighteen with that a puff of air seemed to rise and on it the most awful bellow of thunderous roar it rolled up and widened deadened to burst out and roll louder then slowly like mountains on wheels rumbled under the rim walls passing on and on to roar back in echo from the cliffs of the mesas roar and rumble roar and rumble for two long moments the dull and hollow echoes rolled at us to die away slowly in the far distant canyons that's a darned deep hole commented jones twilight stole down on us idling there silent content to watch the red glow pass away from the buttes and peaks the color deepening downward to meet the ebon shades of night creeping up like a dark tide on turning toward the camp we essayed a short cut which brought us to a deep hollow with stony walls which seemed better to go around the hollow however was quite long and we decided presently to cross it we descended a little way when jones suddenly barred my progress with his big arm listen he whispered it was quiet in the woods only a faint breeze stirred the pine needles and the weird gray darkness seemed to be approaching under the trees i heard the patter of light hard hoofs on the scaly sides of the hollow dear i asked my companion in a low voice yes see he replied pointing ahead just right under that broken wall of rock right there on this side they're going down i descried gray objects the color of the rocks moving down like shadows have they scented us hardly the breeze is against us maybe they heard us break a twig they've stopped but they're not looking our way now i wonder rattling of stones set into movement by some quick sharp action an indistinct crash but sudden as of the impact of soft heavy bodies a strange wild sound preceded in rapid succession violent brushings and thumpings in the scrub of the hollow lion jumped a deer yelled jones right under our eyes come on ay 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 he ran down the incline yelling all the way and i kept close to him adding my yells to his and gripping my revolver toward the bottom the thicket barred our progress so that we had to smash through and i came out a little ahead of jones and farther up the hollow i saw a gray swiftly bounding object too long and too low for a deer and i hurriedly shot six times at it by george come here called my companion how's this for quick work it's a yearling doe in another moment i leaned over a gray mass huddled at jones's feet it was a deer gasping and choking i plainly heard the wheeze of blood in its throat and the sound like a death rattle affected me powerfully bending closer i saw where one side of the neck low down had been terribly lacerated wah hoo pealed down the slope that's emmett cried jones answering the signal if you have another shot put this doe out of agony but i had not a shot left nor did either of us have a clasp knife 
We stood there while the dough gasped and quivered. The peculiar sound, probably made by the intake of air through the laceration of the throat, on the spur of the moment, seemed pitifully human. I felt that the struggle for life and death in any living thing was a horrible spectacle. With great interest I had studied natural selection, the variability of animals under different conditions of struggling existence, the law whereby one animal struck down and devoured another. But I had never seen and heard that law enacted on such a scale, and suddenly I abhorred it. Emmett strode to us through the gathering darkness. What's up? he asked quickly. He carried my Remington in one hand and his Winchester in the other, and he moved so assuredly and loomed up so big in the dusk that I experienced a sudden little rush of feeling as to what his advent might mean at a time of real peril. Emmett, I've lived to see many things, replied Jones, but this is the first time I ever saw a lion jump a deer right under my nose. As Emmett bent over to seize the long ears of the deer, I noticed the gasping had ceased. Neck broken, he said, lifting the head. Well, I'm danged. Must have been an all-fired strong lion. He'll come back, you may be sure of that. Let's skin out the quarters and hang the carcass up in a tree. We returned to camp in a half an hour, the richer for our walk by a quantity of fresh venison. Upon being acquainted with our adventure, Jim expressed himself rather more fairly than was his customary way. "'Sure, that beats hell. I knowed there was a lion somewheres, cause Don wouldn't lie down. I'd like to get a pop at the brute.' I believed Jim's wish found an echo in all our hearts. At any rate, to hear Emmett and Jones express regret over the death of the doe justified in some degree my own feelings, and I thought it was not so much the death, but the lingering and terrible manner of it, and especially how vividly it connoted the wild-life drama of the plateau. The tragedy we had all but interrupted occurred every night, perhaps often in the day and likely at different points at the same time. Emmett told how he had found fourteen piles of bleached bones and dried hair in the thickets of less than a mile of the hollow on which we were encamped. We'll rope the danged cats, boys, or we'll kill em. It's blowin' cold. Hey, Navi, Coco, Coco, called Emmett. The Indian, carefully laying aside his cigarette, kicked up the fire and threw on more wood discuss cold he said to me coco bueno fire good i replied me savvy yes sleepy he asked mucha i returned while we carried on a sort of novel conversation full of navajo english and gestures darkness settled down black i saw the stars disappear the wind changing to the north grew colder and carried a breath of snow I like North Wind best, from under the warm blankets, because of the roar and lull and lull and roar in the pines. Crawling into the bed presently, I lay there and listened to the rising storm wind for a long time. Sometimes it swelled and crashed like the sound of a breaker on the beach, but mostly from a low incessant moan, it rose and filled to a mighty rush, then suddenly lulled. This lull, despite a wakeful, thronged mind, was conducive to sleep. End of chapter 3, part 3「『Three Tales of Lonely Trails』by Zane Gray. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 3. Roping Lions in the Grand Canyon. Part 4. To be awake from pleasant dreams is the lot of man. The Navajo aroused me with his singing, and when I peeped languidly from under the flap of my sleeping bag, I felt a cold air and saw fleecy flakes of white drifting through the small window of my tent. "'Snow! By all that's lucky!' I exclaimed, remembering Jones's hopes. Straightway my languor vanished, and getting into my boots and coat I went outside. Navvy's bed lay in six inches of snow. The forest was beautifully white. A fine dazzling snow was falling. I walked to the roaring campfire. 
Jim's biscuits, well browned and of generous size, had just been dumped into the middle of our breakfast cloth, a tarpaulin spread on the ground. The coffee pot steamed fragrantly, and a Dutch oven sizzled with a great number of slices of venison. "'Did you hear the Indian chanting?' asked Jones, who sat with his horny hands to the blaze. "'I heard his singing. No, it wasn't a song. The Navajo never sings in the morning. What you heard was his morning prayer, a chant, a religious and solemn ritual to the break of day. Emmett says it is a custom of the desert tribe. You remember how we saw the Mokis sitting on the roofs of their little adobe huts in the gray of the morning? They always greet the sun in that way the navajos chant it certainly was worth remembering i thought and mentally observed that i would wake up thereafter and listen to the indian good luck and bad went on jones snow is what we want but now we can't find the scent of our lion of last night low growls and snarls attracted me both our captives presented sorry spectacles they were wet dirty bedraggled Emmett had chopped down a small pine, the branches of which he was using to make shelter for the lions. While I looked on, Tom tore his pieces several times, but the lioness crawled under hers and began licking her chops. At length Tom, seeing that Emmett meant no underhand trick, backed out of the drizzling snow and lay down. Emmett had already constructed a shack for the hounds. It was a way of his to think of everything he had the most extraordinary ability a stroke of his axe a twist of his great hands a turn of this or that made camp a more comfortable place and if something no matter what got out of order or broken there was emmett to show what it was to be a man of the desert it had been my good fortune to see many able men on the trail and round the campfire, but not one of them even approached emmett's class when i said a word to him about his knack with things his reply was illuminating i'm fifty-eight and four out of every five nights of my life i have slept away from home on the ground chiniego called jim who had begun with all of us to assimilate a little of the navajo's language whereupon we fell to eating with appetite unknown to any save hunters somehow the indian had gravitated to me at meal times and now he sat cross-legged beside me holding out his plate and looking as hungry as mose at first he had always asked for the same kind of food that i happened to have on my own plate when i had finished and had no desire to eat more he gave up his faculty of imitation and asked for anything he could get the navajo had a marvelous appetite he liked sweet things sugar best of all it was a fatal error to let him get his hands on a can of fruit although he inspired jones with disgust and jim with worse he was a source of unfailing pleasure to me he called me mr gay and he pronounced the words haltingly in low voice and with unmistakable respect what's on for today queried emmett i guess we may as well hang around camp and rest the hounds replied jones i did intend to go after the lion that killed the deer but this snow has taken away the scent sure it'll stop snowin soon said jim the falling snow had thinned out and looked like flying powder the leaden clouds rolling close to the tree-tops grew brighter and brighter bits of azure sky shone through rifts navvy had tramped off to find the horses and not long after his departure he sent out a prolonged yell that echoed through the forest something's up said emma instantly an indian never yells like that at a horse we waited quietly for a moment expecting to hear the yell repeated it was not though we soon heard the jangle of bells which told us he had the horse coming he appeared off to the right riding foxy and racing the others toward camp Kogi, much big damn he said leaping off the mustang to confront us emmett does he mean he saw a cougar or a track questioned jones me savvy replied the indian boutine boutine he says trail trail put in emmett i guess i better go and see i'll go with you said jones jim keep the hounds tight and hurry with the horse's oats we followed the tracks of the horses which led southwest toward the rim and a quarter of a mile from camp we crossed a lion trail running at right angles with our direction old oh, sultan i cried breathlessly recognizing that the tracks had been made by a giant lion we had named sultan they were huge round and deep and with my spread hand i could not reach across one of them 
Without a word, Jones strode off on the trail. It headed east and after a short distance turned toward camp. I suppose Jones knew what the lion had been about, but to Emmett and me it was mystifying. Two hundred yards from camp we came to a fallen pine, the body of which was easily six feet high. On the side of this log, almost on top, were two enormous lion tracks, imprinted in the mantle of snow. From here the trail led off northeast. "'Darn me!' ejaculated Jones. "'The big critter came right into camp. He scented our lions and raced up on this log to look over.' Wheeling, he started for camp on the trot. Emmett and I kept even with him. Words were superfluous. We knew what was coming. A made-to-order lion trail could not have equaled the one right in the backyard of our camp. "'Saddle up,' said Jones, with the sharp inflection of words that had come to thrill me. "'Jim, old Sultan has taken a look at us since the break of day.' I got into my chaps, rammed my little automatic into its saddle holster, and mounted. Foxy seemed to want to go. The hounds came out of their sheds and yawned, looking at us knowingly. Emmett spoke a word to the Navajo, and then we were trotting down through the forest. The sun had broken out warm, causing water to drip off the snow-laden pines. The three of us rode close behind Jones, who spoke low and sternly to the hounds. What an opportunity to watch Don! I wondered how soon he would catch the scent of the trail. He led the pack as usual and kept to a leisurely dog-trot. When within twenty yards of the fallen log, he stopped for an instant and held up his head, though without exhibiting any suspicion or uneasiness. The wind blew strong at our backs, a circumstance that probably kept Don so long in ignorance of the trail. A few yards further on, however, he stopped and raised his fine head. He lowered it and trotted on, only to stop again. His easy air of satisfaction with the morning suddenly vanished. His savage hunting instinct awakened through some channel to raise the short yellow hair on his back and shoulders and make it stand stiff. He stood undecided with warily shifting nose, then jumped forward with a yelp. Another jump brought another sharp cry from him. Sounder, close behind, echoed the yelp. Jude began to whine. Then Don, with a wild howl, leaped ten feet to alight on the lion trail and to break into wonderfully rapid flight. The seven other hounds, bunched in a black and yellow group, tore after him, filling the forest with their wild uproar. Emmett's horse bounded as I have seen a great racer leave the post, and his desert brothers, loving wild bursts of speed, needing no spur, kept their noses even with his flanks. The soft snow, not too deep, rather facilitated than impeded this wild movement, and the open forest was like a highway. So we rode, bending low in the saddle, keen eyes alert for branches, vaulting the white blanketed logs, and swerving as we split to pass the pines. The mist from the melting snow moistened our faces, and the rushing air cooled them with fresh, soft sensation. There were moments when we rode abreast, and others when we sailed single file with white ground receding, vanishing behind us. My feeling was one of glorious excitation in the swift, smooth flight and a grim assurance of soon seeing the old lion. But I hoped we would not rout him too soon from under a windfall or a thicket where he had dragged a deer, because the race was too splendid a thing to cut short. Through my mind whirled with inconceivable rapidity the great lion chases on which we had ridden the year before and this was another chase only more stirring more beautiful because it was the nature of the thing to grow always with experience don slipped out of sight among the pines the others strung along the trail glinted across the sunlit patches the black pup was neck and neck with ranger sounder ran at their heels leading the other pups mose dashed on doggedly ahead of jude but for us to keep to the open forest close to the hounds was not in the nature of a lion chase old sultan's trail turned due west when he began to go down the little hollows and their intervening ridges we lost ground 
The pack left us behind. The slope of the plateau became decided. We rode out of the pines to find the snow falling in the open. Water ran in little gullies and glistened on the sagebrush. A half mile further down, the snow had gone. We came upon the hounds running at fault, except Sounder, and he had given up all over sang out jones turning his horse the lion's track and his scent have gone with the snow i reckon we'll do as well to wait until to-morrow he's down in the middle wing somewhere and it is my idea we might catch his trail as he comes back the sudden dashing aside of our hopes was exasperating there seemed no help for it abrupt ending to exciting chases were but features of the lion hunt the warm sun had been hours on the lower end of the plateau where the snow never lay long and even if we found a fresh morning trail in the sand the heat would have burned out the scent so rapidly did the snow thaw that by the time we reached camp only the shady patches were left it was almost eleven o'clock when i lay down on my bed to rest a while and fell asleep the tramp of a horse awakened me i heard jim calling jones thinking it was time to eat i went out the snow had all disappeared and the forest was brown as ever jim sat on his horse and navvy appeared riding up the hollow leading the saddle horses jones get out called jim can't you let a fella sleep i'm not hungry replied jones testily get out and saddle up continued jim jones burst out of his tent with rumpled hair and sleepy eyes i went over to see the carcass of the deer and found a lion sitting up on the tree feeding for all he was worth pie jumped out and ran up the hollow and over the rim so i rustled back for you fellows lively now we'll get this one sure was it the big fellow i asked no but he ain't no kitten and he's a fine color sort of reddish i never seen one just as bright where's emmett i don't know he was here a little while ago shall i signal for him don't yell cried jones holding up his fingers be quiet now without another word we finished saddling mounted and close together with the hounds in front rode through the forest toward the rim end of chapter three part four Chapter Three: Tales of Lonely Trails by Zane Grey. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Three: Roping Lions in the Grand Canyon, Part Five. We rode in different directions toward the hollow, the better to chance meet with Emmett, but none of us caught a glimpse of him. It happened that when we headed into the hollow, it was at a point just above where the deer carcass hung in the scrub oak don in spite of jones stern yells let out his eager hunting yelp and darted down the slope the pack bolted after him and in less than ten seconds were racing up the hollow their thrilling blending bays a welcome spur to action though i spoke not a word to my mustang nor had time to raise the bridle he wheeled to one side and began to run the other horses also kept to the ridge as i could tell by the pounding of hoofs on the soft turf the hounds in full cry right under us urged our good steeds to a terrific pace it was well that the ridge afforded clear going the speed at which we travelled however fast as it was availed not to keep up with the pack in a short half mile just as the hollow sloped and merged into level ground they left us behind and disappeared so quickly as almost to frighten me my mustang plunged out of the forest to the rim and dashed along apparently unmindful of the chasm the red and yellow surface blurred in a blinding glare i heard the chorus of hounds but as its direction baffled me i trusted to my horse and i did well for soon he came to a dead halt on the rim then i heard the hounds below me i had but time to see the character of the place long yellow promontories running out and slopes of weathered stone reaching up between to a level with the rim when in a dwarf pine growing just over the edge i caught sight of a long red pantherish body i whooped to my followers now close upon me and leaping off hauled out my remington and ran to the cliff the lion's long slender body of a rare golden red color bright clean black tipped and white bellied proclaimed it a female of exceeding beauty i could have touched her with a fishing rod and saw how easily she could be roped from where i stood 
the tree in which she had taken refuge grew from the head of a weathered slope and rose close to the wall at that point it was merely a parapet of crumbling yellow rock no doubt she had lain concealed under the shelving wall and had not had time to get away before the hounds were right upon her she's going to jump yelled jones in my rear as he dismounted i saw a golden red streak flash downward heard a mad medley from the hounds a cloud of dust rose then something bright shone for a second to the right along the wall i ran with all my might to a headland of rock upon which i scrambled and saw with joy that i could command the situation the lioness was not in sight nor were the hounds the latter however were hot on the trail i knew the lioness had taken to another tree or a hole under the wall and would soon be routed out this time i felt sure she would run down and i took a rapid glance below the slope inclined at a steep angle and was one long slide of bits of yellow stone with many bunches of scrub oak and manzanita those latter i saw with satisfaction because in case i had to go down they would stop the little avalanches the slope reached down perhaps five hundred yards and ended in a thicket and jumble of rocks from which rose on the right a bare yellow slide this ran up to a low cliff i hoped the lion would not go that way for it led to great broken battlements of rim left of the slide was a patch of cedars jim's yell pealed out followed by the familiar penetrating howl of the pack when it sighted game with that i saw the lioness leaping down the slope and close behind her a yellow hound go it don old boy i yelled wild with delight a crushing step on the stones told me jones had arrived ay 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 roared he i thought then that if the lioness did not cover thirty feet at every jump i was not in a condition to judge distance she ran away from don as if he had been tied and reached the thicket below a hundred yards ahead of him and when don leaving his brave pack far up the slide entered the thicket the lioness came out on the other side and bounded up the bare slope of yellow shale shoot ahead of her head her off turn her back cried jones with the word i threw forward the remington and let drive following the bellow of the rifle so loud in that thin air a sharp harsh report cracked up from below a puff of yellow dust rose in front of the lioness i was in line but too far ahead i fired again the steel jacketed bullet hit a stone and spitefully whined away into the canyon i tried once more this time i struck close to the lioness disconcerted by a cloud of dust rising before her very eyes she wheeled and ran back we had forgotten don and suddenly he darted out of the thicket straight up the slide always in every chase we were afraid the great hound would run to meet his death we knew it was coming some time when the lioness saw him and stopped both jones and i felt that this was to be the end of don shoot her shoot her cried jones she'll kill him she'll kill him as i knelt on the rock i had a hard contraction of my throat and then all my muscles set tight and rigid i pulled the trigger of my automatic once twice it was wonderful how closely the two bullets followed each other as we could tell by the almost simultaneous puffs of dust rising from under the beast's nose she must have been showered and stung with gravel for she bounded off to the left and disappeared in the cedars i had missed but the shots had served a better end than if i had killed her as don raced up the ground where a moment before a battle and probably death had awaited him the other hounds burst from the thicket with that a golden form seemed to stand out from the green of the cedar to move and to rise she's treed she's treed shouted jones go down and keep her there while i follow from the back of the promontory where i met the main wall i let myself down a niche foot here and there a hand hard on the soft stone braced knee and back until i jumped to the edge of the slope the scrub oak and manzanita saved me many a fall i set some stones rolling and i beat them to the bottom having passed the thicket i bent my efforts to the yellow slide and when i had surmounted it my breath came in labored pants the howling of the hounds guided me through the cedars first i saw mose in the branches of cedar and above him the lioness i ran out into a little open patch of stony ground at the end of which the tree stood leaning over a precipice in truth the lioness was swaying over a chasm 
those details i grasped in a glance then suddenly awoke to the fact that the lioness was savagely snarling at mose 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 get down i yelled he climbed on serenely he was a most exasperating dog I screamed at him and hit him with a rock big enough to break his bones. He kept on climbing. Here was a predicament. Mose would surely get to the lioness if I did not stop him, and this seemed impossible. It was out of the question for me to climb after him, and if the lioness jumped she would have to pass me or come straight at me. So I slipped down the safety catch on my automatic and stood ready to save Mose or myself. The lioness, with a show of fury that startled me, descended her branch a few steps, and reaching below gave Mose a resounding smack with her big paw. The hound dropped as if he had been shot and hit the ground with a thud, whereupon she returned to her perch. This reassured me, and I ran among the dogs and caught Mose, already starting for the tree again, and tied him with a strap I always carried to a small bush nearby. I heard the yells of my companions, and looking back over the tops of the cedars, I saw Jim riding down, and higher to the left, Joan sliding, falling, running at a great rate. I encouraged them to keep up the good work, and then gave my attention to the lioness. She regarded me with a cold, savage stare, and showed her teeth. I repaid this incivility on her part by promptly photographing her from different points. Jones and Jim were on the spot before I expected them, and both were dusty and dripping with sweat. I found to my surprise that my face was wet, as was also my shirt. Jones carried two lassos and my canteen, which I had left on the promontory. "'Ain't she a beauty?' he panted, wiping his face. "'Wait till I get my breath.' When finally he walked toward the cedar, the lioness stood up and growled as if she realized the entrance of the chief actor upon the scene. Jones cast his lasso apparently to try her out, and the noose spread out and fell over her head. As he tightened the rope, the lioness backed down behind a branch. "'Tie the dogs!' yelled Jones. "'Quick, at it, Jim. She's going to jump!' Jim had only time to aid me in running my lasso under the collar of Don, Sounder, Jude, and one of the pups. I made them fast to a cedar. I got my hands on Ranger just as Mose broke his strap. I grabbed his collar and held on. Right there was where trouble commenced for me. Ranger tussled valiantly, and Mose pulled me all over the place. Behind me I heard Jones roar and Jim's yell, the breaking of branches, the howling of the other dogs ranger broke away from me and so enabled me to get my other hand on the neck of crazy mose on more than one occasion i had tried to hold him and had failed this time i swore i would do it if he rolled me over the precipice as to that only a bush saved me more and louder roars and yells hoarser howls and sharper wrestling snapping sounds told me what was going on while i tried to subdue mose I had a grim thought that I would just as lief have had hold of the lioness. The hound presently stopped his plunging, which gave me an opportunity to look around. The little space was smoky with a smoke of dust. I saw the lioness stretched out with one lasso around a bush and another around a cedar with the end in the hands of Jim. He looked as if he had dug up the ground. While he tied this lasso securely, Jones proceeded to rope the dangerous front paws. The hounds quieted down, and I took advantage of this absence of tumult to get rid of Mose. "'Pretty lively,' said Jones, spitting gravel as I walked up. Sand and dust lay thick in his beard and blackened his face. "'I tell you, she made us root.' Either the lioness had been much weakened or choked, or Jones had unusual luck, for we muzzled her and tied up her paws in short order. "'Where's Ranger?' I asked suddenly, missing him from the panting hounds. "'I grabbed him by the heels when he tackled the lion, and I gave him a sling somewheres,' replied Jim. Ranger put in an appearance then under the cedars, limping painfully. "'Jim, darn me if I don't believe you pitched him over the precipice,' said Jones. Examination proved this surmise to be correct. We saw where Ranger had slipped over a twenty-foot wall. If he had gone over just under the cedar where the depth was much greater, he would never have come back. The hounds are choking with dust and heat, I said. When I poured just a little water from my canteen into the crown of my hat, the hounds began fighting around and over me and spilled the water. 
behave you coyotes i yelled either they were insulted or fully realized the exigency of the situation for each one came up and gratefully lapped every drop of his portion sure now comes the hell of it said jim appearing with a long pole packin' the critter out an argument arose in regard to the best way up the slope and by virtue of a majority we decided to try the direction jim and i thought best my companions led the way carrying the lioness suspended on the pole i brought up the rear packing my rifle camera lasso canteen and a chain it was killing work we had to rest every few steps often we would fall jim laughed jones swore and i groaned sometimes i had to drop my things to help my companions so we toiled wearily up the loose steep way what's she shaking like that for asked jim suddenly jones let down his end of the pole and turned quickly little tremors quivered over the lissom body of the lioness she's dying cried jim jerking out the stick between her teeth and slipping off the wire muzzle her mouth opened and her frothy tongue lolled out jones pointed to her quivering sides and then raised her eyelids we saw the eyes already glazing solemnly fixed she's gone he said very soon she lay inert and lifeless then we sat beside her without a word and we could hardly for the moment have been more stunned and heartbroken if it had been the tragic death of one of our kind in that wild environment obsessed by the desire to capture those beautiful cats alive the fateful ending of the successful chase was felt out of all proportion sure she's dead said jim and wasn't she a beauty what was wrong the heat and lack of water replied jones she choked what idiots we were why didn't we think to give her a drink so we passionately protested against our want of forethought and looked again and again with the hope that she might come to but death had stilled the wild heart we gave up presently still did not move on we were exhausted and all the while the hounds lay panting on the rocks the bees hummed the flies buzzed the red colors of the upper walls and the purple shades of the lower darkened silently end of chapter three part five chapter three tales of lonely trails by zane gray this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter three roping lions in the grand canyon part six sure we can't set here all night said jim let's skin the lion and feed the hounds the most astonishing thing in our eventful day was the amount of meat stowed away by the dogs lion flesh appealed to their appetites if hungry mose had an ounce of meat he had ten pounds it seemed a good opportunity to see how much the old gladiator could eat and jim and i cut chunks of meat as fast as possible mose gulped them with absolute unconcern of such a thing as mastication at length he reached his limit possibly for the first time in his life and looked longingly at a juicy red strip jim held out he refused it with manifest shame then he wobbled and fell down we called to him as we started to climb the slope but he did not come then the business of conquering that ascent of sliding stone absorbed all our faculties and strength little headway could we have made had it not been for the brush we toiled up a few feet only to slide back and so it went on until we were weary of life when one by one we at last gained the rim and sat there to recover breath the sun was a half globe of fire burning over the western ramparts a red sunset bathed the canyon in crimson painting the walls tinting the shadows to resemble dropping mists of blood it was beautiful and enthralling to my eyes but i turned away because it wore the mantle of tragedy dispirited and worn out we trooped into camp to find emmett and a steaming supper between bites the three of us related the story of the red lioness emmett whistled long and low and then expressed his regret in no light terms roping wild steers and mustangs is play to this work he said in conclusion i was too tired to tease our captive lions that evening even the glowing campfire tempted me in vain and i crawled into my bed with eyes already glued shut a heavy weight on my feet stirred me from oblivion 
At first, when only half awake, I could not realize what had fallen on my bed. Then hearing a deep moan, I knew Mose had come back. I was dropping off again when a strange low sound caused my eyes to open wide. The black night had faded to the gray of dawn. The sound I recognized at once to be the Navajo's morning chant. I lay there and listened. Soft and monotonous, wild and swelling, but always low and strange, the savage song to the break of day was exquisitely beautiful and harmonious. I wondered what the literal meaning of his words could have been. The significance needed no translation. To the black shadows fading away, to the brightening of the gray light, to the glow of the east, to the morning sun, to the giver of life, to these the Indian chanted his prayer. Could there have been a better prayer? Pagan or not, the Navajo with his forefathers felt the spiritual power of the trees, the rocks, the light, and the sun, and he prayed to that which was divinely helpful to him in all the mystery of his unintelligible life. We did not crawl out that morning as early as usual, for it was to be a day of rest. When we did, a mooted question arose, whether we or the hounds were the more crippled. Ranger did not show himself. Don could just walk, and that was all. Mose was either too full or too tired to move. Sounder nursed a foot, and Jude favored her lame leg. After lunch we brightened up somewhat and set ourselves different tasks. Jones had misplaced or lost his wire and began to turn the camp topsy-turvy in his impatient efforts to locate it. The wire, however, was not to be found. This was a calamity, for, as we asked each other, how could we muzzle lions without wire? Moreover, a half-dozen heavy leather straps which I had bought in Canab for use as lion collars had disappeared. We had only one collar left, the one that Jones had put on the red lioness. Whereupon we began to blame each other, to argue, to grow heated, and naturally from that to become angry. It seems a fatality of campers along a wild trail, like explorers in an unknown land, to be prone to fight. If there is an explanation of this singular fact, it must be that men at such time lose their poise and veneer of civilization. In brief, they go back. At all events we had it hot and heavy, with the center of attack gradually focusing on Jones, and as he was always losing something, naturally we united in force against him. Fortunately we were interrupted by yells from the Navajo off in the woods. The brushing of branches and pounding of hoofs preceded his appearance. In some remarkable manner he had gotten a bridle on Mark, and from the way the big stallion hurled his huge bulk over logs and through thickets, it appeared evident he meant to usurp Jim's ambition and kill the Navajo. Hearing Emmett yell, the Indian turned Mark toward camp. The horse slowed down when he neared the glade and tried to buck, but Navvy kept his head up. With that, Mark seemed to give way to ungovernable rage and plunged right through camp. He knocked over the dog shelter and thundered down the ridge. Now the Navajo, with the bridle in his hand, was thoroughly at home. He was getting his revenge on Mark, and he would have kept his seat on a wild mustang, but Mark swerved suddenly under a low branch of a pine, sweeping the Indian off. When Navvy did not arise, we began to fear he had been seriously hurt, perhaps killed, and we ran to where he lay. Face downward, hands outstretched, with no movement of body or muscle, he certainly appeared dead. "'Badly hurt,' said Emmett, probably back-broken. I have seen it before from just such accidents.' "'Oh, no!' cried Jones, and I felt so deeply I could not speak. Jim, who always wanted Navvy to be a dead Indian, looked profoundly sorry. "'He's a dead Indian, all right,' replied Emmett. We rose from our stooping postures and stood around, uncertain and deeply grieved, until a mournful groan from Navvy afforded us much relief. "'That's your dead Indian!' exclaimed Jones. Emmett stooped again and felt the Indian's back and got in reward another mournful groan. "'It's his back,' said Emmett, and true to his ruling passion, forever to minister to the needs of horses, men, and things, he began to rub the Indian and call for the liniment. 
Jim went to fetch it, while I, still believing the navvy to be dangerously hurt, knelt by him and pulled up his shirt, exposing the hollow of his brown back. "'Here we are,' said Jim, returning on the run with the bottle. "'Pour some on,' replied Emmett. Jim removed the cork and soused the liniment all over the Indian's back. "'Don't waste it,' remonstrated Emmett, starting to rub Navvy's back. Then occurred a most extraordinary thing. A convulsion seemed to quiver through the Indian's body. He rose at a single leap, and uttering a wild, piercing yell, broke into a run. I never saw an Indian or anybody else run so fleetly. Yell after yell peeled back to us. Absolutely dumbfounded, we all gazed at each other. "'That's your dead Indian?' ejaculated Jim. "'What the hell?' exclaimed Emmett, who seldom used such language. "'Look here!' cried Jones, grabbing the bottle. "'See, don't you see it?' Jim fell face downward and began to shake. "'What?' shouted Emmett and I together. "'Turpentine, you idiots! Turpentine! Jim brought the wrong bottle!' In another second, three more forms lay stretched out on the sward, and the forest rang with sounds of mirth. End of chapter 3, part 6「Three Tales of Lonely Trails by Zane Gray. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Three Roping Lions in the Grand Canyon. Part Seven. That night the wind switched and blew cold from the north, and so strong that the campfire roared like a furnace. More snow was the verdict of all of us, and in view of this, I invited the Navajo to share my tent. Sleepy me, I said to him. Me savvy, he replied, and forthwith proceeded to make his bed with me. Much to my surprise, all my companions raised protestations, which struck me as being singularly selfish, considering that they would not be inconvenienced in any way. Why not, I asked, it's a cold night, there'll be frost if not snow. Sure, you'll get em, said Jim. There never was an Indian that didn't have em, added Jones. What? I questioned. They made mysterious signs that rather augmented my ignorance as to what I might get from the Indian, but in no wise changed my mind. When I went to bed I had to crawl over Navvy. Mose lay at my feet as usual, and he growled so deep that I could not but think he too resented the addition to my small tent. "'Mr. Gay!' came in the Indian's low voice. "'Well, Navvy,' I asked. "'Sleepy, sleepy?' "'Yes, Navvy, sleepy and tired. Are you?' me savvy mucha sleepy mucha no bueno i did not wonder at his feeling sleepy tired and bad he did not awaken me in the morning for when my eyes unclosed the tent was light and he had gone i found my companions up and doing we had breakfast and got into our saddles by the time the sun a red ball low down among the pines began to brighten and turn to gold no snow had fallen but a thick frost encrusted the ground the hounds wearing cloth moccasins which plainly they detested trotted in front don showed no effects of his great run down the sliding slope after the red lioness it was one of his remarkable qualities that he recuperated so quickly ranger was a little stiff and sounder favored his injured foot the others were as usual jones led down the big hollow to which he kept after we had passed the edge of the pines then marking a herd of deer ahead he turned his horse up the bank we breasted the ridge and jogged toward the cedar forest which we entered without having seen the hounds show interest in anything under the cedars in the soft yellow dust we crossed lion tracks many of them but too old to carry a scent even north hollow with its regular beaten runway failed to win a murmur from the pack spread out said jones and look for tracks i'll keep the center and hold in the hounds signaling occasionally to one another we crossed almost the breadth of the cedar forest to its western end where the open sage flats inclined to the rim in one of those flats i came upon a broken sagebrush the grass being thick thereabout i discovered no track but dismounted and scrutinized the surroundings carefully a heavy body had been dragged across the sage crushing it the ends of broken bushes were green the leaves showed bruises 
I began to feel like Don when he scented game. Leading my mustang, I slowly proceeded across the open, guided by an occasional downtrodden bush or tuft of grass. As I neared the cedars, again Foxy snorted. Under the first tree I found a ghastly bunch of red bones, a spread of grayish hairs, and a split skull. The bones were yet wet. Two long doe ears were still warm. Then I saw big lion tracks in the dust, and even a well-pressed imprint of a lion's body where he had rolled or lain. The two yells I sent ringing into the forest were productive of interesting results. Answers came from near and far. Then, what with my calling and the replies, the forest rang so steadily with shrill cries that the echoes had no chance to follow. An elephant in the jungle could not have caused more crashing and breaking of brush than did Emmett as he made his way to me. He arrived from the forest just as Jim galloped across the flat. Mutely I held up the two long ears. "'Get on your horse!' cried Jim, after one quick glance at the spread of bones and hair. It was well he said that, for I might have been left behind. I ran to Foxy and vaulted upon him. A flash of yellow appeared among the sage, and a string of yelps split the air. "'It's dawn!' yelled Jim. Well, we knew that. What a sight to see him running straight for us. He passed a savage yellow wolf in his ferocity, and disappeared like a gleam under the gloomy cedars. We spurred after him. The other hounds sped up. Jones closed in on us from the left, and in a few minutes we were strung out behind Emmett, fighting the branches, dodging and swerving, hugging the saddle, and always sending out our sharp yells. The race was furious but short. The three of us coming up together found Emmett dismounted on the extreme end of West Point. "'The hounds have gone down,' he said, pointing to the runway. We all listened to the meaning bays. "'Sure, they've got him up asserted jim like as not they found him under the rim here sleeping off his gorge now fellows i'll go down it might be a good idea for you to spread along the rim with that we turned our horses eastward and rode as close to the rim as possible clumps of cedars and deep fissures often forced us to circle them the hounds travelling under the walls below kept pace with us and then forged ahead which fact caused jones to dispatch emmett on the gallop for the next runway at north hollow soon jones bade me dismount and make my way out upon one of the promontories while he rode a little farther on as i tied my mustang i heard the hounds faint and far beneath i waded through the sage and cedar to the rim cape after cape jutted out over the abyss some were very sharp and bare others covered with cedar some tottering crags with a crumbling bridge leading to their rims and some ran down like giant steps from one of these i watched below the slope here under the wall was like the side of a rugged mountain somewhere down among the dark patches of cedar and the great blocks of stone the hounds were hunting the lion but i could not see one of them the promontory i had chosen had a split and choked as this was with brush rock and shale it seemed a place where i might climb down once started i could not turn back and sliding clinging to what afforded i worked down the crack a wall of stone hid the sky from me part of the way i came out a hundred feet below upon a second promontory of huge slabs of yellow stone over these i clambered to sit with my feet swinging over the last one straight before my gaze yawned the awful expanse of the canyon in the soft morning light the red mesas the yellow walls the black domes were less harsh than in the full noonday sun purer than in the tender shadow of twilight below me were slopes and slides divided by ravines full of stones as large as houses with here and there a lonesome leaning crag giving irresistible proof of the downward trend of the rolling weathering ruins of the rim above the wall bulged out full of fissures ragged and rotten shells toppling columns of yellow limestone beaded with quartz and colored by wildflowers wonderfully growing in crannies 
wild and rare as was this environment i gave it but a glance and a thought the bay of the hounds caused me to bend sharp and eager eyes to the open spaces of stone and slide below luck was mine as usual the hounds were working up toward me how i strained my sight hearing a single cry i looked eastward to see jones silhouetted against the blue on a black promontory he seemed a giant primeval man overlooking the ruin of a former world i signalled him to make for my point black ranger hove in sight at the top of a yellow slide he was at fault but hunting hard jude and sounder bayed off to his left i heard don's clear voice permeating the thin cool air seemingly to leave a quality of wildness upon it yet i could not locate him ranger disappeared then for a time i only heard jim mose was next to appear and he too was upward bound a jumble of stone hid him and then ranger again showed evidently he wanted to get around the bottom of a low crag for he jumped and jumped only to fall back quite naturally my eyes searched that crag stretched out upon the top of it was the long slender body of a lion ay 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 i yelled till my lungs failed me where are you came from above here here i cried seeing jones on the rim come down climb down the crack the lion is here on top of that round crag he's fooled the hounds and they can't find him i see him i see him yelled jones then he roared out a single call for emmett that pealed like a clear clarion along the curved broken rim wall opening up echoes which clapped like thunder while jones clattered down i turned again to the lion he lay with head hidden under a little shelf and he moved not a muscle what a place for him to choose but for my accidental venturing down the broken fragments and steps of the rim he might have remained safe from pursuit suddenly right under my feet don opened his string of yelps i could not see him but decided he must be above the lion on the crag i leaned over as far as i dared at that moment among the varied and thrilling sounds about me i became vaguely aware of hard panting breaths like coughs somewhere in my vicinity as jones had set in motion bushels of stone and had already scraped his feet over the rocks behind me i thought the forced respiration came from him when i turned he was yet far off too far for me to hear him breathe i thought this circumstance strange but straightway forgot it on the moment from my right somewhere don peeled out his bugle blast and immediately after sounder and jude joining him sent up the thrice welcome news of a treed lion there too there too i yelled to jones now working down to my right he's treed down here i've got him spotted replied jones you stay there and watch your lion yell for emmett signal after signal for emmett earned no response though jim far below to the left sent me an answer the next few minutes or more likely half an hour passed with jones and me separated from each other by a wall of broken stone waiting impatiently for jim and emmett while the hounds bade one lion and i watched the other calmness was impossible under such circumstances no man could have gazed into that marvel of color and distance with wild life about him with wild sounds ringing in his ears without yielding to the throb and race of his wild blood emmett did not come jim had not answered a yell for minutes no doubt he needed his breath he came into sight just to the left of our position and he ran down one side of the ravine to toil up the other i hailed him jones hailed him and the hounds hailed him steer to your left jim i called there's a lion on that crag above you he might jump round the cliff to the left jones is there the most painful task it was for me to sit there and listen to the sound rising from below without being able to see what happened my lion had peeped up once and seeing me had crouched closer to his crag evidently believing he was unseen which obviously made it imperative for me to keep my seat and hold him there as long as possible but to hear the various exclamations thrilled me enough 
Hi, Mose, get out of that. Catch him. Hold him. Damn these rotten limbs. Hand me a pole. Jones, back down. Back down. He coming. Hi, hi, whoop, boo, up, there, there. Now you've got him. No, no, it slipped. Now look out, Jim, from under. He's going to jump. A smashing and rattling of loose stones and a fiery burst of yelps with trumpet-like yells followed close upon Jones's last words. Then two yellow streaks leaped down the ravine. The first was the lion, the second was Don. The rest of the pack came tumbling helter-skelter in their wake. Following them raced Jim in long kangaroo leaps, with Jones in the rear running for all he was worth. The animated and musical procession passed up out of the ravine and gradually lengthened as the lion gained and Jones lost, till it passed altogether from my jealous sight. On the other side of the ridge of cedars, the hounds treed their quarry again, as was easy to tell by their change from sharp, intermittent yelping to an unbroken, full, deep chorus. Then presently all quieted down, and for long moments at a time the still silence enfolded the slope. Shouts now and then floated up on the wind, and an occasional bark. I sat there for an hour by my watch, though it seemed only a few minutes, and all that time my lion lay crouched on his crag and never moved. I looked across the curve of the canyon to the purple breaks of the Siwash and the shaggy side of Buckskin Mountains, and far beyond to where Canab Canyon opened its dark mouth, and farther still to the pink cliffs of Utah, weird and dim in the distance. Something swelled within my breast at the thought that for the time I was part of that wild scene. The eye of an eagle soaring above would have placed me as well as my lion among the few living things in the range of his all-encompassing vision. Therefore all was mine, not merely the lion, for he was only the means to an end, but the stupendous, unnameable thing beneath me, this chasm that hid mountains in the shades of its cliffs, and the granite tombs, some gleaming pale, passionless others red and warm painted by a master hand and the wind caves dark portaled under their mist curtains and all that was deep and far off unapproachable unattainable of beauty exceeding dressed in ever-changing hues was mine by right of presence by right of the eye to see and the mind to keep wahoo the cry lifted itself out of the depths i saw jones on the ridge of cedars all right here have you kept your line there he yelled all's well come along come along i replied i watched them coming and all the while my lion never moved the hounds reached the base of the cliff under me but they could not find the lion though they scented him for they kept up a continual baying jim got up to the shelf under me and said they had tied up the lion and left him below jones toiled slowly up the slope someone ought to stay down there he might jump i called in warning that crag is forty feet high on this side he replied i clambered down over the uneven mass let myself down between the boulders and crawled under a dark ridge and finally with jim catching my rifle and camera and then lending his shoulders i reached the bench below jones came puffing round a corner of the cliff and soon all three of us with the hounds stood out on the rocky shelf with only a narrow space between us and the crouching lion before we had a moment to speak much less form a plan of attack the lion rose spat at us defiantly and deliberately jumped off the crag we heard him strike with a frightful thud surprise held us dumb to take the leap to the slope below seemed beyond any beast not endowed with wings we saw the lion bounding down the identical trail which the other lion had taken jones came out of his momentary indecision hold the dogs call em back he yelled hoarsely they'll kill the lion we tied they'll kill him the hounds had scattered off the bench here and there everywhere to come together on the trail below already they were in full cry with the matchless dawn at the fore manifestly to call them back was an injustice as well as impossible in ten seconds they were out of sight 
in silence we waited each listening each feeling the tragedy of the situation each praying that they would pass by the poor helpless bound lion suddenly the regular baying swelled to a burst of savage snarling fury such as the pack made in a vicious fight this ceased short silence ensued don's sharp voice woke the echoes and then the regular baying continued as with one thought we all sat down painful as the certainty was it was not so painful as that listening hoping suspense sure they can't be blamed said jim finally bumping their nose into a tied lion that way how'd they know who could guess the second lion would jump off that quick and run back to our captive burst out jones sure we might a knowed it replied jim well i'm going after the pack he gathered up his lasso and strode off the bench jones said he would climb back to the rim and i followed jim why the lions ran in that particular direction was clear to me when i saw the trail it was a runway smooth and hard packed i trudged down it with rather less enjoyment than on any trail i had ever followed to the canyon jim waited for me over the cedar ridge and showed me where the captive lion lay dead the hounds had not torn him they had killed him and passed on after the other he was a fine fellow all of seven feet we'll skin him on our way back only dogged determination coupled with a sense of duty to the hounds kept us on that trail for the time being enthusiasm had been submerged but we had to follow the pack jim less weighted down and perhaps less discouraged forged ahead up and down the sun had burned all the morning coolness out of the air i perspired and panted and began to grow weary jim's signal called me to hurry i took to a trot and came upon him and the hounds under a small cedar the lion stood among the dead branches his sides were shaking convulsively and his short breaths could be plainly heard he had the most blazing eyes and most untamed expression of any wild creature i have ever seen and this amazed me considering i had kept him on a crag for over an hour and had come to look upon him as my own what'll we do jim now that we have him treed sure we'll tie him up declared jim the lion stayed in the cedar long enough for me to photograph him twice then he leaped down again and took to his back trail we followed as fast as we could soon to find that the hounds had put him up another cedar from this he jumped down upon the dogs scattered them as if they had been so many leaves and bounded up the slope out of sight i laid aside my rifle and camera and tried to keep up with jim the lion ran straight up the slope and treed again under the wall before we covered half the distance he was on the go once more flying down in clouds of dust don is making him hump said jim and that alone was enough to spur us on we would reward the noble hound if we had the staying power don and his pack ran westward this time and along a mile of the beaten trail put him up two more trees but these we could not see and judged only by the sound look here cried jim darn me if he ain't coming right at us it was true ahead of us the lion appeared loping wearily we stopped in our tracks undecided jim drew his revolver once or twice the lion disappeared behind stones and cedars when he sighted us he stopped looked back then again turning toward us he left the trail to plunge down he had barely got out of sight when old don came pattering along the trail then ranger leading the others don did not even put his nose to the ground where the lion had switched but leaped aside and went down here the long section of slope between the lion's runway and the second wall had been weathered and worn racked and convulsed into deep ravines with ridges between we climbed and fell and toiled on always with the bay of the hounds in our ears we leaped fissures we loosened avalanches rolling them to crash and roar below and send long rumbling echoes out into the canyon a gorge in the yellow rock opened suddenly before us we stood at the constricted neck of one of the great splits in the second wall the side opposite was almost perpendicular and formed of mass on mass of broken stones this was a weathered slope on a gigantic scale points of cliffs jutted out 
Caves and cracks lined the wall. "'This is a rough place,' said Jim, "'but a lion could get over the second wall here, "'and I believe a man could too. "'The hounds seem to be back further toward where the split narrows. "'Through densely massed cedars and thickets of prickly thorns "'we wormed our way to come out at the neck of the gorge. "'There you are,' sang out Jim. "'The hounds were all on a flat shelf some few feet below us, "'and on a sharp point of rock close by, but too far for the dogs to reach, "'crouched the lion. "'He was gasping and frothing at the mouth. "'Sure if he'd only stay there,' said Jim. "'He loosened his lasso, and stationing himself just above the tired beast, "'he prepared to cast down the loop. "'The first throw failed of its purpose, but the rope hit the lion.' He got up painfully, it seemed, and faced the dogs. That way, barred, he turned to the cliff. Almost opposite him, a shelf leaned out. He looked at it, then paced to and fro like a beast in a cage. He looked again at the hounds, then up at us, all around, and finally concentrated his attention on the shelf. His long length sagged in the middle, he stretched low, his muscles gathered and strung, and he sprang like a tawny streak. His aim was true, the whole forepart of his body landed on the shelf, and he hung there. Then he slipped. We distinctly heard his claws scrape the hard, smooth rock. He fell, turning a somersault, struck twenty feet below on the rough slant, bounded from that to fall down, striking suddenly, and then to roll a yellow wheel that lodged behind a rock and stretched out to move no more. The hounds were silent. Jim and I were silent. A few little stones rattled, then were still. The dead silence of the canyon seemed to pay tribute to the lion's unquenchable spirit and to the freedom he had earned to the last. End of chapter 3, part 7「Chapter Three Tales of Lonely Trails by Zane Gray. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Three Roping Lions in the Grand Canyon. Part Eight. How long Jim and I sat there, we never knew. The second tragedy, not so pitiful, but as heart sickening as the first, crushed our spirits. Sure, he was a game lion, said Jim, and I'll have to get his skin. I'm all in, Jim. I couldn't climb out of that hole, I said. You needn't. Rest a little, take a good drink, and leave your canteen here for me. Then get your things back there on the trail and climb out. We're not far from West Point. I'll go back after the first lion's skin and then climb straight up. You lead my horse to the point where you came off the rim. He clattered along the gorge, knocking the stones and starting down. I watched him letting himself over the end of the huge slabs until he passed out of my sight. A good long drink revived me, and I began the ascent. From that moment on, time did not matter to me. I forgot all about it. I felt only my leaden feet and my laboring chest and dripping skin. I did not even notice the additional weight of my rifle and camera, though they must have overburdened me. I kept my eyes on the lion runway and plunged away with short steps. To look at these towering walls would have been to surrender. At last, stumbling, bursting, sick, I gained the rim and had to rest before I could mount. When I did get into the saddle, I almost fell from it. Jones and Emmett were waiting for me at the promontory where I had tied my horse, and were soon acquainted with the particulars of my adventure, and that Jim would probably not get out for hours. We made tracks for camp, and never did a place rouse in me such a sense of gratefulness. Emmett got dinner, and left on the fire a kettle of potato stew for Jim. It was almost dark when that worthy came riding into camp, we never said a word as he threw the two lion skins on the ground fellows you sure have missed the wind-up he exclaimed we looked at him and he looked at us was there any more i asked weakly sure and it beats hell when i got the skin of the lion the dogs killed i started to work up to the place i knowed you'd leave my horse it's bad climbing where you came down i got on the side of that cliff and saw where i could work out if i could climb a smooth place so i tried there was little cracks and ridges for my feet and hands. All to once, just above where I helped you down, I heard a growl. 
looking up i saw a big lion bigger than any we chased except sultan and he was poking his head out of a hole and sure telling me to come no further i couldn't let go with either hand to reach my gun because i'd have fallen so i yelled at him with all my might he spit at me and then walked out of the hole over the bench as proud as a lord and jumped down where i couldn't see him any more i climbed out all right but he'd gone and i tell you for a minute he sure made me sweat by george i yelled greatly excited i heard that lion breathing don chased him up there i heard hard wheezing breaths somewhere behind me but in the excitement i didn't pay any attention to them i thought it was jones panting but now i know what it meant sure he was there all the time looking at you and maybe he could have reached you we were all too exhausted for more discussion and putting that off until the next day we sought our beds it was hardly any wonder that i felt myself jumping even in my sleep and started up wildly more than once in the dead of night morning found us all rather subdued yet more inclined to a philosophical resignation as regarded the difficulties of our special kind of hunting capturing the lions on the level of the plateau was easy compared to following them down into canyons and bringing them up alone we all agreed that that was next to impossible another feature which before we had not considered added to our perplexity and it was a dawning consciousness that we would be perhaps less cruel if we killed the lions outright jones and emmett arrayed themselves on the side that life even in captivity was preferable while jim and i no doubt still under the poignant influence of that last lion's heroic race and end inclined to freedom or death we compromised on the reasonable fact that as yet we had shown only a jackass kind of intelligence about eleven o'clock while the others had deserted camp temporarily for some reason or other i was lounging upon an odorous bed of pine needles the sun shone warmly the sky gleamed bright azure through the openings of the great trees a dry west breeze murmured through the forest i was lying on my bed musing idly and watching a yellow woodpecker when suddenly i felt a severe bite on my shoulder i imagined an ant had bitten me through my shirt in a moment or so afterward i received this time on my breast another bite that left no room for imagination there was some kind of an animal inside my shirt and one that made a mosquito black fly or flea seem tame suddenly a thought swept on the heels of my indolent and rather annoying realization could i have gotten from the navajo what jim and jones so characteristically called them i turned cold all over and on the very instant i received another bite that burned like fire the return of my companions prevented any open demonstration of my fears and condition of mind but i certainly swore inwardly during the dinner hour i felt all the time as if i had on a horsehair shirt with the ends protruding toward my skin and in the exaggerated sensitiveness of the moment made sure m were chasing up and down my back after dinner i sneaked off into the woods i remembered that emmett had said there was only one way to get rid of em and that was to disrobe and make a microscopical search of garments and person with serious mind and murderous intent i undressed in the middle of the back of my jersey i discovered several long uncanny gray things i guess i got em i said gravely then i sat on a pine log in a state of unadorned nature oblivious of all around intent only on the massacre of the things that had violated me how much time flew i could not guess great loud ha-has roused me to consternation there behind me stood jones and emmett shaking as if with the ague it's not funny i shouted in a rage i had the unreasonable suspicion that they had followed me to see my humiliation jones who cracked a smile about as often as the equinoxes came and emmett the sober mormon laughed until they cried i was just wondering what your folks would think if they saw you n now gurgled jones that brought to me the humor of the thing and i joined in their mirth all i hope is that you fellows will get em too i said the good lord preserve me from that particular breed of navvies cried emmett 
Jones wriggled all over at the mere suggestion. Now, so much from the old plainsman, who had confessed to intimate relations with every creeping, crawling thing in the West, attested powerfully to the unforgettable singularity of what I got from Navvy. I returned to camp, determined to make the best of the situation, which, owing to my failure to catch all of the gray devils, remained practically unchanged. Jim had been acquainted with my dilemma, as was manifest in his wet eyes and broad grin with which he greeted me. "'I think I'll scalp the navvy,' he said. "'You make the Indians sleep outside after this snow or no snow,' was Joan's suggestion. "'No, I won't. I won't show a yellow streak like that. Besides, I want to give them to you fellows.' A blank silence followed my statement, to which Jim replied, sure that'll be easy jones'll have em so'll emmett and by thunder i'm scratchin now navvy look here i said severely mucha no bueno he bad you me here i scratched myself and made signs that a wooden indian would have understood me savvy he replied sullenly then flared up he big lie he turned on his heel erect dignified and walked away amid the roar of my gleeful comrades End of chapter 3, part 8「Chapter 3 – Tales of Lonely Trails » by Zane Gray. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 3 – Roping Lions in the Grand Canyon » part 9 One by one my companions sought their blankets, leaving the shadows, the dying embers, the slow rising moan of the night wind, to me old mose got up from among the other hounds and limped into my tent where i heard him groan as he lay down don sounder and ranger were fast asleep in well-earned rest shep one of the pups whined and impatiently tossed his short chain remembering that he had not been loose all day i unbuckled his collar and let him go he licked my hand stretched and shook himself lifted his shapely sleek head and sniffed the wind he trotted around the circle cast by the fire and looked out into the darkening shadows it was plain that shep's instincts were developing fast he was ambitious to hunt but sure in my belief that he was afraid of the black night and would stay in camp i went to bed the navajo who slept with me snored serenely and mose growled in his dreams the wind swept through the pines with an intermittent rush some time in the after part of the night i heard a distant sound remote mournful wild it sent a chill creeping over me born faintly to my ears it was a fit accompaniment to the moan of the wind in the pines it was not the cry of a trailing wolf nor the lonesome howl of a prowling coyote nor the strange low sound like a cough of a hunting cougar though it had a semblance of all three it was the bay of a hound thinned out by distance and it served to keep me wide awake but for a while what with the roar and swell of the wind and navvy snores i could hear it only at long intervals still in the course of an hour i followed the sound or imagined so from a point straight in line with my feet to one at right angles with my head finally deciding it came from shep and fancying he was trailing a deer or coyote i tried to go to sleep again in this i would have succeeded had not all at once our captive lions begun to growl that ominous low murmuring awoke me with a vengeance for it was unusual for them to growl in the middle of the night i wondered if they as well as the pup had gotten the scent of a prowling lion i reached down to my feet and groped in the dark for mose finding him i gave him a shake the old gladiator groaned stirred and came out of what must have been dreams of hunting meat he slapped his tail against my bed as luck would have it just then the wind abated to a soft moan and clear and sharp came the bay of a hound mose heard it for he stopped wagging his tail his body grew tense under my hand and he vented his low deep grumble i lay there undecided to wake my companions was hardly to be considered and to venture off into the forest alone where old sultan might be scouting was not exactly to my taste and trying to think what to do and listening for the bay of the pup and hearing mostly the lions growling and the wind roaring i fell asleep 
hey are you ever going to get up someone yelled into my drowsy brain i roused and opened my eyes the yellow flickering shadows on the wall of my tent told me that the sun had long risen i found my companions finishing breakfast the first thing i did was to look over the dogs shep the black and white pup was missing where's shep i asked sure i ain't seen him this morning replied jim thereupon i told what i had heard during the night everybody listen said jones we quieted down and sat like statues a gentle cool breeze barely moving the pine tips had succeeded the night wind the sound of horses munching their oats and an occasional clink rattle and growl from the lions did not drown the faint but unmistakable yelps of a pup south toward the canyon said jim as jones got up now it'd be funny if that little shep just to get even with me for tying him up so often has treed a lion all by himself commented jones and i'll bet that's just what he's done he called the hounds about him and hurried westward toward the forest sure it might be jim shook his head knowingly i reckon it's only a rabbit but anything might happen in this place i finished breakfast and went into my tent for something i forget what for wild yells from emmett and jim brought me flying out again listen to that cried jim pointing west the hounds had opened up their full wild chorus floated clearly on the breeze and above it jones's stentorian yell signalled us sure the old man can yell continued jim grab your lassos and hump yourselves i've got the collar and chain come on navvy shouted emmett he grasped the indian's wrist and started to run jerking navvy into the air at every jump i caught up my camera and followed we crossed two shallow hollows and then saw the hounds and jones among the pines not far ahead in my excitement i outran my companions and dashed into an open glade first i saw jones waving his long arms next the dogs noses upward and don actually standing on his hind legs then a dead pine with a well-known tawny shape outlined against the blue sky hurrah for shep i yelled and right vigorously did my comrades join in it's another female said jones when we calmed down and fair-sized that's the best tree for our purpose that i ever saw a lion in so spread out boys surround her and keep noisy navvy broke from emmett at this juncture and ran away but evidently overcome by curiosity he stopped to hide behind a bush from which i saw his black head protruding when jones swung himself on the first stubby branch of the pine the lioness some fifteen feet above leaped to another limb and the one she had left cracked swayed and broke it fell directly upon jones the blunt end striking his head and knocking him out of the tree fortunately he landed on his feet otherwise there would surely have been bones broken he appeared stunned and reeled so that emmett caught him the blood poured from a wound in his head this sudden shock sobered us instantly on examination we found a long jagged cut in jones's scalp we bathed it with water from my canteen and with snow jim procured from a nearby hollow eventually stopping the bleeding i insisted on jones coming to camp to have the wound properly dressed and he insisted on having it bound with a bandana after which he informed us that he was going to climb the tree again we objected to this each of us declared his willingness to go up and rope the lion but jones would not hear of it i'm not doubting your courage he said it's only that you cannot tell what move the lion would make next and that's the danger we could not gainsay this and as not one of us wanted to kill the animal or let her go jones had his way so he went up the tree past the first branch and then another the lioness changed her position growled spat clawed the twigs tried to keep the tree trunk between her and jones and at length got out on a branch in a most favorable position for roping the first cast of the lasso did the business and jim and emmett with nimble fingers tied up the hounds coming shouted jones he slid down hand over hand on the rope the lioness holding his weight with apparent ease make your noose ready he yelled to emmett i had to drop my camera to help jones and jim pull the animal from her perch the branches broke in a shower then the lioness hissing snarling whirling plunged down 
She nearly jerked the rope out of our hands, but we lowered her to Emmett, who noosed her hind paws in a flash. "'Make fast your rope,' shouted Jones. "'There, that's good. Now let her down. Easy.' As soon as the lioness touched the ground, we let go the lasso, which whipped up and over the branch. She became a round, yellow, rapidly moving ball. Emmett was the first to catch the loose lasso, and he checked the rolling cougar. Jones leaped to assist him, and the two of them straightened out the struggling animal, while Jim swung another noose at her. On the second throw, he caught a front paw. "'Pull hard! Stretch her out!' yelled Jones. He grasped a stout piece of wood and pushed it at the lioness. She caught it in her mouth, making the splinters fly. Jones shoved her head back on the ground and pressed his brawny knee on the bar of wood. "'The collar! The collar! Quick!' he called. I threw chain and collar to him, which in a moment he had buckled around her neck. "'There, we've got her,' he said. "'It's only a short way over to camp, so we'll drag her without muzzling.' As he rose, the lioness lurched and, reaching him, fastened her fangs in his leg. Jones roared. Emmett and Jim yelled, and I, though frightened, was so obsessed with the idea of getting a picture that I began to fumble with the shutter of my camera. "'Grab the chain! Pull her off!' bawled Jones. I ran in, took up the chain with both hands, and tugged with all my might. Emmett, too, had all his weight on the lasso round her neck. Between the two of us we choked her hold loose, but she brought Jones's leather legging in her teeth. Then I dropped the chain and jumped. Blankety, blankety, blank, exploded Jones to me. Do you think more of a picture than of saving my life? Having expressed this not unreasonable protest, he untied the lasso that Emmett had made fast to a small sapling. Then the three men, forming points of a triangle around an animated center, began a march through the forest that, for a variety of action and splendid vociferation, beat any show I ever beheld. So rare was it that the Navajo came out of his retreat, and straightway, forgetting his reverence and fear, began to execute a ghost dance, or war dance, or at any rate some kind of an Indian dance, along the sidelines. There were moments when the lioness had Jim and Jones on the ground and Emmett wobbling, others when she ran on her bound legs and chased the two in front and dragged the one behind, others when she came within an ace of getting her teeth in somebody. They had caught a tartar. They dared not let her go, and though Jones evidently ordered it, no one made fast his rope to a tree. There was no opportunity. She was in the air three parts of the time, and the fourth she was invisible for dust. The lassos were each thirty feet long, but even with that the men could just barely keep out of her reach. Then came the climax, as it always comes in a lion hunt, unerringly, unexpectedly, and with lightning swiftness. The three men were nearing the bottom of the second hollow, well spread out, lassos taut, facing one another. Jones stumbled, and the lioness leaped his way. The weight of both brought Jim over, sliding and slipping, with his rope slackening. The leap of the lioness carried her within reach of Jones, and as he raised himself back toward her, she reached a big paw for him, just as Emmett threw all his bull strength and bulk on his lasso. The seat of Jones's trousers came away with the lion's claws. Then she fell backward, overcome by Emmett's desperate lunge. Jones sprang up with the velocity of an Arab tumbler, and his scarlet face, working spasmodically, and his moving lips, showed how utterly unable he was to give expression to his rage. I had a stitch in my side that nearly killed me, but laugh I had to, though I should die for it. No laughing matter was it for them. They volleyed and thundered back and forth, meaningless words, of which hell was the only one distinguishable, and probably the word that best described their situation. All the while, however, they had been running from the lioness, which brought them, before they realized it, right into camp. Our captive lions cut up fearfully at the hubbub, and the horses stampeded in terror. "'Whoa!' yelled Jones, whether to his companions or to the struggling cougar no one knew. But Navvy thought Jones addressed the cougar. "'Whoa!' repeated Navvy. "'No savvy woe! No savvy woe!' which proved conclusively that the Navajo had understanding as well as wit. 
Soon we had another captive safely chained and growling away in tune with the others. I went back to untie the hounds, to find them sulky and out of sorts from being so unceremoniously treated. They noisily trailed the lioness into camp, where, finding her chained, they formed a ring around her. Thereafter the day passed in round the campfire chat and task. For once Jim looked at Navvy with toleration. We dressed the wound in Jones's head and laughed at the condition of his trousers and at his awkward attempts to piece them. Mucha dam kugi, remarked Navi. No sabi, woe. The lions growled all day, and Jones kept repeating, To think how Shep fooled me. End of chapter 3, part 9「Chapter Three of Tales of Lonely Trails」by Zane Gray. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Three: Roping Lions in the Grand Canyon, Part Ten. Next morning Jones was out bright and early, yelling at Navvy to hurry with the horses, calling to the hounds and lions, just as usual. Navvy had finally come to his full share of praise from all of us. Even Jim acknowledged that the Indian was invaluable to a hunting party, in a country where grass and water were hard to find, and wild horses haunted the trails. "'Tohodina, Tohodina! Hurry, hurry!' said Navvy, mimicking Jones that morning. As we sat down to breakfast, he loped off into the forest, and before we got up, the bells of the horses were jingling in the hollow. "'I believe it's going to be cloudy,' said Jones, "'and if so, we can hunt all day.' We rode down the ridge to the left of Middle Canyon, and had trouble with the hounds all the way. First they ran foul of a coyote, which was the one and only beast they could not resist. Spreading out to head them off, we separated. I cut into a hollow, and rode to its head, where I went up. I heard the hounds, and presently saw a big white coyote making fast time through the forest glades. It looked as if he would cross close in front of me, so I pulled Foxy to a standstill, jumped off, and knelt with my rifle ready. But the sharp-eyed coyote saw my horse and shied off. I had not much hope to hit him so far away, and the five bullets I sent after him, singing and zipping, served only to make him run faster. I mounted Foxy and intercepted the hounds, coming up sharply on the trail, and turned them toward my companions, now hallooing from the ridge below. Then the pack lost a good hour on several lion tracks that were a day old, and for such trails we had no time we reached the cedars however at seven o'clock and as the sky was overcast with low dun-coloured clouds and the air cool we were sure it was not too late one of the capes of the plateau between middle and left canyon was a narrow strip of rock covered with a dense cedar growth and cut up into smaller canyons all running down inevitably toward the great canyon with but a single bark to warn us don got out of our sight and hearing and while we split to look and call for him the remainder of the pack found the lion trail that he had gone on and they left us trying to find a way out as well as to find each other I kept the hounds in hearing for some time, and, meanwhile, I signaled to Emmett, who was on my right flank. Jones and Jim might as well have vanished off the globe for all I could see or hear of them. A deep, narrow gully into which I had to lead Foxy and carefully coax him out took so much time that when I once more reached a level I could not hear the hounds or get an answer to my signal cry. Wahoo! I called again away on the dry rarefied air pealed the cry piercing the cedar forest splitting sharp in the vaulted canyons rolling loud and long to lose power to die away in muffling echo but the silence returned no answer i rode on under the cedars through a dark gloomy forest silent almost spectral which brought irresistibly to my mind the words i found me in a gloomy wood astray i was lost though i knew the direction of the camp this section of cedar forest was all but impenetrable dead cedars were massed in gray tangles live cedars branches touching the ground grew close together 
In this labyrinth I lost my bearings. I turned and turned, crossed my own back trail, which in desperation I followed, coming out of the cedars at the deep and narrow canyon. Here I fired my revolver. The echo boomed out like the report of heavy artillery, but no answering shot rewarded me. There was no alternative save to wander along the canyon and through the cedars until I found my companions. This I began to do, disgusted with my awkwardness in losing them. Turning Foxy westward, I had scarcely gotten under way when Don came trotting toward me. "'Hello, old boy,' I called. Don appeared as happy to see me as I was to see him. He flopped down on the ground, his dripping tongue rolled as he panted. Covered with dust and flecked with light froth, he surely looked to be a tired hound. "'All in, eh, Don?' I said, dismounting. "'Well, we'll rest a while.' Then I discovered blood on his nose, which I found to have come from a deep scratch. "'Aha! Been pushing a lion too hard this morning.' got your nose scratched didn't you you great lazy hound don't you know some day you'll chase your last lion don wagged his tail as if to say he knew it all very well i wet my handkerchief from my canteen and started to wash the blood and dust from his nose when he whined and licked my fingers thirsty i asked sitting down beside him denting the top of my hat i poured in as much water as it would hold and gave him to drink Four times he emptied my improvised cup before he was satisfied. Then, with a sigh of relief, he lay down again. The three of us rested there for perhaps half an hour, Don and I sitting quietly on the wall of the canyon, while Foxy browsed on occasional tufts of grass. During that time the hound never raised his sleek, dark head, which showed conclusively the nature of the silence. And now that I had company, as good company as any hunter ever had, I was once more contented. Don got up, at length, of his own volition, and with a wag of his tail set off westward toward the rim. Remounting my mustang, I kept as close to Don's heels as the rough going permitted. The hound, however, showed no disposition to hurry, and I let him have his way without a word. We came out in the notch of the great amphitheater, or curve, we had named the bay, and I saw again the downward slope, the bold steps, the color and depth below. I was just about to yell a signal cry when I saw Don, with hair rising stiff, run forward. He took a dozen jumps, then yelping, broke down the steep yellow and green gorge. He disappeared before I knew what had happened. Shortly I found a lion track, freshly made, leading down. I believed I could follow wherever Don led, so I decided to go after him. I tied Foxy securely, removed my coat, kicked off spurs and chaps, and, remembering past unnecessary toil, fastened a red bandana to the top of a dead snag to show me where to come up on my way out. Then I carefully strapped my canteen and camera on my back, made doubly secure my revolver, put on my heavy gloves, and started down. And I realized at once that only so lightly encumbered should I have ever ventured down the slope. Little benches of rock, grassy on top with here and there cedar trees, led steeply down for perhaps five hundred feet. A precipice stopped me. From it I heard Don baying below, and almost instantly saw the yellow gleam of a lion in a treetop. ay 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 I yelled in wild encouragement. I felt it would be wise to look before I leaped. The bay lay under me, a mile wide where it opened into the great slumbering smoky canyon. All below was chaos of splintered stone and slope, green jumble of cedar, ruined, detached, sliding, standing cliff walls, leaning yellow crags. An awful hole. But I could get down, and that was all I cared for. I ran along to the left, jumping cracks, bounding over the uneven stones, with sure swift feet, and came to where the cliff ended in weathered slope and scaly bench. It was like a game, going down that canyon. My heavy nailed boots struck fire from the rocks. My heavy gloves protected my hands as I slid and hung on and let go. I outfooted the avalanches, and wherever I came to a scaly slope or bank or decayed rock, I leaped down in sheer delight. But all too soon my progress was barred. 
once under the cliff i found only a gradual slope and many obstacles to go round or surmount luck favored me for i ran across a runway and keeping to it made better time i heard don long before i tried to see him and yelled at intervals to let him know i was coming a white bank of weathered stone led down to a clump of cedars from where don's bay came spurring me to greater efforts i flew down this bank and through an opening saw the hound standing with four feet against a cedar the branches over him swayed and i saw an indistinct tawny form moved downward in the air then succeeded the crash and rattle of stones don left the tree and disappeared i dashed down dodged under the cedars threaded a maze of rocks to find myself in a ravine with a bare water-worn floor in patches of sand showed the fresh tracks of don and the lion running down this dry clean bed was the easiest going i ever found in the canyon every rod the course jumped in a fall from four to ten feet often more and these i slid down how i ever kept don in hearing was a marvel but still i did the lion evidently had no further intention of taking to a tree from the size of his track i concluded he was old and i feared every moment to hear the sounds of a fight jones had said that nearly always in the case of one hound chasing an old lion the lion would lie in wait for him and kill him and i was afraid for don down 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 we went till the yellow rim above seemed a thin band of gold i saw that we were almost to the canyon proper and i wondered what would happen when we reached it the dark shaded watercourse suddenly shot out into the bright light and ended in a deep cove with perpendicular walls fifty feet high i could see where a few rods farther on this cove opened into a huge airy colored canyon i called the hound wondering if he had gone to the left or right of the cove his bay answered me coming from the cedars far to the right i turned with all the speed left in me for i felt the chase nearing an end tracks of hound and lion once more showed in the dust the slope was steep and stones i sent rolling cracked down below soon i had a cliff above me and had to go slow and cautiously a misstep or slide would have precipitated me into the cove almost before i knew what i was about i stood gasping on the gigantic second wall of the canyon with nothing but thin air under me except far below faint and indistinct purple clefts red ridges dotted slopes running down to merge in a dark winding strip of water that was the rio colorado a sullen murmur roared out of the abyss the coloring of my mood changed never had the canyon struck me so terribly with its illimitable space its dread depth its unscalable cliffs and particularly with the desolate forbidding quality of its silence i heard don bark turning the corner of the cliff wall i saw him on a narrow shelf he was coming toward me and when he reached me he faced again to the wall and barked fiercely the hair on his neck bristled i knew he did not fancy that narrow strip of rock nor did i but a sudden grim cold something had taken possession of me and i stepped forward come on don old fellow we've got him corralled that was the first instance i ever knew of don's hesitation in the chase of a lion i had to coax him to me but once started he took the lead and i closely followed the shelf was twenty feet wide and upon it close to the wall in the dust were the deep imprints of the lion a jutting corner of cliff wall hid my view i peeped around it the shelf narrowed on the other side to a yard in width and climbed gradually by broken steps don passed the corner looked back to see if i was coming and went on he did this four times once even stopping to wait for me i'm with you don i grimly muttered we'll see this trail out to a finish i had now no eyes for the wonders of the place though i could not but see as i bent a piercing gaze ahead the ponderous overhanging wall above and sense the bottomless depth below i felt rather than saw the canyon swallows sweeping by in darting flight with soft rustle of wings and i heard the shrill chirp of some strange cliff inhabitant dawn ceased barking 
How strange that seemed to me! We were no longer man and hound, but companions, brothers, each one relying on the other. A protruding corner shut us from sight of what was beyond. Don slipped around. I had to go sideways, and shuddered as my fingers bit into the wall. To my surprise, I soon found myself on the floor of a shallow wind cave. The lion trail led straight across it and on. Shelves of rock stuck out above, under which I hurriedly walked. I came upon a shrub cedar growing in a niche and marveled to see it there. Don went slower and slower. We suddenly rounded a point to see the lion lying in a box-like space in the wall. The shelf ended there. I had once before been confronted with a like situation and had expected to find it here, so was not frightened. The lion looked up from his task of licking a bloody paw and uttered a fierce growl. His tail began to lash to and fro. It knocked the little stones off the shelf. I heard them click on the wall. Again and again he spat, showing great white fangs. He was a tom, heavy and large. It had been my purpose, of course, to photograph this lion, and now that we had cornered him, I proposed to do it. What would follow had only hazily formed in my mind, but the nucleus of it was that he should go free. I got my camera, opened it, and focused from between twenty and twenty-five feet. Then a growl from Don and roar from the lion bade me come to my senses. I did so, and my first movement after seeing the lion had risen threateningly was to whip out my revolver. The lion's cruel yellow eyes darkened and darkened. In an instant I saw my error. Jones had always said, in case any one of us had to face a lion, never for a single instant to shift his gaze. I had forgotten that, and in that short interval, when I focused my camera, the lion had seen I meant him no harm, or feared him, and he had risen. Even then, in desperate lessening ambition for a great picture, I attempted to take one, still keeping my glance on him. It was then that the appalling nature of my predicament made itself plain to me. The lion leaped ten feet and stood snarling horribly right in my face. Brave, noble Don, with infinitely more sense and courage than I possessed, faced the lion and bayed him in his teeth. I raised the revolver and aimed twice, each time lowering it because I feared to shoot in such a precarious position. To wound the lion would be the worst thing I could do, and I knew that only a shot through the brain would kill him in his tracks. "'Hold him, Don, hold him!' I yelled, and I took a backward step. The lion put forward one big paw, his eyes now all purple blaze. I backed again, and he came forward. Don gave ground slowly. Once the lion flashed a yellow paw at him. It was frightful to see the widespread claws. In the consternation of the moment, I allowed the lion to back me across the front of the wind cave, where I saw, the moment it was too late, I should have taken advantage of more space to shoot him fright succeeded consternation and i began to tremble the lion was master of the situation what would happen when i came to the narrow point on the shelf where it would be impossible for me to back around i almost fainted the thought of heroic don saved me and the weak moment passed by god don you've got the nerve and i must have it too I stopped in my tracks. The lion, appearing huge now, took slow, cat-like steps toward me, backing Don almost against my knee. He was so close I smelt him. His wonderful eyes, clear blue fire circled by yellow flame, fascinated me. Hugging the wall with my body, I brought the revolver up, short-armed, and with clenched teeth and nerve strained to the breaking point, I aimed between the eyes and pulled the trigger. The left eye seemed to go out blankly, then followed the bellow of the revolver and the smell of powder. The lion uttered a sound that was a mingling of snarls, howls, and roars, and he rose straight up, towering high over my head, beating the wall heavily with his paws. In helpless terror I stood there, forgetting weapon, fearing only the beast would fall over on me. But in death agony he bounded out from the wall to fall into space. 
I sank down on the shelf, legs powerless, body in cold sweat. As I waited, slowly my mind freed itself from a tight iron band, and a sickening relief filled my soul. Tensely I waited and listened. Don whined once. Would the lion never strike? What seemed a long period of time ended in a low, distant roar of sliding rock, quickly dying into the solemn stillness of the canyon. End of chapter 3, part 10「Chapter Three: Tales of Lonely Trails by Zane Gray. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Three: Roping Lions in the Grand Canyon, Part Eleven. I lay there for some moments, slowly recovering, eyes on the far distant escarpments, now darkly red and repellent to me. When I got up, my legs were still shaky, and I had the strange, weak sensation of a long, bedridden invalid. Three attempts were necessary before I could trust myself on the narrow strip of shelf. But once around it, with the peril past, I braced up and soon reached the turn in the wall. After that the ascent out of the bay was only a matter of work, which I gave with a will. Don did not evince any desire for more hunting that day. We reached the rim together, and after a short rest I mounted my horse and we turned for camp. The sun had long slanted toward the western horizon when I saw the blue smoke of our campfire among the pines. The hounds rose up and barked as dawn trotted into the blaze, and my companions, just sitting to a dinner, gave me a noisy greeting. "'Sure, we began to get worried,' said Jim. "'We all had it coming to us today, and don't you forget that.' Dinner lasted for a long hour. Besides being half famished, we all took time between bites to talk. I told my story first, expecting my friends to be overwhelmed, but they were not. It's been the greatest day of lion hunting that I ever experienced, declared Jones. We ran bang into a nest of lions, and they split. We all split, and the hounds split. That tells the tale. We have nothing to show for our day's toil. Six lions chased, rounded up, treed, holed, and one lion killed, and we haven't even his skin to show. I did not go down, but I helped Ranger and two of the pups chase a lion all over the lower end of the plateau. We treed him twice, and I yelled for you fellows till my voice was gone. Well, said Emmett, I fell in with Sounder and Jude. They were hot on a trail which in a mile or two turned up this way. I came on them just at the edge of the pines where they had treed their game. I sat under that pine tree for five hours, fired all my shots to make you fellows come, yelled myself hoarse, and then tried to tie up the lion alone. He jumped out and ran over the rim, where neither I nor the dogs could follow. "'Sure, I win, three of a kind,' drawled Jim, as he got his pipe and carefully dusted the bowl. When the stampede came, I got my hands on Mose and held him. I held Mose because, just as the other hounds broke loose over to my right, I saw down into a little pocket where a fresh-killed deer lay half-eaten. So I went down. I found two other carcasses lying there, fresh-killed last night, flesh all gone, hide gone, bones crushed, skull split open. And damn me, fellas, if that little pocket wasn't all torn to pieces. The sage was crushed flat. The ground dug up, dead snags broken, and blood and hair everywhere. Lion tracks like leaves, and old Sultan's was there. I let Mose loose, and he humped the trail of several lions south over the rim. Major got down first and came back with his tail between his legs. Mose went down, and I kept close to him. It wasn't far down, but steep and rocky, full of holes. Mose took the trail to a dark cave. I saw the tracks of three lions going in. Then I collared Mose and waited for you fellows. I waited there all day, and nobody came to my call. Then I made for camp. How do you account for the torn-up appearance of the place where you found the carcasses? I asked. Lion fight, sure, replied Jones. Maybe old Sultan ran across the three lions feeding and pitched into them. Such fights were common among the lions in Yellowstone Park when I was there. What chance have we to find those three lions in a cave where Jim chased them? Well, we stand a good chance, said Jones, especially if it storms tonight. 
sure the snowstorm is comin returned jim darkness clapped down on us suddenly and the wind roared in the pines like a mighty river tearing its way down a rocky pass as we could not control the campfire sparks of which blew fiercely we extinguished it and went to bed i had just settled myself comfortably to be sung to sleep by the concert in the pines when jones hailed me say what do you think he yelled when i had answered him emmett is mad he's scratchin to beat the band he's got em i signalled his information with a loud whoop of victory you next jones they're comin to you i heard him grumble over my happy anticipation jim laughed and so did the navajo which made me suspect that he could understand more english than he wanted us to suppose next morning a merry yell disturbed my slumbers snowed in snowed in mucha snow disca snow kugi damn no bueno exclaimed navvy when i peeped out to see the forest in the throes of a blinding blizzard the great pines only pale grotesque shadows everything white mantled in a foot of snow i emphasized the indian words in straight english much snow cold no cougar bad stay in bed yelled jones all right i replied say jones have you got him yet he vouchsafed me no answer i went to sleep then and dozed off and on till noon when the storm abated we had dinner or rather breakfast round a blazing bonfire it's going to clear up said jim the forest around us was a somber and gloomy place the cloud that had enveloped the plateau lifted and began to move it hit the treetops sometimes rolling almost to the ground then rising above the trees at first it moved slowly rolling forming expanding blooming like a column of whirling gray smoke then it gathered headway and rolled onward through the forest a gray gloomy curtain moving and rippling split by the trees seemed to be passing over us it rose higher and higher to split up in great globes to roll apart showing glimpses of blue sky shafts of golden sunshine shot down from these rifts dispelling the shadows and gloom moving in paths of gold through the forest glade gleaming with brilliantly colored fire from the snow-wreathed pines the cloud rolled away and the sun shone hot the trees began to drip a mist of diamonds filled the air rainbows curved through every glade and feathered patches of snow floated down a great bank of snow sliding from the pine overhead almost buried the navajo to our infinite delight we all sought the shelter of the tents and sleep again claimed us i awoke about five o'clock the sun was low making crimson paths in the white aisles of the forest a cold wind promised a frosty morning to-morrow will be the day for lions exclaimed jones while we hugged the fire navvy brought up the horses and gave them their oats the hounds sought their shelters and the lions lay hidden in their beds of pine the round red sun dropped out of sight beyond the trees a pink glow suffused all the ridges blue shadows gathered in the hollow shaded purple and stole upward a brief twilight succeeded to a dark coldly starlit night once again when i had crawled into the warm hole of my sleeping bag was i hailed from the other tent emma called me twice and as i answered i heard jones remonstrating in a low voice sure jones has got em yelled jim he can't keep it secret no longer hey jones i cried do you remember laughing at me no i don't growled jones listen to this ha 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 ho ho bueno bueno and i wound up with a string of ha 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 the hounds rose up in a body and began to yelp lie down pups i called to them nothing doing for you it's only jones has got em end of chapter three part eleven chapter three of tales of lonely trails by zane gray this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter three roping lions in the grand canyon part twelve when we trooped out of the pines next morning the sun rising gloriously bright had already taken off the keen edge of the frosty air presaging a warm day the white ridges glistened the bunches of sage scintillated and the cedars tipped in snow resembled trees with brilliant blossoms 
we lost no time riding for the mouth of left canyon into which jim had trailed the three lions on the way the snow as we had expected began to thin out and it failed altogether under the cedars though there was enough on the branches to give us a drenching jim reined in on the verge of a narrow gorge and informed us the cave was below jones looked the ground over and said jim had better take the hounds down while the rest of us remained above to await developments jim went down on foot calling the hounds and holding them close we listened eagerly for him to yell or the pack to open up but we were disappointed in less than half an hour jim came climbing out with the information that the lions had left the cave probably the evening after he had chased them there well then said jones let's split the pack and hunt round the rims of these canyons we can signal to each other if necessary so we arranged for jim to take ranger and the pups across left canyon emmett to try middle canyon with don and mose and we were to perform a like office in right canyon with saunder and jude emmett rode back with us leaving us where we crossed middle canyon jones and i rimmed a mile of our canyon and worked out almost to the west end of the bay without finding so much as a single track so we started to retrace our way the sun was now hot the snow all gone the ground dry as if it had never been damp and jones grumbled that no success would attend our efforts this morning we reached the ragged mouth of Wright Canyon, where it opened into the deep, wide bay, and because we hoped to hear our companions across the canyon, we rode close to the rim. Sounder and Jude both began to bark on a cliff. However, as we could find no tracks in the dust, we called them off. Sounder obeyed reluctantly, but Jude wanted to get down over the wall. They sent a lion, averred Jones. Let's put them over the wall once permitted to go the hounds needed no assistance they ran up and down the rim till they found a crack hardly had they gone out of sight when we heard them yelping we rushed to the rim and looked over the first step was short a crumbled section of wall and from it led down a long slope dotted here and there with cedars both hounds were baying furiously i spied jude with her paws up on a cedar and above her hung a lion so close that she could nearly reach him sounder was not yet in sight there there i cried directing joan's glance are we not lucky i see by george come we'll go down leave everything that you don't absolutely need spurs chaps gun coat hat i left on the rim taking only my camera and lasso i had forgotten to bring my canteen we descended a ladder of shaly cliff the steps of which broke under our feet the slope below us was easy and soon we stood on a level with the lion the cedar was small and afforded no good place for him evidently he jumped from the slope to the tree and had hung where he first alighted where's sounder look for him i hear him below this lion won't stay treed long i too heard sounder the cedar tree obstructed my view and i moved aside a hundred feet farther down the hound bayed under a tall pinion high in the branches i saw a great mass of yellow and at first glance thought sounder had treed old sultan how i yelled then a second glance showed two lions close together two more two more look look i yelled to jones ay 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 he joined his robust yell to mine and for a moment we made the canyon bellow when we stopped for breath the echoes baited us from the opposite walls wahoo emmett's signal faint far away soaring but unmistakable floated down to us across the jutting capes separating the mouths of these canyons high above them on the rim wall of the opposite side of the bay stood a giant white horse silhouetted against the white sky they made a brave picture one most welcome to us we yelled in chorus three lions treed three lions treed come down hurry a crash of rolling stones made us wheel jude's lion had jumped he ran straight down drawing sounder from his guard jude went tearing after him i'll follow you stay here keep them up there if you can yelled jones then in long strides he passed down out of sight among trees and crags 
it had all happened so quickly that i could scarcely realize it the yelping of the hounds the clattering of stones grew fainter telling me jude and sounder with jones were going to the bottom of the bay both lions snarling at me brought me to a keen appreciation of the facts in the case two full-grown lions to be kept treed without hounds without a companion without a gun this is fine this is funny i cried and for a moment i wanted to run but the same grim deadly feeling that had taken me with don around the narrow shelf now rose in me stronger and fiercer i pronounced one savage malediction upon myself for leaving my gun i could not go for it i would have to make the best of my error and in the wildness born of the moment i swore if the lions would stay treed for the hounds they would stay treed for me first i photographed them from different positions then i took up my stand about on a level with them in an open place on the slope where they had me in plain sight i might have been fifty feet from them they showed no inclination to come down about this moment i heard hounds below coming down from the left i called and called but they passed on down the canyon bottom in the direction jones had taken presently a chorus of bays emphasized by jones yell told me his lion had treed again wahoo rolled down from above i saw emmett farther to the left from the point where he had just appeared where can i get down i surveyed the walls of the bay cliff on cliff slide on slide jumble crag and ruin baffled my gaze but i finally picked out a path farther to the left i yelled and waited he passed on don at his heels there i yelled again stop there let don go down with your lasso and come yourself i watched him swing the hound down a wall and pull the slip noose free don slid to the edge of a slope trotted to the right and left of crags threaded the narrow places and turned in the direction of the baying hounds he passed on the verge of precipices that made me tremble for him but sure-footed as a goat he went on safely down to disappear far to my right then i saw emmett sliding leg wrapped around his lasso down the first step of the rim his lasso doubled so as to reach round a cedar above was too short to extend to the landing below he dropped raising a cloud of dust and starting the stones pulling one end of his lasso up around the cedar he gathered it in a coil on his arm and faced forward following don's trail what strides he took in the clear light with that wild red and yellow background with the stones and gravel roaring down streaming over the walls like waterfalls he seemed a giant pursuing a foe from time to time he sent up a yell of encouragement that wound down the canyon to be answered by jones and the baying hounds and then the strange echoes at last he passed out of sight behind the crests of the trees i heard him going down down till the sounds came up faint and hollow i was left absolutely alone with my two lions and never did a hunter so delight in a situation i sat there in the sun watching them for a long time they were quiet listening but as the bays and yells below diminished in volume and occurrence and then ceased altogether they became restless it was then that i remembering the lion i had held on top of the crag began to bark like a hound the lions became quiet once more i bayed them for an hour my voice grew from hoarse to hoarser and finally failed in my throat the lions immediately grew restless again the lower one hissed spat and growled at me and made many attempts to start down each one of which i frustrated by throwing stones under the tree at length he made one more determined effort turned head downward and stepped from branch to branch i dashed down the incline with a stone in one hand and a long club in the other instinctively i knew i must hurt him make him fear me if he got far enough down to jump he would either escape or have me helpless i aimed deliberately at him and hit him square in the ribs he exploded in a spit roar that raised my hair directly under him i wielded my club pounded on the tree thrashed at the branches and like a crazy fool that i was yelled at him 
Go back! Go back! Don't you dare come down! I'll break your old head for you!" Foolish or not, this means effectually stopped the descent. He climbed to his first perch. It was then, realizing what I had done, that I would certainly have made tracks from under the pinion if I had not heard the faint yelp of a hound. I listened. It came again, faint but clearer. I looked up at my lions. They too heard, for they were very still. I saw how strained they held their heads. I backed a little away up the slope. Then the faint yelp floated up again in the silence, such dead, strange silence that seemed never to have been broken. I saw the lions quiver, and if I ever heard anything in my life, I heard their hearts thump. The yelp wafted up again, closer this time. I recognized it. It belonged to Don. The great hound on the back trail of the other lion was coming to my rescue. It's Don, it's Don, it's Don, I cried, shaking my club at the lions. It's all up with you now. What feeling stirred me then? Pity for those lions dominated me. Big, tawny, cruel fellows as they were, they shivered with fright. Their sides trembled, but pity did not hold me long. Don's yelp, now getting clear and sharp, brought back the rush of savage, grim sensations. A full-toned bay attracted my attention from the lions to the downward slope. I saw a yellow form moving under the trees and climbing fast. It was Don. "'Hi, hi, old boy!' I yelled. Then it seemed he moved up like a shot and stood all his long length, four paws against the pinion, his deep bay ringing defiance to the lions. It was a great relief, not to say a probable necessity, for me to sit down just then. "'Now come down,' I said to my lions. "'You can't catch that hound, and you can't get away from him.' Moments passed. I was just on the point of deciding to go down to hurry up my comrades when I heard the other hounds coming. Yelp on yelp, bay on bay, made welcome music to my ears. Then a black and yellow, swiftly flying string of hounds bore into sight down the slope, streaked up, and circled the pinion. Jones, who at last showed his tall, stooping form on the steep ascent, seemed as long in coming as the hounds had been swift. "'Did you get the lion? Where's Emmett?' I asked in breathless eagerness. "'Lion tied, all fast,' replied the panting Jones. "'Left Emmett to guard him. What are we to do now?' "'Wait till I get my breath. Think out a plan. We can't get both lions out of one tree.' "'All right,' I replied, after a moment's thought. "'I'll tie Sounder and Mose. "'You go up the tree. "'That first lion will jump, sure. "'He's almost ready now. "'Don and the other hounds will tree him again pretty soon. "'If he runs up the canyon, well and good. "'Then, if you can get the lasso on the other, "'I'll yell for Emma to come up to help you, "'and I'll follow Don.' "'Jones began the ascent of the pinion.' The branches were not too close, affording him easy climbing. Before we looked for even a move on the part of the lions, the lower one began stepping down. I yelled a warning, but Jones did not have time to take advantage of it. He had half turned, meaning to swing out and drop, when the lion planted both forepaws upon his back. Jones went sprawling down, with the lion almost on him. Don had his teeth in the lion before he touched the ground and when he did strike the rest of the hounds were on him a cloud of dust rolled down the slope the lion broke loose and with great springing bounds ran up the canyon don and his followers hot-footing it after him mose and sounder broke the dead sapling to which i had tied them and dragging it behind them endeavored in frenzied action to join the chase i drew them back loosening the rope so in case the other lion jumped i could free them quickly jones calmly gathered himself up rearranged his lasso took his long stick and proceeded to mount the pinion again i waited till i saw him slip the noose over the lion's head then i ran down the slope to yell for emmett he answered at once i told him to hurry to jones assistance with that i headed up the canyon i hung close to the broad trail left by the lion and his pursuers I passed perilously near the brink of precipices, but fear of them was not in me that day. I passed out of the bay into the mouth of Left Canyon and began to climb. The baying of the hounds directed me. In the box of yellow walls the chorus seemed to come from a hundred dogs. 
when i found them close to a low cliff baying the lion in a thick dark pinion ranger leaped into my arms and next don stood up against me with his paws on my shoulders these were strange actions and though i marked it at the moment i had ceased to wonder at our hounds i took one picture as the lion sat in the dark shade and then climbed to the low cliff and sat down i called don to me and held him in case our quarry leaped upon the cliff i wanted a hound to put quickly on his trail another hour passed it must have been a dark hour for the lion he looked as if it were and one of impatience for the baying hounds but for me it was a full hour alone with the hounds and a lion far from the walks of men walled in by the wild-colored cliffs with the dry sweet smell of cedar and pinion i asked no more sounder and mose vociferously venting their arrival were forerunners to jones i saw his gray locks waving in the breeze and yell for him to take his time as he reached me the lion jumped and ran up the canyon this suited me for i knew he would take to a tree soon and the farther up he went the less distance we would have to pack him from the cliff i saw him run up a slope pass a big cedar cunningly turn on his trail and then climb into the tree and hide in its thickest part don passed him got off the trail and ran at fault the others so used to his leadership were also baffled but jude crippled and slow brought up the rear and she did not go a yard beyond where the lion turned she opened up her deep call under the cedar and in a moment the howling pack were around her jones and i toiled laboriously upward he had brought my lasso and he handed it to me with the significant remark that i would soon have need of it the cedar was bushy and overhung a yellow bare slope that made jones shake his head he climbed the tree lassoed the spitting lion and then leaped down to my side by united and determined efforts we pulled the lion off the limb and let him down the hounds began to leap at him we both roared in a rage at them but to no use hold him there shouted jones leaving me with the lasso while he sprang forward the weight of the animal dragged me forward and had i not taken a half hitch around a dead snag would have lifted me off my feet or pulled the lasso from my hands as it was the choking lion now within reach of the furious leaping hounds swung to and fro before my face he could not see me but his frantic lunges narrowly missed me if never before jones then showed his genius don had hold of the lion's flank and jones grabbing the hound by the hind legs threw him down the slope don fell and rolled a hundred feet before he caught himself then jones threw old mose rolling and ranger and all except faithful jude before they could get back he roped the lion again and made fast to a tree then he yelled for me to let go the lion fell jones grabbed the lasso at the same time calling for me to stop the hounds as they came bounding up the steep slope i had to club the noble fellows into submission before the lion recovered wholly from his severe choking we had his paws bound fast then he could only heave his tawny sides glare and spit at us now what asked jones emmett is watching the second lion which we fastened by chain and lasso to a swinging branch i'm all in my heart won't stand any more climb you go to camp for the pack horses i said briefly bring them all and all the packs and navvy too i'll help emmett tie up the second lion and then we'll pack them both up here to this one you take the hounds with you can you tie up that lion asked jones mind you he's loose except for a collar and chain his claws haven't been clipped besides it'll be an awful job to pack those two lions up here we can try i said you hustle to camp your horse is right up back of here across that point if i don't mistake my bearings jones admonishing me again called the hounds and wearily climbed the slope i waited until he was out of hearing then began to retrace my trail down into the canyon i made the descent in quick time to find emmett standing guard over the lion the beast had been tied to an overhanging branch that swung violently with every move he made when i got here said emmett he was hanging over the side of that rock almost choked to death 
i drove him into the corner between the rocks and tree where he has been comparatively quiet now what's up where's jones did you get the third lion i related what had occurred and then said we were to tie this lion and pack him with the other one up the canyon to meet jones and the horses all right replied emmett with a grim laugh we'd better get at it now i'm some worried about the lion we left below he ought to be brought up but we both can't go this lion here will kill himself what will the other one weigh all of one hundred and fifty pounds you can't pack him alone i'll try and i reckon that's the best plan watch this fellow and keep him in the corner emmett left me then and i began a third long vigil beside a lion the rest was more than welcome an hour and a half passed before i heard the sliding of stones below which told me that emmett was coming he appeared on the slope almost bent double carrying the lion head downward before him he could climb only a few steps without lowering his burden and resting i ran down to meet him we secured a stout pole and slipping this between the lion's paws below where they were tied we managed to carry him fairly well and after several rests got him up alongside the other now to tie that rascal exclaimed emmett jones said he was the meanest one he'd tackled and i believe it we'll cut a piece off of each lasso and unravel them so as to get strings I wish Jones hadn't tied the lasso to that swinging branch. I'll go and untie it. Acting on this suggestion, I climbed the tree and started out on the branch. The lion growled fiercely. I'm afraid you'd better stop, warned Emmett. That branch is bending, and the lion can reach you. But despite this, I slipped out a couple of yards farther, and had almost gotten to the knotted lasso when the branch swayed and bent alarmingly. The lion sprang from his corner and crouched under me, snarling and spitting, with every indication of leaping. "'Jump! Jump! Jump!' shouted Emmett hoarsely. I dared not, for I could not jump far enough to get out of the lion's reach. I raised my legs and began to slide myself back up the branch the lion leaped missing me but scattering the dead twigs then the beast beside himself with fury half leaped half stood up and reached for me i looked down into his blazing eyes and open mouth and saw his white fangs everything grew blurred before my eyes i desperately fought for control over mind and muscle i heard hoarse roars from emmett then i felt a hot burning pain in my wrist which stung all my faculties into keen life again i saw the lion's beaked claws fastened in my leather wristband at the same instant emmett dashed under the branch and grasped the lion's tail one powerful lunge of his broad shoulders tore the lion loose and flung him down the slope to the full extent of his lasso quick as thought i jumped down and just in time to prevent emmett from attacking the lion with the heavy pole we had used i'll kill him i'll kill him roared emmett no you won't i replied quietly for my pain had served to soothe my excitement as well as to make me more determined we'll tie up the darn tiger if he cuts us all to pieces you know how jones will give us a laugh if we fail here bind up my wrist mention of jones probable ridicule and sight of my injury cooled emmett it's a nasty scratch he said binding my handkerchief around it the leather saved your hand from being torn off he's an ugly brute but you're right we'll tie him now let's each take a lasso and worry him till we get hold of a paw then we can stretch him out jones did a fiendish thing when he tied that lion to the swinging branch it was almost worse than having him entirely free he had a circle almost twenty feet in diameter in which he could run and leap at will it seemed he was in the air all the time first at emmett then at me he sprang mouth agape eyes wild claws spread we whipped him with our nooses but not one would hold he always tore it off before we could draw it tight. I secured a precarious hold on one hind paw and straightened my lasso. That's far enough, cried Emmett. Now hold him tight. Don't lift him off the ground. I had backed up the slope. 
Emmett faced the lion, noose ready, waiting for a favorable chance to rope a front paw. The lion crouched low and tense, only his long tail lashing back and forth across my lasso. Emmett threw the loop in front of the spread paws, now half sunk into the dust. "'Ease up! Ease up!' said he. "'I'll tease him to jump into the noose.' I let my rope sag. Emmett poked a stick into the lion's face. All at once I saw the slack in the lasso which was tied to the lion's chain. Before I could yell to warn my comrade, the beast leaped. My rope burned as it tore through my hands. The lion sailed into the air, his paws widespread like wings, and one of them struck Emmett on the head and rolled him on the slope. I jerked back on my rope, only to find it had slipped its hold. "'He slugged me one,' remarked Emmett, calmly rising and picking up his hat. "'Did he break the skin?' "'No, but he tore your hat-band off,' I replied. "'Let's keep at him.' For a few moments, or an hour, no one will ever know how long, we ran around him, raising the dust, scattering the stones, breaking the branches, dodging his onslaughts. He leaped at us to the full length of his tether, sailing right into our faces a fierce uncowed tigerish beast if it had not been for the collar and swivel he would have choked himself a hundred times quick as a cat supple powerful tireless he kept on the go whirling bounding leaping rolling till it seemed we would never catch him if anything breaks he'll get one of us cried emmett i felt his breath that time lord how i wish we had some of those fellows here who say lions are rank cowards i exclaimed in one of his sweeping side swings the lion struck the rock and hung there on its flat surface with his tail hanging over attract his attention shouted emmett but don't get too close don't make him jump while i slowly maneuvered in front of the lion emmett slipped behind the rock lunged for the long tail and got a good hold of it then with a whoop he ran around the rock carrying the kicking squalling lion clear of the ground now's your chance he yelled rope a hind foot i can hold him in a second i had a noose fast on both hind paws and then passed my rope to emmett while he held the lion i again climbed the tree untied the knot that had caused so much trouble and very shortly we had our obstinate captive stretched out between two trees after that we took a much-needed breathing spell not very scientific growled emmett by way of apologizing for our crude work but we had to get him some way emmett do you know i believe jones put up a job on us i said well maybe he did we had the job all right but we'll make short work of him now he certainly went at it in a way that alarmed me and would have electrified jones while I held the chain, Emmett muzzled the lion with a stick and a strand of lasso. His big blacksmith's hands held, twisted, and tied with remorseless strength. Now for the hardest part of it, said he, packing him up. We toiled and drudged upward, resting every few yards, wet with sweat, boiling with heat, parching for water. We slipped and fell, got up to slip and fall again the dust choked us we senselessly risked our lives on the brinks of precipices we had no thought save to get the lion up one hour of unremitting labor saw our task finished so far then we wearily went down for the other this one is the heaviest gloomily said emmett we had to climb partly sideways with the pole in the hollow of our elbows the lion dragged head downward catching in the brush and on the stones our rests became more frequent emmett who had the downward end of the pole and therefore thrice the weight whistled when he drew breath half the time i saw red mist before my eyes how i hated the sliding stones wait panted emmett once you're younger than me wait for that mormon giant used all his days to strenuous toil peril and privation to ask me to wait for him was a compliment which i valued more than any i had ever received at last we dropped our burden in the shade of a cedar where the other lions lay and we stretched ourselves a long sweet rest came abruptly to end with emmett's next words the lions are choking they're dying of thirst we must have water 
one glance at the poor gasping frothing beast proved to me the nature of our extremity water in this desert where will we find it oh why did i forget my canteen after all our hopes our efforts our tragedies and finally our wonderful good fortune to lose these beautiful lions for lack of a little water was sickening maddening think quick cried emmett i'm no good i'm all in but you must find water it snowed yesterday there's water somewhere into my mind flashed a picture of the many little pockets beaten by rains into the shelves and promontories of the canyon rim with the thought i was on the jump i ran i climbed i seemed to have wings i reached the rim and hurried along it with eager gaze i swung down on a cedar branch to a projecting point of rock small depressions were everywhere still damp but the water had evaporated but i would not give up i jumped from rock to rock and climbed over scaly ledges and set tons of yellow shale into motion and i found on a ragged promontory many little round holes some a foot deep all full of clear water using my handkerchief as a sponge i filled my cap then began my journey down i carried the cap with both hands and balanced myself like a tight-rope performer i zigzagged the slopes slipped over stones leaped fissures and traversed yellow slides i safely descended places that in an ordinary moment would have presented insurmountable obstacles and burst down upon emmett with an indian yell of triumph good ejaculated he if i had not known it already the way his face changed would have told me of his love for animals he grasped a lion by the ears and held his head up i saturated my handkerchief and squeezed the water into his mouth he wheezed coughed choked but to our joy he swallowed he had to swallow one after the other we served them so seeing with unmistakable relief the sure signs of recovery their eyes cleared and brightened the dry coughing that distressed us so ceased the froth came no more the savage fellow that had fought us to a standstill and for which we had named him spitfire raised his head the gold in his beautiful eyes darkened to fire and he growled his return to life and defiance emmett and i sank back in unutterable relief wahoo jones yell came breaking the warm quiet of the slope our comrade appeared riding down the voice of the indian calling to mark mingled with the ringing of iron-shod hoofs on the stones jones surveyed the small level spot in the shade of the cedars he gazed from the lions to us his stern face relaxed and his dry laugh cracked doggone me if you didn't do it end of chapter three part twelve Chapter Three: Tales of Lonely Trails by Zane Grey. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Three: Roping Lions in the Grand Canyon, Part Thirteen. A strange procession soon emerged from Left Canyon, and stranger to us than the lion heads bobbing out of the alfogas was the sight of Navvy riding in front of the lions i kept well in the rear for if anything happened which i calculated was more than likely i wanted to see it before we had reached the outskirts of pines i observed that the piece of lassos around spitfire's nose had worked loose just as i was about to make this known to jones the lion opened a corner of his mouth and fastened his teeth on the navajo's overalls he did not catch the flesh for when navvy turned around he wore only an expression of curiosity but when he saw spitfire chewing him he uttered a shrill scream and fell sideways off his horse then two difficulties presented themselves to us to catch the frightened horse and persuade the indian he had not been bitten we failed in the latter navvy gave us and the lions a wide berth and walked to camp jim was waiting for us and said he had chased a lion south along the rim till the hounds got away from him spitfire having already been chained was the first lion we endeavored to introduce to our family of captives 
he raged such a fearful row that we had to remove him some distance from the others we have two dog chains said jones but not a collar or a swivel in camp we can't chain the lions without swivels they'd choke themselves in two minutes once more for the hundredth time emmett came to our rescue with his inventive and mechanical skill he took the largest pair of hobbles we had and with an axe a knife and jones wire nippers fashioned two collars with swivels that for strength and serviceableness improved somewhat on those we had bought darkness was enveloping the forest when we finished supper i fell into my bed and despite the throbbing and burning of my wrist soon lapsed into slumber and i crawled out next morning late for breakfast stiff worn out crippled but happy six lions roaring a concert for me was quite conducive to contentment emmett interestingly engaged himself on a new pair of trousers which he had contrived to produce from two of our empty meal bags the lower half of his overalls had gone to decorate the cedar spikes and brush and these two new bag-leg trousers while somewhat remarkable for design answered the purpose well enough jones coat was somewhere along the canyon rim his shoes were full of holes his shirt in strips and his trousers in rags jim looked like a scarecrow my clothes being of heavy waterproofed duck had stood the hard usage in a manner to bring forth the unanimous admiration of my companions well fellows said jones there's six lions and that's more than we can pack out of here have you had enough hunting i have and i rejoined emmett sure you can bet i have drawled jim one more day boys and then i've done said i only one more day signs of relief on the faces of my good comrades showed how they took this evidence of my satisfied ambition i spent all the afternoon with the lions photographing them listening to them spit and growl watching them fight their chains and roll up like balls of fire from different parts of the forest i tried to creep unsuspected upon them but always when i peeped out from behind a tree or log every pair of ears would be erect every pair of eyes gleaming and suspicious spitfire afforded more amusement than all the others he had indeed the temper of a king he had been born for sovereignty not slavery to intimidate me he tried every manner of expression and utterance and failing he always ended with a spring in the air to the length of his chain this means was always effective i simply could not stand still when he leaped and in turn i tried every artifice i could think of to make him back away from me to take refuge behind his tree i ran at him with a club as if i were going to kill him he waited crouching finally in dire extremity i bethought me of a red flannel hood that emmett had given me saying i might use it on cold nights this was indeed a weird flaming headgear falling like a cloak down over my shoulders i put it on and camera in hand started to crawl on all fours toward spitfire i needed no one to tell me that this proceeding was entirely beyond his comprehension in his astonishment he forgot to spit and growl and he backed behind the little pine from which he regarded me with growing perplexity then having revenged myself on him and getting a picture i left him in peace end of chapter three part thirteen Chapter Three of Tales of Lonely Trails by Zane Grey. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Three: Roping Lions in the Grand Canyon, Part Fourteen. I awoke before dawn and lay watching the dark shadows change into gray and gray into light. The Navajo chanted solemnly and low his morning song. I got up with the keen eagerness of the hunter who faces the last day of his hunt. I warmed my frozen fingers at the fire. A hot breakfast smoked on the red coals. We ate while Navvy fed and saddled the horses. Sure, there'll be something doing today, said Jim fatalistically. We haven't crippled a horse yet, put in Emmett hopefully. Don led the pack and us down the ridge, out of the pines into the sage. The sun, a red ball, glared out of the eastern mist, 
shedding a dull glow on the ramparts of the far canyon walls a herd of white-tailed deer scattered before the hounds blue grouse whirred from under our horses feet spread out ordered jones and though he meant the hounds we all followed his suggestion as the wisest course ranger began to work up the sage ridge to the right jones emmett and i followed while jim rode away to the left gradually the space widened and as we neared the cedars a sharply defined deep canyon separated us we heard don open up then sounder ranger left the trail he was trying to work out on the thick sage and bounded in the direction of the rest of the pack we reined in to listen first don then sounder then jude then one of the pups bayed eagerly telling us they were hunting hard suddenly the bays blended in one savage sound ay 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 cracked the cool thin air we saw jim wave his hand from the far side of the canyon spur his horse into action and disappear into the cedars stick close together yelled jones as we launched forward we made the mistake of not going back to cross the canyon for the hounds soon went up the opposite side as we rode on and on the sounds of the chase lessened and finally ceased to our great chagrin we found it necessary to retrace our steps and when we did get over the deep gully so much time had elapsed that we despaired of coming up with jim emmett led keeping close on jim's trail which showed plain in the dust and we followed up and down ravines over ridges through sage flats and cedar forests to and fro around and around we trailed jim and the hounds from time to time one of us let out a long yell i see a big lion track called jones once and that stirred us on faster fully an hour passed before jones halted us saying we had best try a signal i dismounted while emmett rolled his great voice through the cedars a long silence ensued from the depth of the forest jim's answer struck faintly on my ear with a word to my companions i leaped on my mustang and led the way i rode as far as i could mark a straight line with my eye then stopped to wait for another cry in this way slowly but surely we closed in on jim we found him on the verge of the bay in the small glade where i had left my horse the day i followed don alone down the canyon jim was engaged in binding up the leg of his horse the baying of the hounds floated up over the rim what's up queried jones old sultan that's what replied jim we run plumb into him we've had him in five trees it ain't been long since he was in that cedar there when he jumped the yellow pup was in the way and got killed my horse just managed to jump clear of the big lion and as it was nearly broke his leg emmett examined the leg and pronounced it badly strained and advised jim to lead the horse back to camp jones and i stood a moment over the remains of the yellow pup and presently emmett joined us he was the most playful one of the pack said emmett and then he placed the limp bloody body in a crack and laid several slabs of stone over it hurry after the other hound said jim that lion will kill them one by one and look out for him if we needed an incentive the danger threatening the hounds furnished one but i calculated the death of the pup was enough emmett had a flare in his eye jones looked darker and more grim than ever and i had sensations that boded ill to old sultan fellows i said i've been down this place and i know where the old brute has gone so come on i laid aside my coat chaps and rifle feeling that the business ahead was stern and difficult then i faced the canyon down slopes among rocks under pinions around yellow walls along slides the two big men followed me with heavy steps we reached the white stream bed and sliding slipping jumping always down and down we came at last within sound of the hounds we found them baying wildly under a pinion on the brink of the deep cove then at once we saw old sultan close at hand he was of immense size his color was almost gray his head huge his paws heavy and round he did not spit nor snarl nor growl he did not look at the hounds but kept his half-shut eyes upon us 
we had no time to make a move before he left his perch and hit the ground with a thud he walked by the baying hounds looked over the brink of the cove and without an instant of hesitation leaped down the rattling crash of sliding stones came up with a cloud of dust then we saw him leisurely picking his way among the rough stones exclamations from the three of us attested to what we thought of that leap look the place over called jones i think we've got him the cove was a hole hollowed out by running water at its head where the perpendicular wall curved the height was not less than forty feet the walls became higher as the cove deepened towards the canyon it had a length of perhaps a hundred yards and a width of perhaps half as many the floor was mass on mass of splintered rock let the hounds down on a lasso said jones easier said than done sounder ranger jude refused old mose grumbled and broke away but don stern and savage allowed jones to tie him in a slip noose it's a shame to send that grand hound to his death protested emmett we'll all go down declared jones we can't one will have to stay up here to help the other two out replied emmett you're the strongest you stay up said jones better work along the wall and see if you can locate the lion we let don down into the hole he kicked himself loose before reaching the bottom and then yelping he went out of sight among the boulders mose as if ashamed came whining to us we slipped a noose around him and lowered him kicking and barking to the rocky floor jones made the lasso fast to a cedar root and i slid down like a flash burning my hands jones swung himself over wrapped his leg around the rope and came down to hit the ground with a thump then lassos in hands we began clambering over the broken fragments for a few moments we were lost to sights and sounds away from our immediate vicinity the bottom of the cove afforded hard going dead pinions and cedars blocked our way the great jagged stones offered no passage we crawled climbed and jumped from piece to piece a yell from emmett halted us we saw him above on the extreme point of wall waving his arms he yelled unintelligible commands to us the fierce baying of don and mose added to our desperate energy the last jumble of splintered rock cleared we faced a terrible and wonderful scene look look i gasped to jones a wide bare strip of stone lay a few yards beneath us and in the center of this last step sat the great lion on his haunches with his long tail lashing out over the precipice back to the canyon he confronted the furious hounds his demeanor had changed to one of savage apprehension when jones and i appeared old sultan abruptly turned his back to the hounds and looked down into the canyon he walked the whole length of the bare rock with his head stretched over he was looking for a niche or a step whereby he might again elude his foes faster lashed his tail farther and farther stretched his neck he stopped and with head bent so far over the abyss that it seemed he must fall he looked and looked how grandly he fitted the savage sublimity of that place the tremendous purple canyon depths lay beneath him he stood on the last step of his mighty throne the great downward slopes had failed him majestically and slowly he turned from the deep that offered no hope as he turned jones cast the noose of his lasso perfectly round the burly neck sultan roared and worked his jaws but he did not leap jones must have expected such a move for he fastened his rope to a spur of rock standing there revolver gripped hearing the baying hounds the roaring lion and jones yells mingled with emmett's i had no idea what to do i was in a trance of sensations old sultan ran rather than leaped at us jones evaded the rush by falling behind a stone but still did not get out of danger don flew at the lion's neck and mose buried his teeth in a flank then the three rolled on the rock dangerously near the verge bellowing jones grasped the lasso and pulled still holding my revolver i leaped to his assistance and together we pulled and jerked 
Don got away from the lion with remarkable quickness, but Mose, slow and dogged, could not elude the outstretched paws, which fastened in his side and leg. We pulled so hard we slowly raised the lion. Mose, never whimpering, clawed and scratched at the rock in his efforts to escape. The lion's red tongue protruded from his dripping jaws. We heard the rend of hide as our efforts, combined with those of Moe's, loosed him from the great yellow claws. The lion, whirling and wrestling, rolled over the precipice. When the rope straightened with a twang, had it not been fastened to the rock, Jones and I would have jerked over the wall. The shock threw us to our knees. For a moment we did not realize the situation. Emmett's yells awakened us. "'Pull! Pull! Pull!' roared he. Then, knowing that old Sultan would hang himself in a few moments, we attempted to lift him. Jones pulled till his back cracked. I pulled till I saw red before my eyes. Again and again we tried. We could lift him only a few feet. Soon exhausted, we had to desist altogether. How Emmett roared and raged from his vantage point above, he could see the lion in death throes. Suddenly he quieted down with the words, All over, all over. Then he sat still, looking into space. Jones sat mopping his brow, and I, all my hot resentment vanished, lay on the rock with eyes on the distant mesas. Presently Jones leaned over the verge with my lasso. There, he said, I've roped one of his hind legs. Now we'll pull him up a little, then we'll fasten this rope and pull on the other. So, foot by foot, we worked the heavy lion up over the wall. He must have been dead, though his sides heaved. Don sniffed at him in disdain. Mose, dusty and bloody, with a large strip of hide hanging from his flank, came up growling low and deep, and gave the lion a last vengeful bite. We've been fools, observed Jones meditatively. The excitement of the game made us lose our wits. I'll never rope another lion. I said nothing. While Mose licked his bloody leg and Don lay with his fine head on my knees, Jones began to skin old Sultan. Once more the strange, infinite silence enfolded the canyon. The far-off golden walls glistened in the sun. Farther down, the purple clefts smoked. The many-hued peaks and mesas, aloof from each other, rose out of the depths. It was a grand and gloomy scene of ruin, where every glistening descent of rock was but a page of earth's history. It brought to my mind a faint appreciation of what time really meant. It spoke of an age of former men. It showed me the lonesome crags of eagles and the cliff lairs of lions, and it taught mutely, eloquently, a lesson of life, that men are still savage, still driven by a spirit to roam, to hunt, and to slay. End of chapter 3, part 14 Chapter 4 of Tales of Lonely Trails by Zane Grey. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 4 Tonto Basin, Part 1. The start of a camping trip, the getting of a big outfit together and packed and on the move, is always a difficult and laborsome job. Nevertheless, for me, the preparation and the actual getting under way have always been matters of thrilling interest. This start of my hunt in Arizona, September 24, 1918, was particularly momentous because I had brought my boy Romer with me for his first trip into the wilds. It may be that the boy was too young for such an undertaking. His mother feared he would be injured, his teachers presaged his utter ruin, his old nurse, with whom he waged war until he was free of her, averred that the best it could do for him would be to show what kind of stuff he was made of. His uncle R.C. was stoutly in favor of taking him. I believe the balance fell in Romer's favor when I remembered my own boyhood. As a youngster of three, I had babbled of bars and buffers, and woven fantastic and marvelous tales of fiction about my imagined adventures, a habit, alas, I have never yet outgrown. Anyway, we only made six miles travel on this September 24th, and Romer was with us. Indeed, he was omnipresent. 
his keen eager joy communicated itself to me once he rode up alongside me and said dad this is great but i'd rather do like buck duane the boy had read all of my books in spite of parents and teachers and he knew them by heart and invariably liked the outlaws and gunmen best of all we made camp at sunset with a flare of gold along the west and the peaks rising rosy and clear to the north we camped in a cut-over pine forest where stumps and lopped tops and burned deadfalls made an aspect of blackened desolation from a distance however the scene was superb at sunset there was a faint wind which soon died away my old guide on so many trips across the painted desert was in charge of the outfit he was a wiry gray old pioneer over seventy years hollow-cheeked and bronzed with blue-gray eyes still keen with fire he was no longer robust but he was tireless and willing when he told a story he always began in the early days his son lee had charge of the horses of which we had fourteen two teams and ten saddle horses lee was a typical westerner of many occupations cowboy rider rancher cattleman he was small thin supple quick tough and strong he had a bronzed face always chap a hooked nose gray-blue eyes like his father's sharp and keen lee had engaged the only man he could find for a cook joe isbel a tall lithe cowboy straight as an indian with powerful shoulders round limbs and slender waist and isbel was what the westerners called a bronco buster he was a prize-winning rider at all the rodeos indeed his seat in the saddle was individual and incomparable he had a rough red-blue face hard and rugged like the rocks he rode over so fearlessly and his eyes were bright hazel steady and hard isbel's vernacular was significant speaking of one of our horses he said like a mule he'll be your friend for twenty years to get a chance to kick you speaking of another that had to be shod he said sure he'll step high tomorrow isbel appeared to be remarkably efficient as camp rustler and cook but he did not inspire me with confidence in speaking of this to the doyles i found them non-committal on the subject westerners have sensitive feelings i could not tell whether they were offended or not and i half regretted mentioning my lack of confidence in isbel as it turned out however i was amply justified sievert nilsen whom i have mentioned elsewhere was the fourth of my men darkness had enveloped us at supper-time i was tired out but the red embered camp-fire the cool air the smell of wood smoke and the white stars kept me awake a while romer had to be put to bed he was wild with excitement we had had a sleeping bag we had had a sleeping bag made for him so that once snugly in it with the flaps tucked in he could not kick off the blankets when we got him into it he quieted down and took exceeding interest in his first bed in the open he did not however go quickly to sleep presently he called r c over and whispered say uncle rome i coiled a lasso and put it under nielsen's bed when he's asleep you go pull it he's tenderfoot like dad was he'll think it's a rattlesnake this trick romer must have remembered from reading the last of the plainsmen where i related what buffalo jones cowboys did to me once romer got that secret off his mind he fell asleep the hour we spent sitting around the campfire was the most pleasant of that night though i did not know it then the smell of wood smoke and the glow of live coals stirred memories of other campfires. I was once more enveloped by the sweetness and peace of the open, listening to the sigh of the wind and the faint tinkle of bells on the hobbled horses. An uncomfortable night, indeed, it turned out to be. Our covers were scanty and did not number among them any blankets. The bed was hard as a rock and lumpy. No sleep as the night wore on the air grew colder and i could not keep warm at four a m i heard the howling of coyotes a thrilling and well-remembered wild chorus after that perfect stillness reigned presently i saw the morning star big blue-white beautiful uncomfortable hours seemed well spent if the reward was sight of the morning star how few people ever see it how very few ever get a glimpse of it on a desert dawn 
Just then, about five-thirty, Romer woke up and yelled lustily, "'Dad, my nose is frozen!' This was a signal for me to laugh, and also to rise heroically. Not difficult, because I wanted to stay in bed, but because I could hardly crawl out. Soon we had a fire roaring. At six the dawn was still gray. Cold and nipping air, frost on everything, pale stars, a gold-red light in the east, were proofs that I was again in the open. Soon a rose-colored flush beautified the peaks. After breakfast we had trouble with the horses. This always happened, but it was made worse this morning because a young cowboy who happened along took upon himself the task of helping Lee. I suspected he wanted to show off a little. In throwing his lasso to rope one, the noose went over the heads of two. Then he tried to hold both animals. They dragged him, pulled the lasso out of his hands, and stampeded the other horses. These two, roped together, thundered off with the noose widening. I was afraid they would split round a tree or stump, but fortunately the noose fell off one. As all the horses pounded off, I heard Romer remark to Isbel, "'Say, Joe, I don't see any medals on that cowboy.' Isbel roared and said, "'Well, Romer, you sure hit the nail on the head.' Owing to that stampede, we did not get saddled and started till eleven o'clock. At first I was so sore and stiff from the hard bed that I rode a while on the wagon with Doyle. Many a mile I had ridden with him, and many a story he had related. This time he told about sitting on a jury at Prescott, where they brought in as evidence bloody shirts, overalls, guns, knives, until there was such a pile that the table would not hold them. Doyle was a mine of memories of the early days. Romer's mount was a little black, white-spotted horse named Rye. Lee Doyle had scoured the ranches to get this pony for the youngster. Rye was small for a horse, about the size of an Indian mustang, and he was gentle as well as strong and fast. Romer had been given riding lessons all that summer in the east, and upon his arrival at Flagstaff he informed me that he could ride. I predicted he would be in the wagon before noon of the second day out. He offered to bet on it. I told him I disapproved of betting. He seemed to me to be daring, adaptable, self-willed, and I was divided between pride and anxiety as to the outcome of this trip for him. In the afternoon we reached Lake Mary, a long, ugly, muddy pond in a valley between pine slopes. Dead and ghastly trees stood in the water, and the shores were cattle-tracked. Probably to the ranchers this mud hole was a pleasing picture, but to me, who loved the beauty of the desert before its productiveness, it was hideous. When we passed Lake Mary, and farther on, the last of the cut-over timberland, we began to get into wonderful country. We traveled about sixteen miles, rather a small day's ride. Romer stayed on his horse all through that ride, and when we selected a campsite for the night, he said to me, "Well." you're lucky you wouldn't bet. Camp that evening was in a valley with stately pines straggling down to the level. On the other slope the pines came down in groups. The rim of this opposite slope was high, rugged, iron-colored, with cracks and holes. Before supper I walked up the slope back of our camp to come upon level rocky ground for a mile, then pines again leading to a low green mountain with lighter patches of aspen. The level open strip was gray in color, Arizona color and Arizona country. Gray of sage, rocks, pines, cedars, pinions, heights and depths and plains, wild and open and lonely. That was Arizona. That night I obtained some rest and sleep, lying awake only a few hours, during which time I turned from side to side to find a soft place in the hard bed. Under such circumstances I always thought of the hard beds of the Greeks and the Spartans. Next day we rode twenty-three miles. On horseback trips like this it was every one for himself. Sometimes we would be spread out, all separated. At others we would be bunched, and again we would ride in couples. The morning was an ordeal for me, as at first I could scarcely sit my saddle. In the afternoon, however, riding grew to be less severe. The road led through a winding shallow valley with clumps of pine here and there, and cedars on the slopes. 
Romer rode all the way, half the time with his feet out of the stirrups, like a western boy born to the saddle, and he wanted to go fast all the time. Camp was made at a place called Fulton Spring. It might have been a spring once, but now it was a mud hole with a dead cow lying in it. Clear cold water is necessary to my pleasure, if not to my health. I have lived on sheep water, the water holes being tainted by sheep, and alkali water and soapy water of the desert, but never happily. How I hailed the clear, cold, whiffly flowing springs! This third camp lay in a woods where the pines were beautiful and the silence noticeable. Upon asking Romer to enumerate the things I had called to his attention, the few times I could catch up with him on the day's journey, he promptly replied, two big spiders, tarantulas, a hawk, and Mormon Lake. This lake was another snow-melted mud hole, said to contain fish. I doubted that. Perhaps the little bullhead catfish might survive in such muddy water, but I did not believe bass or perch could. One familiar feature of Arizona travel manifested itself to me that day, the dry air. My nails became brittle and my lips began to crack. I have had my lips cracked so severely that when I tried to bite bread they would split and bleed and hurt so that I could not eat. This matter of sore lips was for long a painful matter. I tried many remedies and finally found one, camphor ice, that would prevent the drying and cracking. Next day at dawn the forest was full of the soughing of wind in the pines. A wind that presaged storm. No stars showed. Romer boy piled out at six o'clock. I had to follow him. The sky was dark and cloudy. Only a faint light showed in the east, and it was just light enough to see when we ate breakfast. Owing to strayed horses, we did not get started till after nine o'clock. Five miles through the woods, gradually descending, led us into an open plain where there was a grass-bordered pond full of ducks. Here appeared an opportunity to get some meat. R.C. tried with shotgun and I with rifle, all to no avail. These ducks were shy. Romer seemed to evince some disdain at our failure, but he did not voice his feelings. We found some wild turkey tracks and a few feathers, which put our hopes high. Crossing the open ground, we again entered the forest, which gradually grew thicker as we got down to a lower altitude oak trees began to show in swales, and then we soon began to see squirrels, big, plump, gray fellows, with bushy tails almost silver. They appeared wilder than we would have suspected at that distance from the settlements. Romer was eager to hunt them, and with his usual persistence succeeded at length in persuading his uncle to do so. To that end we rode out far ahead of the wagon and horses. Lee had a yellow dog he called Pups, a close-haired, keen-eyed, muscular canine to which I had taken a dislike. To be fair to Pups I had no reason except that he barked all the time. Pups and his barking were destined to make me hail them both with admiration and respect, but I had no idea of that then now this dog of lee's would run ahead of us trail squirrels chase them and tree them whereupon he would bark vociferously sometimes up in the bushy top we would fail to spy the squirrel but we had no doubt one was there romer wasted many and many a cartridge of the twenty two winchester trying to hit a squirrel he had practiced a good deal, and was a fairly good shot for a youngster, but hitting a little gray ball of fur high on a tree, or waving at the tip of a branch, was no easy matter. "'Son,' I said, "'you don't take after your dad.' And his uncle tried the lad's temper by teasing him about Wetzel. Now Wetzel, the great Indian killer of frontier days, was Romer's favorite hero. "'Give me the twenty-gauge.' finally cried Romer in desperation, with his eyes flashing. Whereupon his uncle handed him the shotgun with a word of caution as to the trigger. This particular squirrel was pretty high up, presenting no easy target. Romer stood almost directly under it, raised the gun nearly straight up, waved and wobbled and hesitated, and finally fired. Down sailed the squirrel to hit with a plump. That was Romer's first successful hunting experience. 
how proud he was of that gray squirrel i suffered a pang to see the boy so radiant so full of fire at the killing of a beautiful creature of the woods then again i remembered my own first sensations boys are bloodthirsty little savages in their hunting playing even their reading some element of the wild brute instinct dominates them they are worthy descendants of progenitors who had to fight and kill to live this incident furnished me much food for reflection i foresaw that before this trip was ended i must face some knotty problems i hated to shoot a squirrel even when i was hungry probably that was because i was not hungry enough a starving man suffers no compunctions at the spilling of blood on the contrary he revels in it with a fierce primitive joy some shot i'll say declared romer to his uncle loftily and he said to me half a dozen times say dad wasn't it a grand peg but toward the end of that afternoon his enthusiasm waned for shooting for anything especially riding he kept asking when the wagon was going to stop once he yelled out here's a peach of a place to camp then i asked him romer are you tired nah but what's the use riding till dark at length he had to give up and be put on the wagon the moment was tragic for him soon however he brightened at something doyle told him and began to ply the old pioneer with rapid-fire questions we pitched camp in an open flat gray and red with short grass and sheltered by towering pines on one side under these we set up our tents the mat of pine needles was half a foot thick soft and springy and fragrant the woods appeared full of slanting rays of golden sunlight this day we had supper over before sunset romer showed no effects from his long hard ride first he wanted to cook then he fooled around the fire bothering isbel i had a hard time to manage him he wanted to be eternally active he teased and begged to go hunting then he compromised on target practice r c and i however were too tired and we preferred to rest beside the campfire look here kid said r c save something for tomorrow in disgust romer replied well i suppose if a flock of antelope came along here you wouldn't move you and dad are great hunters i don't think after the lad had gone over to the other men r c turned to me and said reflectively does he remind you of us when we were little to which i replied with emotion in him i live over again that is one of the beautiful things about children so full of pathos and some strange stinging joy they bring back the days that are no more this evening despite my fatigue i was the last one to stay up my seat was most comfortable consisting of thick folds of blankets against a log how the wind mourned in the trees how the campfire sparkled glowed red and white sometimes it seemed full of blazing opals always it held faces and stories more stories than i can ever tell once i was stirred and inspired by the beautiful effect of the pine trees in outline against the starry sky when the campfire blazed up the color of the foliage seemed indescribably blue-green something never seen by day every line shone bright graceful curved rounded and all thrown with sharp relief against the sky how magical exquisitely delicate and fanciful the great trunks were soft serrated brown and the gnarled branches stood out in perfect proportions all works of art must be copied of nature next morning early while romer slept and the men had just begun to stir i went apart from the camp out into the woods all seemed solemn and still and cool with the aisles of the forest brown and green and gold i heard an owl perhaps belated in his nocturnal habit then to my surprise i heard wild canaries they were flying high and to the south going to their winter quarters i wandered around among big gray rocks and windfalls and clumps of young oak and majestic pines more than one saucy red squirrel chattered at me when i returned to camp my comrades were at breakfast romer appeared vastly relieved to see that i had not taken a gun with me 
This morning we got an early start. We rode for hours through a beautiful shady forest where a fragrant breeze in our faces made riding pleasant. Large oaks and patches of sumac appeared on the rocky slopes. We descended a good deal in this morning's travel, and the air grew appreciably warmer. The smell of pine was thick and fragrant. The sound of wind was sweet and soughing. Everywhere pine needles dropped, shining in the sunlight like thin slants of rain. Only once or twice did I see Romer in all these morning hours. Then he was out in front with the cowboy Isbel, riding his black pony over all the logs and washes he could find. I could see his feet sticking straight out almost even with his saddle. He did not appear to need stirrups. My fears gradually lessened. During the afternoon the ride grew hot and very dusty. We came to a long open valley where the dust lay several inches thick. It had been an unusually dry summer and fall. In fact, that presaged poor luck for our hunting, and the washes and stream beds were bleached white. We came to two water holes, tanks the Arizonians called them, and they were vile mud holes with green scum on the water. The horses drank, but I would have had to be far gone from thirst before I would have slaked mine there we faced west with the hot sun beating on us and the dust rising in clouds no wonder that ride was interminably long at last we descended a canyon and decided to camp in a level spot where several ravines met in one of which a tiny stream of deer water oozed out of the gravel the enclosure was rocky sloped full of caves and covered with pines and the best i could say for it was that in case of storm the camp would be well protected we shoveled out a deep hole in the gravel so that it would fill up with water romer had evidently enjoyed himself this day when i asked isbel about him the cowboy's hard face gleamed with a smile sure that kid's all right he'll make a cowpuncher his remark pleased me in view of Romer's determination to emulate the worst bandit I ever wrote about, I was tremendously glad to think of him as a cowboy. But as for myself, I was tired, and the ride had been rather unprofitable, and this campsite, to say the least, did not inspire me. It was neither wild nor beautiful nor comfortable. I went early to bed and slept like a log. The following morning some of our horses were lost. The men hunted from daylight till ten o'clock, then it was that I learned more about Lee's dog pups. At ten-thirty, Lee came in with the lost horses. They had hidden in a clump of cedars and remained perfectly quiet, as cute as deer. Lee put pups on their trail. Pups was a horse-trailing dog, and he soon found them. I had a change of feeling for pups, then and there. The sun was high and hot when we rode off. The pleasant and dusty stretches alternated. About one o'clock we halted on the edge of a deep wooded ravine to take our usual noonday rest. I scouted along the edge, in the hope of finding game of some kind. Presently I heard the cluck-cluck of turkeys. Slipping along to an open space, I peered down to be thrilled by sight of four good-sized turkeys. They were walking along the open strip of dry stream bed at the bottom of the ravine one was chasing grasshoppers they were fairly close i took aim at one and thought i could have hit him but suddenly i remembered romer and r c so i slipped back and called them hurriedly and stealthily we returned to the spot where i had seen the turkeys romer had a pale face and wonderfully bright eyes his actions resembled those of a stalking indian the turkeys were farther down but still in plain sight I told R.C. to take the boy and slip down and run and hide and run until they got close enough for a shot. I would keep to the edge of the ravine. Some moments later I saw R.C. and the boy running and stooping and creeping along the bottom of the ravine. Then I ran myself to reach a point opposite the turkeys so in case they flew uphill I might get a shot. But I did not see them and nothing happened. I lost sight of the turkeys. Hurrying back to where I had tied my horse, I mounted him and loped ahead, and came out upon the ravine some distance above. Here I hunted it around for a little while. Once I heard the report of the twenty-gauge, and then several rifle shots. Upon returning I found that Lee and Nielsen had wasted some shells. R.C. and Romer came wagging up the hill, 
both red and wet and tired. R.C. carried a small turkey about the size of a chicken. He told me, between pants, that they chased the four large turkeys and were just about to get a shot when up jumped a hen turkey with a flock of young ones. They ran every way. He got one. Then he told me, between more pants and some laughs, that Romer had chased the little turkeys all over the ravine, almost catching several. Romer said for himself, I just almost pulled feathers out of their tails. Gee, if I'd had a gun! We resumed our journey. About the middle of the afternoon, Doyle called my attention to an opening in the forest through which I could see the yellow-walled rim of the mesa and the great blue void below. Arizona! That explained the black forests, the red and yellow cliffs of rock, the gray cedars, the heights and depths. Lope ride indeed was it down off the mesa. The road was winding, rough, full of loose rocks and dusty. We were all tired out trying to keep up with the wagon. Romer, however, averred time and again that he was not tired. Still I saw him often shift his seat from one side of the saddle to the other. At last we descended to a comparative level and came to a little hamlet. Like all Mormon villages it had quaint log cabins, low stone houses, an irrigation ditch running at the side of the road orchards, and many rosy-cheeked children. We lingered there long enough to rest a little and drink our fill of the cold granite water. I would travel out of my way to get a drink of water that came from granite rock. About five o'clock we left for the natural bridge. Romer invited, or rather taunted, me to a race. When it ended in his victory, I found that I had jolted my rifle out of its saddle sheath. I went back some distance to look for it, but did so in vain. Isbel said he would ride back in the morning and find it. The country here appeared to be on a vast scale, but that was only because we had gotten out where we could see all around. Arizona is all on a grand, vast scale. Mountain ranges stood up to the south and east. North loomed up the lofty, steep rim of the Mogollon Mesa, with its cliffs of yellow and red, and its black line of timber westward lay fold on fold of low cedar-covered hills the valley appeared a kind of magnificent bowl rough and wild with the distance lost in blue haze the vegetation was dense and rather low i saw both prickly pear and mescal cactus cedars manzanita brush scrub oak and juniper trees these last named were very beautiful, especially the smaller ones with their gray-green foliage and purple berries and black and white checkered bark. There were no pine trees. Since we had left the rim above, the character of plant life had changed. We crossed the plateau leading to the valley where the natural bridge was located. A winding road descended the east side of this valley. A rancher lived down there green of alfalfa and orchard and walnut trees contrasted vividly with a bare gray slope on one side and a red rugged mountain on the other a deep gorge showed dark and wild at length just after sunset we reached the ranch and rode through orchards of peach and pear and apple trees all colored with fruit and down through grassy meadows to a walnut grove where we pitched camp by the time we had supper it was dark wonderful stars thick dreamy hum of insects murmur of swift water a rosy and golden afterglow on the notch of the mountain range to the west these were inducements to stay up but i was so tired i had to go to bed where my eyelids fell tight as if pleasantly weighted after the long hard rides and the barren campsites what delight to awaken in this beautiful valley with the morning cool and breezy and bright with smell of new-mown hay from the green and purple alfalfa fields and the sunlight gilding the jagged crags above romer made a bee-line for the peach trees he beat his daddy only a few yards this kind rancher had visited us the night before and he had told us to help ourselves to fruit melons alfalfa needless to state that i made my breakfast on peaches i trailed the swift murmuring stream to its source on the dark green slope where there opened up a big hole bordered by watercress long grass and fragrant mint this spring was one of perfectly clear water six feet deep 
boiling up to bulge on the surface a grass of dark color and bunches of light green plant grew under the surface bees and blue dragonflies hummed around and frogs as green as the grass blinked with jeweled eyes from the wet margins the spring had a large volume that spilled over its borders with low hollow gurgle with fresh cool splash the water was soft tasting of limestone here was the secret of the verdure and fragrance and color and beauty and life of the oasis it was also the secret of the formation of the wonderful natural bridge part of the rancher's cultivated land to the extent of several acres was the level top of this strange bridge a meadow of alfalfa and a fine vineyard in the air like the hanging gardens of babylon the natural bridge spanned a deep gorge at the bottom of which flowed a swift stream of water geologically this tremendous arch of limestone cannot be so very old in comparatively recent times an earthquake or some other seismic disturbance or some other natural force caused a spring of water to burst from the slope above the gorge it ran down of course over the rim the lime salt in the water was deposited and year by year and age by age advanced toward the opposite side until a bridge crossed the gorge the swift stream at the bottom kept the opening clear under the bridge a winding trail led deep down on the lower side of this wonderful natural span it showed the cliffs of limestone porous craggy broken chalky at the bottom the gorge was full of tremendous boulders water-worn ledges sycamore and juniper trees red and yellow flowers and dark beautiful green pools i espied tiny gray frogs reminding me of those i found in the gulches of the grand canyon many huge black beetles some alive but most of them dead lined the wet borders of the pools a species of fish that resembled mullet lay in the shadow of the rocks from underneath the natural bridge showed to advantage and if not magnificent like the grand nonazoche of utah it was at least striking and beautiful it had a rounded ceiling colored gray yellow green bronze purple white making a crude and scalloped mosaic water dripped from it like a rain of heavy scattered drops the left side was driest and large dark caves opened up one above the other the upper being so high that it was dangerous to attempt reaching it the right hand was slippery and wet all rocks were thickly encrusted with lime salt doyle told us that any object left under the ceaseless drip drip of the lime water would soon become encrusted and heavy as stone the upper opening of the arch was made higher and smaller than the lower any noise gave forth strange and sepulchral echoes romer certainly made the welkin ring a streak of sunlight shone through a small hole in the thinnest part of the roof doyle pointed out the high cave where indians had once lived showing the markings of their fire also he told a story of apaches being driven into the highest cave from which they had never escaped this tale was manifestly to romer's liking and i had to use force to keep him from risking his neck a very strong breeze blew under the arch when we rolled a boulder into the large dark pool it gave forth a hollow boom 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 growing hollower the deeper it went i tried to interest romer in some bat nests in crevices high up but the boy wanted to roll stones and fish for the mullet when we climbed out and were once more on a level i asked him what he thought of the place some hole i'll say he panted breathlessly the rancher told me that the summer rains began there about july and the snows about the first of the year snow never lay long on the lower slopes apaches had lived there forty years ago and had cultivated the soil there was gold in the mountains of the four peaks range in this shadowed nook the weather was never severely cold or hot and i judged from the quaint talk of the rancher's wife that life there was always afternoon next day we rode from natural bridge to payson in four and a half hours payson appeared to be an old hamlet retaining many frontier characteristics such as old board and stone houses with high fronts hitching posts and pumps on sidewalks and one street so wide that it resembled a mexican plaza 
Payson contained two stores, where I hoped to buy a rifle, and hoped in vain. I had not recovered my lost gun, and when night came my prospects of anything to hunt with appeared extremely slim. But we had visitors, and one of them was a stalwart, dark-skinned rider named Copple, who introduced himself by saying he would have come a good way to meet the writer of certain books he had profited by when he learned of the loss of my rifle and that i could not purchase one anywhere he pressed upon me his own i refused with thanks but he would not take no the upshot of it was that he lent me his thirty-odd government winchester and gave me several boxes of ammunition also he presented me with a cowhide lasso whereupon romer boy took a shine to copple at once say you look like an indian he declared with a laugh copple replied i am part indian sonny manifestly that settled his status with romer for he piped up so's dad part indian you'd better come a huntin with us we had for next day to look forward to the longest and hardest ride of the journey in and in order to make it and reach a good camping site i got up at three o'clock in the morning to rout everybody out it was pitch dark until we kindled fires then everybody rustled to such purpose that we were ready to start before dawn and had to wait a little for light enough to see where we were going this procedure tickled romer immensely i believed he imagined he was in a pioneer caravan the gray breaking of dawn the coming of brighter light the rose and silver of the rising sun and the riding in its face with the air so tangy and nipping were circumstances that inspired me as the adventurous start pleased romer the brush and cactus lined road was rough up hill and down with ever-increasing indications that it was seldom used from the tops of high points i could see black foothills round cone-shaped flat-topped all leading the gaze toward the great yellow and red wall of the mesa with its fringed borderline wild and beckoning we walked our horses trotted loped and repeated the order over and over hour by hour mile after mile under a sun that burned our faces and through choking dust the washes and stream beds were bleached and dry the brush was sere and yellow and dust laden the mescal stalks seemed withered by hot blasts only the manzanita looked fresh that smooth red-branched and glistening green-leafed plant of the desert apparently flourished without rain on all sides the evidence of extreme drought proved the year to be the dreaded ano seco of the mexicans for ten hours we rode without a halt before there was any prominent change in the weary up and down hill going in the heat and dust and brush-walled road but about the middle of the afternoon we reached the summit of the longest hill from which we saw ahead of us a cut-up country wild and rugged and beautiful with pine-sloped canyon at our feet we heard the faint murmur of running water hot dusty wet with sweat and thirsty as sheep we piled down that steep slope as fast as we dared our horses did not need urging at the bottom we plunged into a swift stream of clear cold water granite water to drink of which and to bathe hot heads and burning feet was a joy only known to the weary traveller of the desert romer yelled that the water was like that at our home in the mountains of pennsylvania and he drank till i thought he would burst and then i had to hold him to keep him from wallowing in it here we entered a pine forest heat and dust stayed with us and the aches and pains likewise but the worst of them lay behind every mile grew shadier clearer cooler nielsen happened to fall in and ride beside me for several miles as was often his wont the drink of water stirred him to an homeric recital of one of his desert trips in sonora at the end of which almost dead of thirst he had suddenly come upon such a stream as the one we had just passed then he told me about his trips down the west coast of sonora along the gulf where he travelled at night at low tide so that by daytime his footprints would be washed out this was the land of the Siri indians 
Undoubtedly these Indians were cannibals. I had read considerable about them, much of which ridiculed the rumors of their cannibalistic traits. This, of course, had been of exceeding interest to me, because some day I meant to go to the land of the series. But not until 1918 did I get really authentic data concerning them professor bailey of the university of california told me he had years before made two trips to the gulf and found the series to be the lowest order of savages he knew of he was positive that under favorable circumstances they would practice cannibalism nielsen made four trips down there he claimed the series were an ugly tribe in winter they lived on Tiburon Island, off which boats anchored on occasions, and crews and fishermen and adventurers went ashore to barter with the Indians. These travelers did not see the worst of the series. In summer they ranged up the mainland, and they go naked. They do not want gold discovered down there. They will fight prospectors. They use arrows and attack at dawn. Also they poison the water holes. Nielsen told of some men who were massacred by Ceres on the mainland opposite Tiburon Island. One man who had gone away from camp returned to hear the attack upon his companions. He escaped and made his way to Guaymas. Procuring assistance, this man returned to the scene of the massacre, only to find stakes in the sand, with deep trails tramped around them, and blackened remains of fires and bones everywhere. Nielsen went on to say that once from a hiding place he had watched Ceres tear up and devour a dead turtle that he afterwards ascertained was putrid. He said these Ceres were the greatest runners of all desert savages. The best of them could outrun a horse. One Ceri, a giant seven feet tall, could outrun a deer and break its neck with his hands. These statements of Nielsen's were remarkable, and personally I believe them men of his stamp were honest and they had opportunities to learn strange and terrible facts in nature the great naturalist darwin made rather stronger claims for the barbarism of the savages of terra del fuego nielsen pursuing his theme told me how he had seen with his own eyes and they were certainly sharp and intelligent yaqui indians leap on the bare backs of wild horses and locking their legs stick there in spite of the mad plunges and pitches the gauchos of the Patagonian Pampas were famous for that feat of horsemanship. I asked Joe Isbell what he thought of such riding, and he said, Wow, well, I can ride a wild steer bareback, but excuse me from tackling a buck and bronc without saddle and stirrups. This, coming from the acknowledged champion horseman of the Southwest, was assuredly significant. At five o'clock we came to the end of the road it led to a forest glade overlooking the stream we had followed and that was as far as our wagon could go the glade shone red with sumac and surrounded by tall pines with a rocky and shady glen below it appeared a delightful place to camp as i was about to unsaddle my horse i heard the cluck cluck of turkeys pulling out my borrowed rifle and calling romer i ran to the edge of the glade the shady swift stream ran fifty feet or so below me across it i saw into the woods where shade and gray rock and colored brush mingled again i heard the turkeys cluck look hard son i whispered they're close r c came slipping along below us with his rifle ready suddenly romer stiffened then pointed there dad there i saw two gobblers wade into the brook not more than a hundred and fifty feet away drawing down with fine aim i fired the bullet splashed water all over the turkeys one with a loud whir of wings flew away the other leaped across the brook and ran swift as a deer right up the slope as i tried to get the sight on him i heard other turkeys fly and the crack crack of r c s gun i shot twice at my running turkey and all i did was to scatter the dirt over him and make him run faster r c had not done any better shooting romer wonderful to relate was so excited that he forgot to make fun of our marksmanship we scouted around some but the turkeys had gone by promising to take romer hunting after supper i contrived to get him back to the glade where we made camp end of chapter four part one
Chapter Four of Tales of Lonely Trails by Zane Grey. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Four, Tonto Basin, Part Two. After we had unpacked, and while the men were pitching the tents and getting supper, I took Romer on a hunt up the creek. I was considerably pleased to see good-sized trout in the deeper pools. A little way above camp, the creek forked. As the right-hand branch appeared to be larger and more attractive, we followed its course. Soon the bustle of camp life and the sound of the horses were left far behind. Romer slipped along beside me stealthily as an Indian, all eyes and ears. We had not traveled thus for a quarter of a mile when my quick ear caught the cluck-cluck of turkeys. Listen, I whispered, halting. Romer became like a statue his dark eyes dilating, his nostrils quivering, his whole body strung. He was a Zane, all right. A turkey called again, then another answered. Romer started and nodded his head vehemently. "'Come on now, right behind me,' I whispered. "'Step where I step, and do what I do. Don't break any twigs.' Cautiously we glided up the creek, listening now and then to get the direction, until we came to an open place where we could see some distance up the ridge. The turkey clucks came from across the creek somewhere up this open aisle of the forest. I crawled ahead several rods to a more advantageous point, much pleased to note that Romer kept noiselessly at my heels. Then from behind a stone we peeped out. Almost at once, a turkey flew down from a tree into the open lane. "'Look, Dad,' whispered Romer wildly. "'I had to hold him down. "'That's a hen turkey,' I said. "'See, it's small and dull-colored. "'The gobblers are big, shiny, and they have red on their heads.' Another hen turkey flew down from a rather low height. Then I made out grapevines, and I saw several animated dark patches among them. As I looked, three turkeys flopped down to the ground. One was a gobbler of considerable size, with beautiful white and bronze feathers. Rather suspiciously, he looked down our way. The distance was not more than a hundred yards. I aimed at him, feeling as I did so how Romer quivered beside me, but I had no confidence in Copple's rifle. The sights were wrong for me the stock did not fit me so hoping for a closer and better shot i let this opportunity pass of course i should have taken it the gobbler clucked and began to trot up the ridge with the others after him they were not frightened but they appeared rather suspicious when they disappeared in the woods romer and i got up and hurried in pursuit gee why didn't you peg that gobbler broke out romer breathlessly wasn't he a peach when we reached the top of the ridge, we advanced very cautiously again. Another open place led to a steep rocky hillside with cedars and pines growing somewhat separated. I was disappointed in not seeing the turkeys. Then, in our anxiety and eagerness, we hurried on, not noiselessly by any means. All of a sudden there was a rustle, and then a great whir of wings. Three turkeys flew like grouse away into the woods next i saw the white gobbler running up the rocky hillside at first he was in the open aiming as best i could i waited for him to stop or hesitate but he did neither peg him dad yelled romer the lad was right my best chance i had again forfeited to hit a running wild turkey with a rifle bullet was a feat i had not done so often as to inspire conceit the gobbler was wise too for that matter, all grown gobblers are as wise as old bucks, except in the spring mating season, when it is a crime to hunt them. This one, just as I got a bead on him, always ran behind a rock or tree or shrub. Finally, in desperation, I took a snap shot at him, hitting under him, making him jump. Then, in rapid succession, I fired four more times. I had the satisfaction of seeing where my bullet struck up the dust even though they did go wide of the mark. After my last shot, the gobbler disappeared. "'Well, Dad, you sure throwed the dirt over him,' declared Romer. "'Son, I don't believe I could hit a flock of barns with this gun,' I replied, gazing doubtfully at the old, shiny, wire-wrapped, worn-out Winchester Copple had lent me. I had been told that he was a fine marksman and could drive a nail with it. 
Upon my return to camp, I tried out the rifle carefully with a rest to find that it was not accurate. Moreover, it did not throw the bullets consistently. It shot high, wide, low, and right there I abandoned any further use for it. R.C. tried to make me take his rifle to use on the hunting trip. Nielsen and Lee wanted me to take theirs, but I was disgusted with myself and refused. Thanks, boys, I said. Maybe this will be a lesson to me. We had been up since three o'clock that morning, and the day's travel had been exhausting. I had just enough energy left to scrape up a huge soft pile of pine needles upon which to make our bed. After that all was oblivion until I was awakened by the ringing strokes of Nielsen's axe. The morning, after the sun got up, was exceedingly delightful, and this camp was such a contrast to the others, so pleasant and attractive, that even if we had not arranged to meet Lee Hout and his sons here, I would have stayed a while anyway. Hout was a famed bear hunter who lived in a log cabin somewhere up under the rim of the mesa. While Lee and Nielsen rode off up the trail to find Hout, I gave Romer his first try at rainbow trout the water of the creek was low and clear so that we could see plenty of good-sized trout but they were shy they would not rise readily to any of our flies though i got several strikes we searched under the stones for worms and secured a few whereupon romer threw a baited hook to a trout we plainly saw the trout gobbled it romer had been instructed in the fine art of angling but whenever he got a bite he always forgot science he yanked this ten-inch rainbow right out. Then in another pool he hooked a big fellow that had ideas of his own as well as weight and strength. Romer applied the same strenuous tactics, but this trout nearly pulled Romer off the rock before the line broke. I took occasion then to deliver to the lad a lecture. In reply he said tearfully, I didn't know he was so, so big. When we returned to camp, Hout and his sons were there. Even at a distance, their horses, weapons, and persons satisfied my critical eye. Lee Hout was a tall, spare, superbly built man with square shoulders. He had a brown face with deep lines and sunken cheeks, keen hazel eyes, heavy dark mustache, and hair streaked a little with gray. The only striking features of his apparel were his black sombrero and long spurs. His sons, Ed and George, were young, lean, sallow, still-faced, lanky-legged horsemen with clear gray eyes. They did not appear to be given too much speech. Both were then waiting for the call of the army draft. Looking at them then, feeling the tranquil reserve and latent force of these Arizonians, I reflected that the Germans had failed in their psychology of American character. A few hundred thousand Americans like the Hout boys would have whipped the German army. We held a council. Hout said he would send his son Ed with Doyle and by a long roundabout forest road get the wagon up on the mesa. With his burros and some of our horses packed, we could take part of the outfit up the creek trail, past his cabin, and climb out on the rim, where we would find grass, water, wood, and plenty of game. The idea of permanent camp before sunset that very day inspired us to united and vigorous effort. By noon we had the pack train ready. Ed and Doyle climbed on the wagon to start the other way. Romer waved his hand. Goodbye, Mr. Doyle. Don't break down and lose the apples. Then we were off, up the narrow trail along the creek. Hout led the way. Romer attached himself to the bear hunter, and wherever the trail was wide enough, rode beside him. R.C. and I followed. The other men fell in behind the pack train. The ride was hot, and for the most part all uphill. That basin could be likened to the ribs of a washboard. It was all hills, gorges, ridges, and ravines. The hollows of this exceedingly rough country were thick with pine and oak, the ridges covered with cedar, juniper, and manzanita. The ground, where it was not rocky, was a dry red clay. We passed Hout's log cabin and clearing of a few acres, where I saw fat hogs and cattle. Beyond this point the trail grew more zigzag and steeper and shadier. As we got higher up, the air grew cooler. I noted a change in the timber. The trees grew larger, and other varieties appeared. 
we crossed a roaring brook lined by thick green brush very pleasant to the eye and bronze gold ferns that were beautiful we passed oaks all green and yellow and maple trees wonderfully colored red and cerise then still higher up i espied some silver spruces most exquisite trees of the mountain forests during the latter half of the climb up to the rim i had to attend to the business of riding and walking the trail was rough steep and long once Hout called my attention to a flat stone with a plain trail made by a turtle in past ages when that sandstone was wet sedimentary deposit by and by we reached the last slopes up to the mesa green with yellow crags and cliffs and here and there blazing maples to remind me again that autumn was at hand at last we surmounted the rim from which i saw a scene that defied words it was different from any i had seen before black timbers as far as i could see then i saw a vast bowl enclosed by dim mountain ranges with a rolling floor of forested bridges and dark lines i knew to be canyons for wild rugged beauty i had not seen its equal when the pack train reached the rim we rode on and now through a magnificent forest at eight thousand feet altitude big white and black clouds obscured the sun a thunder shower caught us there was hail and the dry smell of dust and a little cold rain romer would not put on his slicker hout said the drought had been the worst he had seen in twenty years there up in this odorous forest land i could not see where there had been lack of rain the forest appeared thick grassy gold and yellow and green and brown thickets and swales of oaks and aspens were gorgeous in their autumn hues the silver spruces sent down long graceful branches that had to be brushed aside or stooped under as we rode along big gray squirrels with white tails and tufted ears ran up trees to perch on limbs and watch us go by and other squirrels much smaller and darker gray frisked and chattered and scolded at a great rate we passed little depressions that ran down into ravines and these hout informed me were the heads of canyons that sloped away from the rim deepening and widening for miles the rim of the mesa was its highest point except here and there a few elevations like black butte geologically this mesa was an enormous fault like the north rim of the grand canyon during the formation of the earth or the hardening of the crust there had been a crack or slip so that one edge of the crust stood up sheer above the other we passed the heads of leonard canyon gentry and turkey canyons and at last near time of sunset headed down into beautifully colored pine sloped aspen thicketed beaver dam canyon a mile from the rim we were deep in the canyon walled in by rock strewn and pine timbered slopes too steep for a horse to climb there was a little gully on the black soil where there were no evidences of recent water hout said he had never seen beaver dam creek dry until this season we traveled on until we came to a wide open space where three forks of this canyon met and where in the middle of this glade there rose a lengthy wooded bench shaded and beautified by stately pines and silver spruce at this point water appeared in the creek bed flowing in tiny stream that soon gathered volume cold and clear and pure it was all that was needed to make this spot an ideal campsite hout said half a mile below there was a grassy park where the horses would graze with elk we pitched our tents on this bench and i chose for my location a space between two great monarchs of the forest that had surely shaded many an indian encampment at the upper end of the bench rose a knoll golden and green with shrub oaks and russet colored with lichened rocks about all we could manage that evening was to eat and go to bed morning broke cool and bright with heavy dew I got my boots as wet as if I had waded in water. This surprised me, occurring on October 6th and at 8,000 feet altitude, as I had expected frost. Most of this day was spent in making camp. 
unpacking and attending to the many necessary little details that make for comfort in the open to be sure romer worked very spasmodically he spent most of his time on the back of one of hout's burrows chasing and roping another i had not remembered seeing the lad so happily occupied late in the afternoon i slipped off down the canyon alone taking hout's rifle for safety rather than a desire to kill anything by no means was it impossible to meet a bad bear in that forest some distance below camp i entered a ravine and climbed up to the level and soon found myself deep in the fragrant colorful wild forest like coming home again was it to enter that forest of silver-tipped level-spreading spruce and great gnarled massive pines and oak patches of green and gold and maple thickets with shining aspens standing white against the blaze of red and purple high wavy bleached grass brown mats of pine needles gray-green moss waving from the spruces long strands of sunlight all these seemed to welcome me at a distance there was a roar of wind through the forest close at hand only a soft breeze rustling of twigs caused me to compose myself to listen and watch soon small gray squirrels came into view all around me bright-eyed and saucy very curious about this intruder they began to chatter other squirrels were working in the tops of trees for i heard the fall of pine cones then came the screech of blue jays soon they too discovered me the male birds were superb dignified beautiful the color was light blue all over with dark blue head and tufted crest by and by they ceased to scold me and i was left to listen to the wind and to the tiny patter of dropping seeds and needles from the spruces what cool sweet fresh smell this woody leafy earthy dry grassy odorous fragrance dominated by scent of pine how lonesome and restful i felt a sense of deep peace and rest this golden green forest barred with sunlight canopied by the blue sky and melodious with its soughing moan of wind absolutely filled me with content and happiness if a stag or a bear had trotted out into my sight and had showed me no animosity not improbably i would have forgotten my gun more and more as i lived in the open i grew reluctant to kill presently a porcupine waddled along some rods away and unaware of my presence it passed by and climbed a spruce i saw it climb high and finally lost sight of it in searching up and down the spruce i grew alive to what a splendid and beautiful tree it was where so many trees grew it always seemed difficult to single out one and study it this silver spruce was five feet through at the base rugged gray seamed thick all the way to its lofty height its branches were small with a singular feature that they were uniform in shape length and droop most all spruce branches drooped toward the ground that explained why they made such excellent shelters from rain after a hard storm i had seen the ground dry under a thick foliaged spruce many a time had i made a bed under one elk and deer stand under a spruce during a rain unless there is thunder and lightning in forests of high altitude where lightning strikes many trees i have never found or heard of elk and deer being killed this particular spruce was a natural tent in the forest the thick spreading graceful silver plumes extended clear to the top where they were bushiest and rounded out with all the largest branches there each dark gray branch was fringed and festooned with pale green moss like the cypresses of the south suddenly i heard a sharp snapping of twigs and then stealthy light steps an animal of some species was moving in the thicket nearby naturally i sustained a thrill and bethought me of the rifle then i peered keenly into the red rose shadows of the thicket the sun was setting now and though there appeared a clear golden light high in the forest along the ground there were shadows i heard leaves falling rustling tall white aspens stood out of the thicket and two of the large ones bore the old black scars of bear claws i was sure however that no bear hid in the thicket at this moment presently whatever the animal was it pattered lightly away on the far side 
After that I watched the quiver of the aspen leaves. Some were green, some yellow, some gold, but they all had the same wonderful tremor, the silent fluttering that gave them the most exquisite action in nature. The sun set, the forest darkened, reminding me of supper time. So I returned to camp. As I entered the open canyon, Romer Boy espied me. Manifestly he had been watching, and he yelled, Here comes my daddy now. Say, Dad, did you get any pegs? Next morning Hout asked me if I would like to ride along through the woods and probably get a shot at a deer. Romer coaxed so to go that I finally consented. We rode down the canyon and presently came to a wide grassy park enclosed by high green-clad slopes, and features of which appeared to be that the timber on the west slope was mostly pine and on the east slope it was mostly spruce. I could arrive at no certain reason for this, but I thought it must be owing to the snow lying somewhat longer on the east slope the stream here was running with quite a little volume of water our horses were grazing in this park i saw fresh elk tracks made the day before elk were quite abundant through this forest hout informed me and were protected by law a couple of miles down this trail the canyon narrowed losing its park-like dimensions the farther we traveled the more water there was in the stream and more elk deer and turkey tracks in the sand every half mile or so we would come to the mouth of a small intersecting canyon and at length we rode up one of these presently to climb out on top at this distance from the rim the forest was more open than in the vicinity of our camp affording better riding and hunting still the thickets of aspen and young pine were so frequent that seldom could i see ahead more than several hundred yards hout led the way i rode next and romer kept beside me where it was possible to do so there was however no trail how difficult to keep the lad quiet I expected, of course, that Hout would dismount and take me to hunt on foot. After a while I gathered he did not hunt deer except on horseback. He explained that cowboys rounded up cattle in this forest in the spring and fall, and deer were not frightened at sound or sight of a horse. Some of the thrill and interest in the forest subsided for me. I did not like to hunt in a country where cattle ranged, no matter how wild they were. Then, when we came to a forested ridge, bare of grass and smelling of sheep, that robbed the forest of a little more glamour. Mexican sheep herders drove their flocks up this far sometimes. Hout said bear, lion, lynx, and coyote, sometimes the big grey wolves, followed the sheep. Deer, however, hated a sheep-run range. Riding was exceedingly pleasant. The forest was shady, cool, full of sunlight and beauty. Nothing but fire or the lumberman could ever rob it of its beauty, silence, fragrance, and of its temple-like majesty. So provided we did not meet any cattle or sheep, I did not care whether or not we sighted any game. In fact, I would have forgotten we were hunting had not Romer been along. With him continually seeing things, it was difficult to keep from imagining that we were hunting Indians. The Apaches had once lived in this country, Hout informed us, and it was a habit of theirs to burn the grass and fallen leaves over every fall, thus keeping down the underbrush. In this, the Indians showed how nearsighted they were. The future growth of a forest did not concern them. Usually, Indians were better conservationists than white men. We rode across a grove of widely separated stately pines, at the far end of which stood a thicket of young pines and other brush. As we neared this, how suddenly reined in, and in quick and noiseless action he dismounted. Then he jerked his rifle from his saddle sheath, took a couple of forward steps, and leveled it. I was so struck with the rugged and significant picture he made that I did not dismount and did not see any game until after he fired. Then as I tumbled off and got out my rifle, I heard Romer gasping and crying out. A gray streak with a bobbing white end flashed away out of sight to the left. Next I saw a deer bounding through the thicket. Hout fired again. The deer ran so fast that I could not get my sights anywhere near him. 
how it thudded through an opening and an instant later when both he and deer had disappeared he shot the third time presently he returned never could shoot with them open sights no how he said sure i missed that yarling buck when he was a standin why didn't you smoke him up dad why didn't you peg him asked romer with intense regret why i could have knocked him then it was incumbent upon me to confess that the action had appeared to be a little swift well said hout when you see one you want to pile off quick as we rode on romer naively asked me if ever in my life i had seen anything run so fast as that deer we entered another big grove with thin patches of thicket here and there hout said these were good places for deer to lie down relying on their noses to scent danger from windward and on their eyes in the other direction we circled to go round thickets descending somewhat into a swale here hout got off a little to the right romer and i rode up a gentle slope toward a thin line of little pines through which i could see into the pines beyond suddenly up jumped three big gray bucks literally i fell off my horse bounced up and pulled out my rifle one buck was loping in a thicket i could see his broad gray body behind the slender trees i aimed followed him got a bead on him and was just about to pull the trigger when he vanished plunging forward i yelled to hout then romer cried in his shrill treble dad there's a big buck hurry turning i ran back in wild excitement romer was pointing i was just in time to see a gray rump disappear in the green just then hout shot and after that he halloed romer and i went through the thicket working to our left and presently came out into the open forest hout was leading his horse to rome's eager query he replied sure i piled him up two-year-old black-tail buck sure enough he had shot straight this time the buck lay motionless under a pine with one point of his antlers embedded deep in the ground a sleek gray graceful deer he was just beginning to get his winter coat his color was indeed a bluish gray hout hung him up to a branch spread his hind legs and cut him down the middle the hunter's dexterity with a knife made me wonder how many deer he had dressed in his life in the open we lifted the deer upon the saddle of hout's horse and securely tied it there with a lasso then with the hunter on foot leading the way we rode through the forest up the main ridge toward beaver and turkey canyons toward the rim i found the pines and spruces larger and the thickets of aspen denser we passed the heads of many ravines running down to the canyon on either side and these were blazing gold and red in color and so thick i could not see a rod into them about the middle of the afternoon we reached camp with venison hanging up to cool we felt somewhat like real hunters r c had gone off to look for turkeys which enterprise had been unsuccessful upon the following day which was october tenth we started our bear hunting hout's method appeared to me to lack something he sent the hounds down below the rim with george and taking r c and me and leon nielsen he led us over to what he called horton thicket never would i forget my first sight of that immense forest choked canyon it was a great cove running up from the basin into the rim craggy ledges broken ruined tottering and gray slanted down into this abyss the place was so vast that these ledges appeared far apart yet they were many an empire of splintered cliff high up these cracked and stained walls were covered with lichens with little spruces growing in niches and tiny yellow bushes points of crumbling rock were stained gold and russet and bronze below the huge gorge was full of aspens maples spruces a green crimson yellow density of timber apparently impenetrable we were accorded different stations on the ledges all around the cove and instructed to stay there until called by four blasts from a hunting horn my point was so far from our seas across the canyon that i had to use my field glass to see him when i did look he seemed contented lee and nielsen and hout i could not see at all 
finding a comfortable seat if hard rock could ever be that i proceeded to accept my weight for developments one thing was sure even though it were a futile way to hunt it seemed rich in other recompense for me my stand towered above a vast colorful slope down which the wind roared as in a gale how could i ever hear the hounds i watched the storm clouds scudding across the sky once i saw a rare bird a black eagle in magnificent flight and so whatever happened i had my reward in that sight nothing happened for hours and hours i sat there with frequent intermissions away from my hard rocky seat toward the close of afternoon when the wind began to get cold i saw that r c had left his stand he had undoubtedly gone back to camp which was some miles nearer his stand than mine at last i gave up any hope of hearing either the hounds or the horn as the roar of wind had increased once i thought i heard a distant rifle shot so i got on my horse and set out to find camp i was on a promontory the sides of which were indented by long ravines that were impassable except near their heads in fact i had been told there was only one narrow space where it was possible to get off this promontory lucky indeed that i remembered hout telling of this anyway i soon found myself lost in a maze of forested heads of ravines finally i went back to the rim on the west side and then working along i found our horse tracks these i followed with difficulty and after an hour's travel i crossed the narrow neck of the promontory and backtracked myself to camp arriving there at sunset the houts had put up two bear one bear had worked around under one of the great promontories the hounds had gotten on his back trail staying on it until it grew cold then had left it their baying had roused the bear out of his bed and he had showed himself once or twice on the open rock slides hout saw the other bear from the rim this was a big red cinnamon bear asleep under a pine tree on an open slope hout said when the hounds gave tongue on the other trail this red bear awakened sat up and wagged his head slowly he had never been chased by hounds he lay down in his piney bed again the distance was too great for an accurate shot but hout tried anyway with the result that he at least scared the cinnamon off these bears were both thin as they were not the sheep-killing and cow-killing kind their food consisted mainly of mast of acorns and berries but this season there were no berries at all and very few acorns so the bears were not fat when a bear was thin he could always outrun the hounds if he was fat he would get hot and tired enough to climb a tree or mad enough to stop and fight the dogs how told me there were a good many mountain lions and lynx under the rim they lived on elk deer and turkey the lynx were the tuft-eared short-tailed species they would attack and kill a cow elk in winter on the rim the snow sometimes fell fifteen feet deep so that the game wintered underneath snow did not lay long on the sunny open ridges of the basin that night a storm wind roared mightily in the pines how wonderful to lie snug in bed down in the protected canyon and hear the marching and retreating gale above in the forest next day we expected rain or snow but there was only wind and that quieted by afternoon so i took romer off into the woods he carried his rifle and he wore his chaps i could not persuade him to part with these they rustled on the brush and impeded his movements and particularly tired him and made him look like a diminutive cowboy how eager keen boyishly vain imaginative he was crazy to see game to shoot anything particularly bears but it contented him to hunt turkeys many a stump and bit of color he mistook for game of some kind nevertheless i had to take credence in what he thought he saw for his eyesight was unusually quick and keen that afternoon ed and doyle arrived reporting an extremely rough roundabout climb up to the rim where they had left the wagon as it was impossible to haul the supplies down into the canyon they were packed down to camp on burrows 
isbel had disapproved of this procedure a circumstance that struck me with peculiar significance which lee explained by telling me isbel was one of the peculiar breed of cowboys who no sooner were they out on the range than they wanted to go back to town again the truth was i had not met any of that breed though i had heard of them this peculiarity of isbel's began to be related in my mind to his wastefulness as a cook he cooked and threw away as much as we ate i asked him to be careful and to go easy with our supplies but i could not see that my request made any difference after supper that evening r c heard a turkey call up on the hill east of camp then i heard it and romer also we ran out a ways into the open to listen the better r c s ears were exceptionally keen he could hear a squirrel jump a long distance in the forest in this case he distinctly heard three turkeys fly up into trees i heard one romer declared he heard a flock then r c located a big bronze and white gobbler on a lower limb of a huge pine presently i too espied it whereupon we took shotgun and rifle and sallied forth sure of fetching back to camp some wild turkey meat romer tagged at our heels hurrying to the slope we climbed up at least three-quarters of the way as swiftly as possible and that was work enough to make me wet and hot the sun had set and twilight was upon us so that we needs must hurry if we were to be successful locating the big gobbler turned out to be a task we had to climb over brush and around rocks up a steep slope rather open and we had to do it without being seen or making noise romer despite his eagerness did very well indeed at last i espied our quarry and indeed the sight was thrilling wild turkey gobblers to me who had hunted them enough to learn how sagacious and cunning and difficult to stalk they were always seemed as provocative of excitement as larger game the big fellow hopped up from limb to limb of the huge dead pine and he bobbed around as if undecided and tried each limb for a place to roost then he hopped farther up until we lost sight of him in the gnarled network of branches r c wanted me to slip on alone but i preferred to have him and romer go too so we slipped stealthily upward until we reached the level then progress was easier i went to the left with the rifle and r c with the twenty gauge and romer went around to the right how rapidly it was growing dark low down in the forest i could not distinguish objects we circled that big pine tree and i made rather a wide detour perhaps eighty yards from it at last i got the upper part of the dead pine silhouetted against the western sky moving to and fro i finally made out a large black lump way out upon a spreading branch could that be the gobbler i studied that dark enlarged part of the limb with great intentness and i had about decided that it was only a knot when i saw a long neck shoot out that lump was the wise old turkey all right he was almost in the top of the tree and far out from the trunk no wildcat or lynx could ever surprise him there i reflected upon the instinct that governed him to protect his life so cunningly safe he was from all but man and gun when i came to aim at him with the rifle i found that i could see only a blur of sights other branches and the tip of a very high pine adjoining made a dark background i changed my position working around to where the background was all open sky it proved to be better by putting the sights against this open sky i could finally see the front sight through the blurred ring it was a good long shot even for daylight and i had a rifle i knew nothing about but all the difficulty only made a keener zest just then i heard romer cry out excitedly and then r c spoke distinctly far more careless than that they began to break twigs under their feet the gobbler grew uneasy how he stretched out his long neck he heard them below i called out low and sharp stand still be quiet then i looked again through the blurred peephole until i caught the front sight against the open sky this done i moved the rifle over until i had the sight aligned against the dark shape straining my eyes i held hard then fired 
the great dark lump on the branch changed shape and fell to alight with a sounding thump i heard romer running but could not see him then his high voice pealed out i got him dad you made a grand peg not only had romer gotten him but he insisted on packing him back to camp the gobbler was the largest i ever killed not indeed one of the huge thirty-five pounders but a fat heavy turkey and quite a load for a boy romer packed him down that steep slope in the dark without a slip for which performance i allowed him to stay up a while around the campfire the Houts came over from their camp that night and visited us much as i loved to sit alone beside a red embered fire at night in the forest or on the desert i also liked upon occasion to have company we talked and talked old-timer doyle told more than one of his in the early days stories then hout told us some bear stories the first was about an old black bear charging and sliding down at him he said no hunter should ever shoot at a bear above him because it could come down at him as swiftly as a rolling rock this time he worked the lever of his rifle at lightning speed and at the last shot he sure saw bear hair rot before his eyes his second story was about a boy who killed a bear and was skinning it when five more bears came along in single file and made it very necessary that he climb a tree until they had gone his third story was about an old she-bear that had two cubs hout happened to ride within sight of her when evidently she thought it time to put her cubs in a safe place so she tried to get them to climb a spruce tree and finally had to cuff and spank them to make them go up in connection with this story he told us he had often seen she-bears spank their cubs more thrilling was his fourth story about a huge grizzly a sheep and cattle killer that passed through the country leaving death behind him on the range romer's enjoyment of this story-telling hour around the glowing campfire was equalled by his reluctance to go to bed ah oh, dad please let me hear one more he pleaded his shining eyes would have weakened a sterner discipline than mine and hout seemed inspired by them well now listen to this ya yeah, he began again with a twinkle in his eye there was an old feller had a ranch in chevron canyon and he was always being pestered by mountain lions his name was bill tinker now bill was no sort of a hunter fact he was a feared of lions and bears but he sure did get riled when any creatures rustled round his cabin one day in the fall he comes home and seen a big she-lion sneaking around he grabbed a club and throwed it and yelled to scare the critter away well he had an old water barrel lying round and darned if the lion didn't run in that barrel and hide bill ran quick and flipped the barrel end up so he had the lion trapped had to set on the barrel to hold it down sure that lion raised old jasper under the barrel bill was plumb scared then he seen the lion's tail stick out through the bunghole bill bent over and sure quick tied a knot in that long tail then he run for his cabin when he got to the door he looked back to see the lion tearing down the hill for the woods with the barrel bumpin behind her bill said he never seen her again till next spring and she had the barrel still on her tail but what was stranger than that bill swore she had four cubs with her and each of them had a keg on its tail we all roared with laughter except romer his interest had been so all-absorbing his excitement so great and his faith in the storyteller so reverential that at first he could not grasp the trick at the end of the story his face was radiant his eyes were dark and dilated when the truth dawned upon him amaze and disappointment changed his mobile face and then came mirth he shouted as if to the treetops on high long after he was in bed i heard him laughing to himself i was awakened a little after daylight by the lad trying to get into his boots his boots were rather tight and somehow even in a dry forest he always contrived to get them wet so that in the morning it was a herculean task for him to pull them on this occasion appeared more strenuous than usual son what's the idea i inquired it's just daylight not time to get up he desisted from his labors long enough to pant uncle rome's gone after turkeys ed's going to call them with a collar made out of a turkey's wing bone and i said but they've gone now whereupon he subsided 
darned old boots i heard ed and uncle rome i've been ready if i could have got into my darned old boots see here dad i'm gonna wear moccasins end of chapter four part two